from the book jacket. Civil war rages as the Galactic Alliance, led by Cal Omas and the Jedi forces of Luke Skywalker, battles a confederation of breakaway planets that rally to the side of the rebellious Corellia. Suspected of involvement in an assassination plot against Queen Mother Tenel Ka of the Hapes Consortium, Han and Leia Solo are on the run, hunted by none other than their own son, Jason, whose increasingly authoritarian tactics as head of GA security have led Luke and Mara Skywalker to fear that their nephew may be treading perilously close to the dark side. But as his family sees in Jason the chilling legacy of his Sith grandfather Darth Vader, many of the frontline troops adore him, and countless citizens see him as a savior. The galaxy has been torn apart by too many wars. All Jason wants is safety and stability for all, and he's prepared to do whatever it takes to achieve that goal. To end the bloodshed and suffering, what sacrifice would be too great? That is the question tormenting Jason. Already he has sacrificed much, embracing the pitiless teachings of Lumia, the Dark Lady of the Sith who has taught him that a strong will and noble purpose can hold the evil excesses of the dark side at bay, bringing peace and order to the galaxy, but at a price. For there is one final test that Jason must pass before he can gain the awesome power of a true Sith Lord. He must bring about the death of someone he values dearly. What troubles Jason isn't whether he has the strength to commit murder— he has steeled himself for that, and worse, if necessary. No, the question that troubles Jason is who the sacrifice should be. As the strands of destiny draw ever more tightly together in a galaxy-spanning web, the shocking answer will shatter two families and cast a grim shadow over the future. Prologue The Skywalker's Bedroom Rotunda Zone, Coruscant, 0300 hours. This is going to be another sleepless night. But should I have killed him? Maybe I should try some meds, warm milk even. I've taken a lot of lives, ever since Ben asked us how many I've been counting. Maybe Luke's been adding up the tally too, but he hasn't mentioned it since. Where's Ben? I was better placed than anyone to assassinate Palpatine. Now I look back on it and wonder how history would have turned out if I'd come to my senses and killed him when I had the chance. I'd have been a traitor then. I'd be a hero now. And he'd still be dead either way. Perspective is a funny thing. How many people died because I didn't make that call. I didn't even realize that I could. Ben, I feel you're alive, but where are you? It's been days. So, how would I have known when it was the only option left? When things had gone too far, and someone had to do it? And how come Luke is sleeping like a comatose nerf, I wish I could. If I switch on the holonews, though, even without the audio, it might disturb him. Meditation isn't working either. Maybe I should just get up and go for a walk. Ben, if Jason doesn't know where you are, what are you up to? I have to stop doing this. He's a smart kid, and he's been trained by the best. He'll be okay. And maybe he knows now that killing someone is a split second, a heartbeat, a thing you're trained to do until you don't stop to debate it. And then it can't ever be undone. Now that he's killed for himself and knows the mark it leaves in your head, perhaps he won't judge me or his father harshly. That's his legacy from Mom and Dad. Assassin. Freedom fighter. Soldier. Call it what you will. It all ends in a body count. Ben's joined the family business. But I don't know what he's doing 
or even where he is right now. I'm worried sick. I don't care how strong his force powers are. Jedi die like everyone else. And it's a big and pitiless galaxy. And he's just a kid. My kid. Ben, if you can feel me, reach back. Let me know you're okay. Luke never believes me when I tell him he snores. He snores, all right. Ben? You okay? Luke's awake. He can do that without warning. Bang, he just snaps alert. It's the middle of the night. I know. You're worrying about Ben. No, he can look after himself. Why do I say that? Luke knows what I'm thinking. I shouldn't have eaten so late. I'm worried about him, too. He punches the pillow into a more comfortable shape and buries his head in it. But he's okay. I can still feel him. Nothing is okay now. Luke knows it. I know it. The whole family knows it. There's a war going on across the galaxy. But it's the war within my family that I care about most. My son's a stranger most days. And Jason? I don't think I know Jason Solo at all. And Lumia? She tried to kill my kid. For that, sweetheart, you're going to have to answer to me. I'm coming for you, and soon. I think I can get some sleep now. I feel more relaxed already. Chapter 1 He will choose the fate of the weak. He will win and break his chains. He will choose how he will be loved. He will strengthen himself through sacrifice. He will make a pet. He will strengthen himself through pain. He will balance between peace and conflict. He will know brotherhood. He will remake himself. He will immortalize his love. Common Themes in Prophecies Recorded in the Symbology of Knotted Tassels by Dr. Hylan Rotham, University of Pan-Galactic Cultural Studies Call for Papers The University invites submissions from Kipulogists and Fiber Record Analysts on the subject of the remaining untranslated tassels from the Lord Artifact. Symposium dates may change, subject to current security situation. Sith Meditation Sphere Heading Coruscant Estimated It was odd having to trust a ship. Ben Skywalker was alone in the vessel he'd found on Zeost, trusting it to understand that he wanted it to take him home. No navigation array, no controls, no pilot seat, nothing. Through the bulkheads he could see stars as smeared points of light, but he'd stopped finding the ship's transparency unsettling. The hull was there. He could both see it and not see it. He felt he was in the heart of a hollowed red gem, making its sedate way back to the core. And there was no yoke or physical control panel, so he had to think his command. The strange ship, more like a ball of rough red stone than a vessel made in a shipyard, responded to the force. Can't you go faster? I'll be an old man by the time I get back. The ship felt instantly annoyed. Ben listened. In his mind, the ship spoke in a male voice that had no sound or real form. But it spoke. And it wasn't amused by his impatience. It showed him streaked white lights streaming from a central point in a black void. A pilot's view of hyperspace. And then an explosion. Okay, so you're going as fast as you can. Ben felt the ship's brief satisfaction that its idiot pilot had understood. He wondered who'd made it. It was hard not to think of it as alive, like the Yuzhan Vong ships. 
but he settled for seeing it as a droid, an artifact with a personality, and, yes, emotions, like Shaker. Sorry, Shaker. Sorry to leave you to sort it all out. The astromech droid would be fine, he knew it. Ben had dropped him off on Drua. That was where Shaker came from, like Kiara, and so they were both home now. Astromechs were good, reliable, sensible units, and Shaker would hand her over to someone to take care of her. Poor kid. Her dad's dead, and her whole life's upended. They were just used to lure me to Zeos so someone could try to kill me. Why? Have I made that many enemies already? The ship felt irritated again, leaving Ben with the impression that he was being whiny. But he said nothing. Ben didn't enjoy having his thoughts examined. He made a conscious effort to control his wandering mind. The ship knew his will, spoken or unspoken, and he still wasn't sure what the consequences of that might be. Right then it made him feel invaded, and the relief at finding the ancient ship and managing to escape Zeost in it had given way to worry, anger, and resentment and impatience. He had a comlink, but he didn't want to advertise his presence in case there were other ships pursuing him. He'd destroyed one. That didn't mean there weren't others. The amulet wasn't that important. So why am I a target now? The ship wouldn't have gone any faster if he'd had a seat and a yoke to occupy himself, but he wouldn't have felt so lost. He could almost hear Jason reminding him that physical activity was frequently displacement, and that he needed to develop better mental discipline to rise above fidgeting restlessness. An unquiet mind wasn't receptive, he said. Ben straightened his legs to rub a sore knee, then settled again cross-legged to try meditating. It was going to be a long journey. The bulkheads and deck were amber pumice, and from time to time the surfaces seemed to burn with a fire embedded in the material. Whoever had made it had had a thing about flames. Ben tried not to think flame in case the ship interpreted it as a command. But it wasn't that stupid. It could almost think for him. He reached inside his tunic and felt the amulet. The stupid, worthless thing— that didn't seem to be an instrument of great Sith power after all, just a fancy bauble that Kiara's dad had been sent to deliver. Now the man was dead, all because of Ben, and the worst thing was that Ben didn't know why. I need to find Jason. Jason wasn't stupid either, and it was hard to believe he'd been duped about the amulet. Maybe it was part of some plan. If it was... Ben hoped it was worth Faskus's life and Kiara's misery. That's my mission. Put the amulet of Kalara in Jason's hands. Nothing more, nothing less. Jason could be anywhere now, in his offices on Coruscant, on the front line of some battle, hunting subversives. Maybe this weird force-controlled ship could tap in and locate him. He'd be on the Holonews. He always was. Colonel Jason Solo, head of the Galactic Alliance Guard, all-around public hero holding back the threats of a galaxy. Okay, I'm feeling sorry for myself. Stop it! He couldn't land this ship on a Coruscant strip and stroll away from it as if it were just a TIE fighter he'd salvaged. People would ask awkward questions. He wasn't even sure what it was and that meant it was one for Jason to sort out. Okay, Ben said aloud. Can you find Jason Solo? Have you got a way of scanning comlinks? Can you find him in the Force? The ship suggested he ought to be able to do that himself. Ben concentrated on Jason's face in his mind, and then tried to visualize the Anakin Solo, which was harder than he thought. The sphere ship seemed to be ignoring him, he couldn't feel its voice. Even when it wasn't addressing him or reacting to him, there was a faint background noise in his mind that gave him the feeling the vessel was humming to itself, 
like someone occupied with a repetitive task. Can you do it? If it can't, I'll try to land inside the GAG compound and hope for the best. You don't want Galactic Alliance engineers crawling all over you with hydro spanners, I bet. The ship told him to be patient, and that it had nothing a hydro spanner could grip anyway. Ben occupied himself with trying to pinpoint Jason before the ship could, but Jason's trick of hiding in the forest had become permanent. Ben found he was impossible to track unless he wanted to be found, and right then there was nothing of him. Not a whisper or an echo. Ben thought he might have more luck persuading the ship to see Colony's channels. Or maybe it was so old that it didn't have the technology to find those frequencies. Hey, come on. If it managed to destroy a freighter on the power of my thoughts alone, it can find a Holonews signal. Ah, said the ship. Ben's mind was suffused with a real sense of discovery. The ship dropped out of hyperspace for a moment and seemed to cast around. And then it felt as if it had found something. The starfield, visible somehow, even though the fiery, rocky bulkheads were still there, skewed as the ship changed course and jumped back into hyperspace. It radiated a sense of happy satisfaction, seeming almost excited. Found him? The ship said it had found what it was seeking. Ben decided not to engage it in a discussion of how it could find a shut-down Jason hiding in the force. Well, let me know when we get within ten thousand clicks, Ben said. I can risk using the comm link then. The ship didn't answer. It hummed happily to itself, silent but filling Ben's head with ancient harmonies of a kind he'd never imagined sounds could create. Colonel Jason Solo's Cabin Star Destroyer Anakin Solo Extended Course Heading 000 Coruscant Via the Contrum System None of the crew of the Anakin Solo seemed to find it odd that the ship was taking an extraordinarily circuitous course back to Coruscant. Jason sensed the general resigned patience. It was what they expected from the head of the Galactic Alliance Guard, and they asked no questions. He also sensed Ben Skywalker, and it was taking every scrap of his concentration to focus on his apprentice and locate him. He's okay. I know it. But something didn't go as planned. Jason homed in on a point of blue light on the bridge repeater set in the bulkhead. He felt Ben at the back of his mind, the way he might smell a familiar but elusive scent, the kind that was so distinctive as to be unmistakable. Unharmed, alive, well— but something wasn't right. The disturbance in the force, a faint prickling sharpness at the back of his throat that he'd never felt before, made Jason anxious. These days he didn't like what he didn't know. It was a stark contrast with the days when he had wandered the galaxy in search of the esoteric and the mysterious for the sake of new force knowledge. Of late he wanted certainty. He wanted order, and order of his own making. I wasn't ridding the galaxy of chaos then. Times have changed. I'm responsible for worlds now, not just myself. Ben's mission would have taken him... where, exactly? Zeost. Pinpointing a fourteen-year-old boy, not even a ship, just fifty-five kilos of humanity in a broad corridor coiling around the Perlemian trade route, was a tall order even with help from the Force. He's got a secure comm link, but he won't use it. I taught him to keep transmissions to a minimum. But, Ben, if you're in trouble, you have to break silence. Jason waited, 
staring through the shifting displays and readouts that mirrored those on the operations consoles at the heart of the ship. He'd started to lose the habit of waiting for the Force to reveal things to him. It was easy to do after taking so much into his own hands and forcing destiny in the last few months. Somewhere in the Anakin Solo, he felt Lumia as a swirling eddy eating away at a riverbank. He let go and magnified his presence in the Force. Ben. I'm here, Ben. The more Jason relaxed and let the Force sweep him up, and it was now hard to let go and be swept, much harder than harnessing its power, the more he had a sense of Ben being accompanied. Then, then he had a sense of Ben seeking him out, groping to find him. He has something with him. Can't be the amulet, of course. He'll be angry I sent him on an exercise in the middle of a war. I'll have to explain that very, very carefully. It had just been a feint to get him free of Luke and Mara for a while, to give him some space to be himself. Ben wasn't the Skywalker's little boy any longer. He would take on Jason's mantle one day, and that wasn't a task for an overprotected child who'd never been allowed to test himself far from the overwhelmingly long shadow of his Jedi Grand Master father. You're a lot tougher than they think. Aren't you, Ben? Jason felt the faint echo of Ben turn back on him and become an insistent pressure at the back of his throat. He took a breath. Now they both knew they were looking for each other. He snapped out of his meditation and headed for the bridge. All stop. The bridge was in semi-darkness lit by the haze of soft green and blue light spilling from status displays that drained the color from the faces of the hand-picked, totally loyal crew. Jason walked up to the main viewport and stared out at the stars as if he might see something. Hold this station. We're waiting for... a ship, I believe. Lieutenant Tebbutt current officer of the watch, glanced up from the console without actually raising her head. It gave her an air of disapproval, but it was purely a habit. If you could narrow that down, sir. I don't know what kind of ship, Jason said, but I'll know it when I see it. Right you are, sir. They waited. Jason was conscious of Ben. Much more focused and intense now, a general mood of business as usual in the ship, and the undercurrent of Lumia's restlessness. Closing his eyes, he felt Ben's presence more strongly than ever. Tebat put her fingertip to her ear as if she'd heard something in her bead-sized earpiece. Unidentified vessel on intercept course, range 10,000 kilometers off the port beam, a pinpoint of yellow light moved against a constellation of colored markers on the hollow monitor. The trace was small, perhaps the size of a starfighter, but it was a ship, closing in at speed. I don't know exactly what it is, sir. The officer sounded nervous. Jason was briefly troubled to think he now inspired fear for no apparent reason. It doesn't match any heat signature or drive profile we have. No indication of it's armed. No transponder signal either. It was one small vessel. And this was a star destroyer. It was a curiosity rather than a threat. But Jason took nothing for granted. There were always traps. This didn't feel like one, but he still couldn't identify that otherness he sensed. It's decelerating, sir. Let me know when you have a visual. Jason could almost taste where it was, and considered bringing the Anakin Solo about so he could watch the craft become a point of the reflected light of Contruum's star, 
then expand into a recognizable shape. But he didn't need to. The tracking screen gave him a better view. Ready cannons. And don't open fire except on my order. In Jason's throat, on a line level with the base of his skull, there was the faint tingling of someone's anxiety. Ben knew the Anakin Solo was getting a firing solution on him. Easy, Ben. Contact in visual range, sir. Tebot sounded relieved. The screen refreshed, changing from a schematic to a real image that only she and Jason could see. She tapped her finger on the transparisteel. Good grief! Is that you, Jean Vong? It was a disembodied eye with double, well, wings on each side. There was no other word to describe them. Membranes stretched between jointed fingers of veins like webbing. The dull amber surface seemed covered in a tracery of blood vessels. For a brief moment, Jason thought it was precisely that, an organic ship, a living vessel and ecosystem in its own right, of the kind that only the hated Yuzhan Vong invaders had created. But it was somehow too regular, too constructed. Clustered spires of spiked projections rose from the hull like a compass rose, giving it a stylized cross-like appearance. Somewhere in his mind, Lumia had become very alert and still. I knew the Yuzhan Vong well, said Jason, and that's not quite their style. The audio link made a fizzing sound and then popped into life. This is Ben Skywalker. Anakin Solo, this is Ben Skywalker of the Galactic Alliance Guard. Hold your fire. Please. There was a collective sigh of amused relief on the bridge. Jason thought that the fewer personnel who saw the ship, and the sooner it docked in the hangar, to be hidden with sheeting from curious eyes, the better. You're alone, Skywalker? Technically, Ben was a junior lieutenant, but Skywalker would do. Ben wouldn't. Not now that he had the duties of a grown man. No passengers? Only the ship. Sir. Permission to dock. Jason glanced around at the bridge crew and nodded to Tebat. Kill the visual feed. Treat this craft as classified. Nobody discusses it. Nobody saw it. And we never took it on board. Understood? Yes, sir. I'll clear all personnel from Zeta Hangar area. Just routine safety procedure. Tebot was just like Captain Chevu and Corporal Lecauf. Utterly reliable. Good thinking, Jason said. I'll see Skywalker safely docked. Give me access to the bay hatches. Jason made his way down to the deck, resisting the urge to break into a run as he took the shortest route through passages and down durasteel ladders into the lower section of the hull, well away from the busy starfighter hangars. Droids and crew going about their duties seemed surprised to see him. When he reached Zeta Hangar, the speckled void of space was visible through the gaping hatch that normally admitted supply shuttles, and the reflection he caught sight of in the transparisteel airlock barrier was that of a man slightly disheveled from anxious haste. He needed a haircut. He could also sense Lumia. So, what brings you down here? he asked, deactivating the deck security holocam. Hero's homecoming? She emerged from the shadow of an engineering access shaft, face half-veiled. Her eyes betrayed a little fatigue. The faintest of blue circles ringed them. The fight with Luke must have taken it out of her. The ship, she said. Look. A veined sphere, ten meters across, filled the aperture of the hatch. Its wing-like panels folded back. It hovered silently for a moment, and then settled gently in the center of the deck. 
the hatch doors closed behind it. It was a few moments before the hangar repressurized, and an opening appeared in the sphere's casing to eject a ramp. Ben did very well to pilot it, Lumia said. He did well to locate me. She melted back into the shadows, but Jason knew she was still there watching as he walked up to the ramp. Ben emerged from the opening in grubby civilian clothing. He didn't look pleased with himself. If anything, he looked wary and sullen, as if expecting trouble. He also looked suddenly older. Jason reached out and squeezed his cousin's shoulder, feeling suppressed energy in him. Well, you certainly know how to make an entrance, Ben. Where did you get this? Hi, Jason. Ben reached into his tunic, and when he withdrew his hand, a silver chain dangled from his fist. The Amulet of Kalara. It exuded dark energy, almost like a pungent perfume that clung and wouldn't go away. You asked me to get this, and I did. Jason held out his hand, then placed the gem-inlaid amulet in his palm, coiling the chain on top of it. Physically, it felt quite ordinary, a heavy and rather vulgar piece of jewelry. But it gave him a feeling like a weight passing through his body— and settling in the pit of his stomach. He slipped it inside his jacket. You did well, Ben. I found it on Zeost, in case you want to know. And that's where I got the ship, too. Someone tried to kill me, and I grabbed the first thing I could to escape. The attempt on Ben's life didn't hit Jason as hard as the mention of Zeost, the Sith homeworld. Jason hadn't bargained on that. Ben wasn't ready to hear the truth about the Sith, or that he was apprenticed, informally or not, to the man destined to be the master of the Order. Jason felt no reaction from Lumia whatsoever, but she had to be hearing this. She was still lurking. It was a dangerous mission, but I knew you could handle it. Lumia, you arranged this. What's your game? Who tried to kill you? A Bothan set me up, Ben said. Dure. He paid a courier to take the amulet to Zeost, framed him as the thief, and the guy ended up dead. I got even with the Bothan, though. I blew up the ship that was targeting me. I hope it was Dure's. How? Ben gestured over his shoulder with his thumb. It's armed. It seems to have whatever weapons you want. Well done. Jason got the feeling that Ben was suspicious of the whole galaxy right then. His blue eyes had a gray cast, as if someone had switched off the enthusiastic light in him. That was what made him look older. A brush with a hostile world another step away from his previous protected existence, and an essential part of his training. Ben, treat this as top secret. The ship is now classified, like your mission. Not a word to anyone. Like I was going to write to Mom and Dad about it. What I Did on My Vacation, by Ben Skywalker, age fourteen and two weeks, Ouch. Ben was no longer gung-ho and blindly eager to please. But that was a good thing in a Sith apprentice. Jason changed tack. Birthdays had a way of making you take stock if you spent them somewhere unpleasant. How did you fly this? I've never seen anything like it. Ben shrugged and folded his arms tight across his chest, his back to the vessel but he kept looking around as if to check that it was still there. You think what you want it to do, and it does it. You can even talk to it. But it doesn't have any proper controls. He glanced over his shoulder again. It talks to you through your thoughts, 
and it doesn't have a high opinion of me. A Sith ship. Ben had flown a Sith ship back from Zeost. Jason resisted the temptation to go inside and examine it. You need to get back home. I told your parents I didn't know where you were, and hinted they might have made you run off by being overprotective. Ben looked a little sullen. Thanks. It's true, though. You know it is. Jason realized he hadn't said what really mattered. Ben. I'm proud of you. He sensed a faint glow of satisfaction in Ben that died down almost as soon as it began. I'll file a full report if you want. As soon as you can. Jason steered him toward the hangar exit. Probably better that you don't arrive home in this ship. We'll shuttle you to the nearest safe planet and you can get a more conventional ride on a passenger flight. I need some credits for the fare. I'm fed up with stealing to get by. Of course. Ben had done the job and proved he could survive on his wits. Jason realized the art of building a man was to push him hard enough to toughen him without alienating him. It was a line he explored carefully. He fished in his pocket for a mix of denominations in untraceable cred coins. Here you go. Now get something to eat, too. With one last look at the sphere ship, Ben gave Jason a casual salute before striding off in the direction of the store's turbo lift. Jason waited. The ship watched him. He felt it. Not alive but aware. Eventually he heard soft footsteps on the deck behind him, and the ship somehow seemed to ignore him and look elsewhere. A Sith meditation sphere, said Lumia. An attack craft. A fighter. It's ancient. Absolutely ancient. She walked up to it and placed her hand on the hull. It seemed to have melted down into a near hemisphere. The veins, and Jason assumed systems masts on its keel, tucked beneath it. Right then it reminded him of a pet crouching before its master, seeking approval. It actually seemed to glow like a fanned ember. What a magnificent piece of engineering! Lumia's brow lifted, and her eyes creased at the corners. Jason guessed that she was smiling, surprised. It says it's found me. It was an unguarded comment, rare for Lumia, and almost an admission. Ben had been attacked on a test that Lumia had set up. The ship came from Zeost. Circumstantially, it wasn't looking good. It was searching for you? She paused again, listening to a voice he couldn't hear. It says that Ben needed to find you, and when it found you, it also recognized me as Sith and came to me for instructions. How did it find me? I can't be sensed in the Force if I don't want to be and I didn't let myself be detected until— A pause. Lumia's eyes were remarkably expressive. She seemed very touched by the ship's attention. Jason imagined that nobody, nothing, had shown any interest in her well-being for a long, long time. It says you created a force disturbance in the Galater system— and that a combination of your wake and the fact you were looking for the red-headed child and the impression that the crew of your ship left in the force made you trackable before you magnified your presence. My, 
It's got a lot to say for itself. You can have it, if you wish. Quaint, but I'm not a collector. Jason heard himself talking simply to fill the empty air, because his mind was racing. I can be tracked. I can be tracked by the way those around me react, even though I'm concealed. Yes. Wake was the precise word. It seems made for you. Lumia took a little audible breath, and the silky dark blue fabric across her face sucked in for a moment to reveal the outline of her mouth. The woman who's more machine, and the machine that's more creature. She put one boot on the ramp. Very well. I'll find a use for this. I'll take it off your hands, and nobody need ever see it. These days, Jason was more interested by what Lumia didn't say than what she did. There was no discussion of the test she'd set for Ben, and why it had taken him to Zeost and into a trap. He teetered on the edge of asking her outright, but he didn't think he could listen to either the truth or a lie. Both would rankle. He turned to go. Inside a day, the Anakin Solo would be back on Coruscant, and he would have both a war and a personal battle to fight. Ask me, she called to his retreating back. You know you want to. Jason turned. What? Whether you intended Ben to be killed, or who I have to kill to achieve full Sith mastery? I know the answer to one, but not the other. Jason decided there was a fine line between a realistically demanding test of Ben's combat skills and deliberately trying to kill him. He wasn't sure if Lumia's answer would tell him what he needed to know anyway. There's another question, he said, and that's how long I have before I face my own test. The Sith sphere ticked and creaked, flexing the upper section of its webbed wings. Lumia stood on the edge of the hatch and looked around for a moment, as if she was nervous about entering the hull. If I knew when, I might also know who, she said. But all I feel is soon and close. Something seemed to reassure her, and she paused as if listening again. Perhaps the ship was offering its own opinion. And you know that, too. Your impatience is burning you. Of course it was. Jason wanted an end to it all. To the fighting, the uncertainty, the chaos. The war beyond mirrored the struggle within. Lumia was telling the truth. Soon. Meeting of the Clans, Mandel Motors Hall, Keldabe, capital of Mandalore. A hundred or so of the hardest-looking males and females that Fett had ever seen were gathered in the stark charcoal-gray granite building that Mandel Motors had donated to the community. The hardest face of all was that of his granddaughter. Mirta Gev watched him from the side of the meeting hall with his father's eyes. My own eyes. Fearfeck. She really did have the fat eyes. Maybe he was seeing what wasn't really there, but the look bored through into his soul anyway. It was a look that said, You failed. He didn't hear the murmur of voices around him, just the soundless accusations that his daughter Aelin was dead, that he had never been there for her until it was too late, and that he might also be too late to start being a worthy Mandalore. His father had groomed him to be the best, and even if he'd never mentioned being Mandalore one day, it went with the legacy. Jaster's legacy. 
Better be quick, then. I'm dying. I've got business to take care of. Priorities. A cure. Then find out what happened to my wife. What happened to Sintas Vel. It wasn't that Myrta wouldn't tell him. She didn't know. She had the heart of fire gem he'd given Sintas as a wedding gift, but it had turned up at a dealer's shop. It was just bait. And he'd taken it. But Fett being Fett, it was more than bait. It was a motivator. It was another piece of evidence. It's never too late to find out. I thought it was, but it's not. The hubbub of the chieftains of the clans, heads of companies, and an assortment of veteran mercenaries faded voice by voice into silence. They watched him warily. Not all of them were human, either. A Tagorian and a Mandalian, both wearing impressive armor, leaned against the far wall, massive arms folded across their chests. Species didn't matter much to Mandalorians. Culture defined them. Fett wondered what that made him. Oh, yeah. It was muttered at first, then shouted a few times. Oh, yeah. It was a word with a hundred meanings for Mandalorians. This time it meant, Let's go, let's get on with it. They always started their gatherings this way, and this was the nearest Mandalorians ever came to a senate. They didn't go in for procedural nicety. A chieftain with an ornately shaved beard and an eye patch stood up to speak without ceremony. So, Mandalore, he said, are we going to fight or what? Who do you want to fight? Fett noted that they reverted to basic when addressing him, in deference to his ignorance of Mondoa. The Galactic Alliance? Corellia? Some force-forsaken pit on the rim? There's never been a war we haven't fought in. There is now. This isn't our fight. Mandalore's got its own troubles. The war's escalating. Their troubles might come and find us. Fett stood by the long, narrow window that ran the height of the west-facing wall. It was more like an arrow loop than a view on the city. Mandalorians built for defense, and public buildings were expected to serve as citadels, even more so now. The Yuzhan Vong had wreaked terrible vengeance on Mandalore, for its covert work for the New Republic during the invasion. But the carnage had just made Mondo Ade more ferociously determined to stay put. The nomadic habit was still there. It was more about a refusal to yield than love of the land. But they couldn't lose a third of the population and shrug it off. Not while many still remembered the imperial occupation. Sore losers. The Vong. But it's not like I had any alternative. Better the New Republic than the Crab Boys. Fett scanned the hall, aware of Myrta's fixed and almost baleful stare. What's the first rule of warfare? On seats, on benches, leaning in alcoves, or just standing with arms folded, the leaders of Mandalorian society, or as many as could get to Kaldabe, watched him carefully. Even the head of Mandal Motors, Jir Yomaget, wore traditional armor. Most had taken off their helmets, but some hadn't. That was okay by Fett. He kept his on, too. What's in it for us? said a thick-set human man, leaning back in a chair that seemed to have been cobbled together from crates. Second rule is, how much is in it for us? So, what is in it for us this time? 
us. Fat was Mandalore, chieftain of chieftains, commander of supercommandos, and he couldn't avoid the us any longer. He didn't feel like us. He felt like an absent husband who'd sneaked home to find an angry wife demanding to know where he'd been all night, not sure how to head off the inevitable argument. They made him feel uncomfortable. He examined the feeling to see what was causing it. Not up to the job. He might have been the best bounty hunter, but he didn't think he was the best Mandalore, and that unsettled him, because he had never been simply adequate. He expected to excel. He'd taken on the job. Now he had to live up to the title which was much, much easier in war than in peacetime. Fen Shisa must have thought he could do it, though. His dying wish was to have Fett assume the title, whether he wanted it or not. Crazy barve. The thick-set Mondo shrugged. Credits, Mondalore. We need currency, in case you hadn't noticed. To spend on importing food. That's the idea. I suppose that's one way of balancing supply and demand. What is? Back one side or the other in this war. That'll reduce the number of mouths to feed. Dead men don't eat. There were snickers of laughter and comments in Mandoa this time. Fett made a mental note to program his helmet translator to deal with it, and that felt like the ultimate admission of defeat for a leader. He couldn't speak the language of his own people, but they didn't seem to care. "'I'm with the Mandalore on this,' said a hoarse male voice at the back of the assembly. Fett recognized that one. Neth Bralor. He'd known a few Bralors in his time— but they weren't all from the same clan. It was a common name, sometimes simply an indication of roots in Norg Brawl or another hillfort town. We lost nearly a million and a half people fighting the Vongese. That might be small change for Coruscant, but it's a disaster for us. No more. Not until we get Mandayim in order. We'll eat Basneral if we have to. A murmur of rumbling agreement rippled around the hall. A few chieftains slapped their gauntlets on their armor in approval. One of them was the woman commando Fett had met in Zeria Zandral, Isko Talgal. Her expression was still as grim, graying black hair scraped back from her wind-tanned face and braided with silver beads, but she banged her fist on her thigh plate in enthusiastic approval. Fett wondered what she looked like when she was unhappy. You wanted a decision from me. You got it. Fett felt time accelerating past him, and it eroded what little patience he had. Every bone in his body ached right through to his spine. Galactic Alliance or Confederation? You think it's going to make any difference to us? No, said another voice, thick with a northern Concordian accent. Coruscant won't be asking us to disarm any time soon. They might need us if they get another Vongese war. Chakar, someone laughed. But the debate picked up pace, still mostly in basic. And what if the war comes too close to home? What if it spreads to a neighboring system or two? Even if we side with the Alliance, what's to say they won't turn on us and expect us to tow their nice, tidy, disarmed line? It's not disarmament they want. It's pooling every planet's assets into the GA Defense Force. And we all know how slick and efficient that's going to be. Fat stood back and watched. It was both uplifting and entertaining in its way. 
it was the kind of decision-making process that could happen only in a small population of ferociously independent people, who knew immediately when it was time to stop being individuals and come together as a nation. Funny. That's the last thing Mandalore is. A nation. Sometimes we fight on different sides. We're scattered around the galaxy. We're not even one species. But we know what we are and what we want. And that's not going to change any time soon. The arguments were all coming down to one thing. A lot of people needed the credits. Times were still tough. Fett brought his fist down hard on the nearest solid surface, a small table, and the crack brought the hubbub of discussion to a halt. Mandalore has no position on the current war, and there'll be no divisions over it, he said. Anyone who wants to sell their services individually to either side, that's your business. But not in Mandalore's name. He braced for the eruption of argument from the sudden silence, thumbs hooked in his belt. His helmet's wide-angle vision caught a fully armored figure standing at the rear of the hall. It wasn't always possible to tell if a Mondo in armor was male or female, but Fett was sure this was a man, medium height, and with his hands clasped behind his back. The left shoulder plate of his purple-black armor was a light metallic brown. It wasn't unusual to see odd-colored plates, because many Mandalorians kept a piece of a dead loved one's armor. But this was striking for a reason Fett couldn't work out. Something glittered in the central panel of the man's breastplate, a tiny point of light as the sun cut across the chamber in a shaft so sharp and white that it seemed solid. I should do that. I should wear a piece of Dad's armor with my own. Every day. He felt bad that he didn't, but jerked his attention back to the meeting. Let's okay, then, said a cheerful white-haired man, sitting a few paces from him. A dark blue tattoo of a vine emerged from the top of his armor and ended under his chin. Baltan Kerid, that was his name. Fett had last seen him dispatching Yuzhan Vong with a battered Imperial-era blaster at Kalula Station. That's all we needed to know, that there's no ban on mercenary work. I'll make it clear to both sides that there's no official involvement in their dispute, Fett said. But if any of you want to get yourselves killed, it's your call. So we might see Mondo fighting Mondo in this Arue Tisse's war. Everyone looked around at the man in the purple armor. Fett saw no need to learn the language, but there were words he couldn't avoid. Arue Tisse. Non-Mandalorians. Occasionally pejorative, but usually just a way of saying not one of us. Hardly conducive to restoring the nation, is it? But fighting's our number one export, said Carid. What do you want? Make Keldabe into a tourist spot or something? He roared with laughter. I can see it now. Visit Mandalore before Mandalore visits you. Take home some souvenirs, a slab of ooj cake and a smack in the mouth. Well... Our economic policy right now seems to be to earn foreign credits, get killed, and neglect the planet. Carid had a magnificent sneer. He was far more intimidating without a helmet. You got a better idea? Oh, wait. Is this going to be the all-day diatribe on Kadikla self-determination and statehood? "'Cause I ain't getting any younger, son, and I'd like to be home in time for dinner, "'cause my missus is making pea-flower dumplings.' "'That got a lot of laughs. "'Carid generally did. "'There were shouts and guffaws. 
Yeah, we know about the dumplings, carried. But Kadikla. So the Mandalore first movement had a name now. Even its own adjective, too. He hadn't come across Kadika yet. The man they said was driving the new nationalism. Fett thought that was remiss of the man, seeing as he'd done just what was asked of him and returned to lead Mandalore. Critical mass. Nervoed. Purple Man ignored the howls of laughter. His voice had the tone of someone who'd argued this many times before. We have a population of fewer than three million here, and maybe as many as three times that in Diaspora. We lost a lot of our best troops, our farmland's been poisoned, and our industrial infrastructure is still shot to Haran after ten years. So maybe this is the ideal time to bring some people home. Gather in the exiles, while the rest of the galaxy is busy. Carid was focused on the debate now, and Fett was temporarily forgotten. Yeah, group up to make a nice easy target. All of us in one place. Nobody except the Vongese has attacked us in a long time. The Empire gutted us. You've got a short memory. Or maybe you were still in diapers when Shisa had to kick some pride back into us. Okay, so let's abandon Mandalore. Go totally nomad again. Keep moving. Rely on the whim of every government except our own. Son, we are the Shabla government, Carid said. So what do you want to do about it? Consolidate Mandalore and the Sector. Bring our people home, and build something nobody's ever going to overrun again. Purple Man had a faint accent, a little Coruscanti, a little Keldabian. A citadel, a power base. So we choose when we stay home and when we go expeditionary. Funny, I thought that was just what we were doing. Fett watched the exchange, fascinated. Then he realized everyone was staring at him, waiting for him to respond, or at least to call a halt. So this was leadership off the battlefield. It was just like running his business, only more... complex. More variables, more unknowns. He hated unknowns and something that was utterly alien to him. Responsibility for other people, millions of them, but people who could take care of themselves and ran the place well enough without any bureaucracy. Or me. Do they need me at all? What's your name? Fed asked. Purple Man was leaning against the wall, but he pushed himself away from it with a shrug to stand upright. Grod, he said. Okay, Grod. It's policy as of now. I'm asking for two million folks to return to Mandalore. How many you think we'll get? It made sense. The planet needed a working population. It needed extra hands to clean up the soil that the Vongese had poisoned and to cultivate the land left fallow by dead owners. But every Mandalorian in the galaxy didn't add up to a single town on many planets. We're still short on credits, until we become self-sufficient in food production again. We'll contribute half our profits, said the Mandal Motors chief. As long as we can sell fighters and equipment to either side, of course. Business is business. Fett gave him an acknowledging nod. I'll chip in a few million creds, too. Carid looked around him, as if to single out anyone mad enough to dissent, but everyone had what they wanted from the meeting. Myrta still managed to look baleful. The slice of her mother's heart of fire stone dangled on a leather cord around her neck. At least she had a decent helmet now, apparently her first, 
so that showed just how much of a Mandalorian her father had been, or how little she'd seen of him. Maybe Mondo fathers have been disappointing her all her life. One last thing, Fett said. I'm going to be away from base for a few days. Uncontactable. How will we notice? Someone muttered. It was a fair point. So I'm not the governing kind. But I haven't let you down yet. While I'm away, Goron Bevin stands in for me. There was no dissent. Bevin was solid and trustworthy, and he didn't want to be Mandalore. He was also a complete savage with a Beskod, an ancient Mandalorian iron saber, as many Yuzhan Vong had discovered the hard way. Any argument about the isolationist policy in Fett's absence wouldn't last long. We're done here, said Carrot. You give me the inventory of all the farmland lying fallow, and my clan will make sure it gets allocated to whoever returns to farm it. He hung back for a moment and made an exaggerated job of replacing his helmet. I'm glad you brought Django home, Mandalore. It was the right thing to do. Was it? Home for his father was Concord Dawn. It was right for Mandalore, maybe. They liked their figureheads where they could see them, even their dead ones. Nobody has to listen to me, if they don't feel like it. Never known you to stay out of a fight. You've got your reasons. That's why we're listening. Carid paused. I'm sorry about your daughter. Yeah. So everyone knew about Aelin. Fett didn't remember telling anyone that she was dead, let alone that Jason Solo had killed her. Mandalore wasn't her home either. She wouldn't have appreciated ending up buried here. And I bet you're all wondering why that Jedi isn't a pile of smoking charcoal by now. Like I said, you have your reasons— Anything we can do, just say the word. His time will come. Leave him to me. But not now, Fett thought. He had to get back to the hunt for a clone with gray gloves and his best chance of a cure for his terminal illness. As the hall cleared, Myrta was left standing alone, arms folded leaning against the wall. I wonder if Cal Omus has such an easy time in the Senate, she said. You can't rule Mandalorians. You just make sensible suggestions they want to follow. Fett walked outside and swung his leg over the seat of the speeder that Bevin had lent him, wincing behind his visor. He was close to giving in to daily painkillers. And since when have Mandalorians needed to be told what makes sense? Since they got in the habit of Baslan Shavla when situations didn't look winnable. Fett remembered that phrase. Bevin had used it a lot in the Yuzhan Vong War. It translated as strategic disappearance, scattering and going to ground in uncertain times. It was hard to wipe out a people that fragmented like mercury droplets and waited for the right time to coalesce again. It wasn't retreat. It was lying in wait. Come on, he said. I've got some leads to follow up on the clone. Myrtis scrambled onto the pillion seat. Her armor clanked against his. She had the full set now, even a jet pack courtesy of Bevin. Has it ever taken you this long to track somebody? It's been months. Don't push it. I make it about sixty-five days. You believe he exists, then? You wouldn't lie to me again, and you wouldn't make up the name Skirata. No. You want me to come with you? 
You think I need a nurse? I said I wouldn't lie to you again. Fett almost wished he hadn't told her. He really should have told Bevin first. That was a man he could trust. As the speeder swooped over Keldabe and out into the countryside beyond, the scale of the Yuzhan Vong's retribution became all too clear again. The course of the winding Kalita River was visible for kilometers now, because most of the woodland surrounding it had been flattened. Keldabe stood on a bend in the river, a defiant flat-topped hill glittering with granite, and Mandel Motors' hundred-meter tower had somehow survived the war despite the damage it had sustained. The shattered stone and scorch marks were still there as a reminder that Mandalore could be battered, bruised, and temporarily subdued, but never completely conquered. The small settlements of tree homes in the branches of the slow-growing ancient Veshak forest had been wiped off the face of the map. Beneath the speeder there were no longer patches of crops in clearings. There was blackened soil and charcoal stumps of trees— and still nothing grew, not even the seedlings that usually emerged after fires. Scum, Fett cursed. He banked the speeder sharply and heard Myrta hold her breath. They didn't even try to plant their Vong weeds here. They just poisoned the soil. It was a high price to pay for double-crossing the invaders, but the alternative would have been much, much worse. No help from the New Republic or the GA, Myrta said. No reconstruction funding like everyone else? We didn't expect anything. And we didn't get it. Fett gunned the speeder's drives and headed out over the countryside, mindful of the fact that he'd have taken on the Yuzhan Vong even if they'd been the New Republic's best buddies. The Bevin Vasser farm appeared in the distance almost on cue as a kind of reassurance that the devastation wasn't global. And there was Slave One, sitting on a makeshift landing pad. That was home. His ship, his father's ship, the cockpit where he had spent literally years of his life, so am I coming with you or not? Myrta was more trouble left to her own devices. Besides, he didn't want to let that heart of fire necklace stray too far. It was the one link he had to finding out how Sintas had died. Okay, he said. She was his grandchild, even if she had tried to kill him. He didn't care about that, but he struggled to find that protective devotion he'd seen in his own father. Something just didn't click. So he acted it out, because that was how he'd learned everything that became second nature to him. He went through the motions until it was part of him. He could learn to be a good grandfather, too. He could excel at it. What's the best way to find another bounty hunter? Think like him? Fett shook his head and set the speeder down with a thud. He'd have to tell Bevin where he was going. If anything happened to him, Goran Bevin was his chosen successor. Fett hadn't told him yet, but Bevin took that kind of news in his stride. No, Fett said. You hire him. Chapter 2 If you can't beat them, divide them. Cal Omas, Chief of State, Galactic Alliance Office of the Chief of State, Senate Building, Coruscant Not exactly our finest hour, Admiral. Chief of State Cal Omas looked a much older man than he'd been just a few months earlier. Chani Othel prided herself on a decent understanding of human facial expressions and the telltale little signs of fatigue and stress. Omas had them all, 
fluid-filled bulges under his watery blue eyes, a peppering of reddish spots on his chin, and a sour smell of calf when she got too close to him. But mainly, it was the eyes. Human eyes told her everything she needed to know. When she glanced at Jason Solo, he was a model of confidence and composure. Except for his eyes. There were no signs of poor health, but he was far from the glacially calm facade he presented. She could see the changes in the pupils of his dark eyes. Small, almost imperceptible, but his pupils flickered, showing that some things got to him. That was useful to know. We didn't lose the battle at Gilater 8, she said. Whatever the Confederation claims. We didn't win it, either, said Omus. He'd developed a habit of moving sheets of flimsy around his desk. He didn't need hard-copy records, but it seemed to give him some comfort to handle them, as if they were the last tangible grip he had on his own government. Consider this a wash-up. We've had our wash-up, Jason said. We know what went wrong and why we fell for a trap. Poor intel, said Omus. As a Jedi, do you not sense these ambushes? Neofel noted Jason's three rapid blinks. There was little love lost between the two men now. That remark really stung Jason for some reason, even though he was far too smart to delude himself with ideas of omniscience. We're neither invincible... Nor infallible, he said softly. That was when he was at his most lethal, when he sounded quietly reasonable. I had unreliable intelligence, and that's an occupational hazard. The fact that we got out in one piece is largely due to Jedi skills. Ironically, my parents' and my uncle's skills. Don't mind me, Jason, or the fleet. We are too modest, Colonel Solo, she said. I hear you fought quite remarkably. Jason let the comment pass without reply or a self-effacing half-smile, which was his usual response. Omus flicked the controls of the holoscreen set in his office wall. A fly-through image of a planet resolved into a cityscape. Hololinks showed inset 3D images of explosions and smoking skylines. Now we have reports of fighting breaking out on Repoblas. Why? Jason asked. Nobody in the Sepan system has any interest in the Confederation. I've had no intelligence. They don't need any love for either cause said Neofel. We've reached the free-for-all stage. What better time than during a civil war to resurrect their dispute with Daimok? Like a cantina brawl. One fight breaks out, and suddenly everyone remembers they have a score to settle. There'll be plenty more Me Too conflicts. Omis sighed. And we have to ask where we draw the line. Jason looked as if he was studying the schematic of Repoblos's capital. Neofel judged that he was actually fretting about the limited scope of his intelligence. Chief of State, even the Empire never managed to stop the Sepin Wars, and it was prepared to take far more extreme measures than we are, she said. We should resist any pressure to get involved. We're getting perilously close to overstretch. Omis changed the hollow image to a tote board of the Senate composition. The names of most of the member planets were listed in red, but some were in blue. There were more blue names than she remembered from the last time she'd seen this list. Two more members seceded last night,' Omis said. 
Las Lagan and Beris. Minor worlds, but let's do the arithmetic. The more planets that secede from the GA, the fewer military assets I have to call on, and the more assets there are that are potentially available to the Confederation. Jason was a master of expressionless contempt. I think I can work that out, yes. And you still believe in responding with maximum force, within the boundaries of ethical treaties? Yes. Then we're on the downward spiral. Omus walked into the center of the room and gave Neothel a glance that verged on pleading. Come on, you're the military. You know this is true. Sooner or later, secessions reach a point where the G.A. becomes the rump, where the Confederation equals, and then outnumbers us. Omus held up two fingers and counted off theatrically. Problem one. We would be outgunned. Problem two. Where's our legitimacy? What peace would we be enforcing? Neothel decided to let Jason respond and keep her powder dry. Omus had an excellent point, but it was a politician's point, not a chief of staff's. Her job at that moment was to decide how to use force to achieve Omus's objectives, not to define what those objectives should be. That was a battle for Jason Solo. She watched. In that case, Jason said, so softly that it was almost a whisper, they can defeat us without a shot being fired. They can break us with a sheet of flimsy. I'd call that surrender. I'd call it wargaming the worst scenario. Omus looked to Neothel again. And you, Admiral, will know when we reach the military tipping point. Neothel had two strategies. One with all the GA pieces she had in play at the current time, and one with Coruscant-based forces alone. It made sense to work on the basis of the latter if support was falling away. She glanced at the list of red names and the growing tally of blue ones while keeping an eye on Jason. Humans always had a hard time working out where Moon Calamari were looking and realized that the graph wouldn't be a straight line. If there was to be an erosion of the Alliance, it wouldn't be a tidy progression. It would be a sudden collapse. That point hasn't come she said at last. I'll let you know as soon as I start getting nervous. But I can tell you that we're already overstretched because of the geography. Multiple fronts. Not good. And if we withdraw support from the Allies, then we magnify the problem, Omus said. They'll switch. Jason inhaled audibly. This is why I advocated going in very hard and very fast in the first place. Omus smiled, but without humor. Ah, I told you so. I wondered how long it would be before we reached that stage. Chief Omus, I know hindsight gets us nowhere now but we might as well be honest with each other and recognize what we can each contribute. Neothel was working through her phases of Jason. First, he'd been a useful ally, then an instrument for getting the tougher decisions past Omus. He was still good for the Alliance, she thought, but he was far more the politician than the soldier lately. His language had changed, less direct, more circumspect. She longed for plain talking. But she wasn't doing any in front of Jason now. My sources tell me the Corellians failed to recruit the Mandalorians fairly early on. 
she said. For some obscure reason, they appear to be staying neutral. Unless they've had some collective lobotomy. I call that interesting. Omis looked at Jason pointedly, hands in pockets. Have we approached them? Have any of your shadowy little operatives signed some of them up? They were pretty handy during the last war, as I recall. Jason looked serene, except for his pupils. No, and I suspect we wouldn't receive a positive response. Why? Don't tell me they've discovered pacifism after millennia of pillaging and destroying. They're congenital thugs. Any excuse for a fight that they can get paid for. You think I don't know what you did, Jason? Neothel feigned mild interest. But word gets around. Let's see if you play this straight. Jason was completely still, except for the fact that he meshed his fingers in his lap. It looked like a meditation pose, utterly at odds with his black Galactic Alliance guard coveralls. There's the small matter of the fact that I lost Boba Fett's daughter during an interrogation, he said. Aha! Lost? Omis blinked a few times. What exactly is lost? She died while I was interrogating her. I had no idea who she was at the time. Omis looked stunned for a moment, but then let out a small involuntary ha of oddly horrified amusement. And Fett knows this? Jason's face was as calm and impenetrable as a statue's. He does now. Then I imagine you'll be looking over your shoulder for the rest of your life, Colonel. Jason looked as if he hadn't thought about that. His composure wobbled for a second as he rearranged his clasped hands. Asking him for a favor... Wouldn't be the smartest thing to do. No. Neothel wondered if Jason had finally bitten off more than he could chew. Gossip reached her ears, and gossip from Jason's secret police was a wholly different and much more reliable source than the murmurings in the pleakwood paneled Senate corridors. But it didn't suit her plans to have Jason crash and burn— and she didn't have to like people to work with them. I've arranged to meet the ambassadors from Las Lagan and Beris with the diplomatic corps later today, said Omis. Let's see if we can talk them back inside the fold. I don't want to start a stampede. What's their problem? asked Neothel. Unwilling to commit troops? Give them a waiver. And what kind of message does that send to Corellia? That's backpedaling. Omis seemed indignant. That's why we went to war in the first place. The principle of pooled defensive capability for the Alliance. Las Lagan and Beres between them contribute 20,000 troops, tops. The diplomatic benefit strikes me as outweighing both the principle... And any use they might be. The worst thing in the world, Neothel decided, was a politician who discovered scrupulous principle halfway through the game. They're badly trained and poorly equipped, so I don't think I'll miss their military input to the GA. Jason eased himself out of his chair and stood up, making it clear he was heading for the door. Well... At least there's some positive news on the counterterrorism front. It's the second month running that arms seizures are up. We're shutting down their supply routes. Are you certain they're all politically motivated, and not just criminals? Omis asked. If you were shot by one of them, Jason said, would you care about that fine distinction? 
Ordinary crime and terror tend to become bedfellows sooner or later, and ask Coruscant Security Force for their latest violent crime statistics. It's becoming a lot quieter all around. He gave them both a polite nod and left. Omis watched the doors close behind him, and then wandered over to the main window overlooking the plaza to stare out in calculated silence. What have we come to, Admiral? That my first thought on hearing that Colonel Solo kills a prisoner is that he might now have enemies big enough to keep him off my back. It was a blisteringly frank admission. You're only human, she said. Omis didn't see the other side of that verbal coin. It's an indictment of what we've all become, that my inner circle of advisors isn't the security or justice secretary, or even diplomats, but the chief of staff and the head of the secret police. Omis began his ritual amble around the office, leaving faint and short-lived footprints in the pale blue pile of the carpet. I think about that, you know. I wonder how a colonel rises to be so influential, and I really don't know if I let it happen because he's a Jedi or because he's G.A.G. Neofel thought it was smart of Omis to keep the real discussions to a handful of people who could be trusted not to shift allegiance to Corellia. There was no telling with some senators. In these uncertain times, it's necessary. We can convene all the emergency committees we like, but the conduct of the war is a matter for very few. The war beyond our boundaries, and the war within them. Do you think we still have a war within? Enough Coruscanti think we do. There's no such thing as... Only thousands dying in terror attacks. Lose a ship with thousands of crew, and civilians say that's too bad. That's what they signed up for. Lose a few civilians, and it's a planetary tragedy. The GAG had smashed most of the terror networks in a matter of months. They were very efficient at tracking down funding and establishing links. But they were still active and kicking down different doors now. Bothan, Confederation sympathizers, and a few people who just breached the peace while emergency powers were in force. It's as valid to deal with the fear of terrorism as with the reality. Omis paused to try to look her in the eye. Admiral, you strike me as an officer raised in the traditions of decency— Honor, the rule of law, that goes out the window all too often in trying times. I stick to what I'm tasked to do, and I'm grateful I don't have to get involved in G.A.G. -G business. Omis appeared to note the ambivalence. Nominally, the G.A.G. -G is under your command. Nominally. You feel Colonel Solo is exceeding his boundaries, and that I should apply them a little more emphatically. I'm concerned about his operating procedures with suspects. I'll admit that. What do you want? For me to admit I'm concerned, too? Are you? Sometimes. Umis's brows lifted in a split second of hope. I appreciate that it's not easy to curb an officer who does so much to reassure the public. We all need heroes in difficult times, even if we don't need their protection as much as we think. Indeed. And for all their muttering, I do believe the Jedi Council secretly relishes seeing one of their own kind adored for his two-fisted and muscular approach to keeping the peace. 
It dispels the image of their being passive mystics, out of touch with grim reality. Success is everyone's child. Failure is an orphan. Omis smiled ruefully. Well, he'll either win the war for us, or bring us down. He went back to his polished plane of a desk, looking somewhat shrunken when he sat behind it now. The small bronzium vase holding a single purple kibo bloom made the desk look all the more vast and empty. Heroes have a habit of doing that. Us bring us down. And politicians had a habit of sowing doubts and ideas that wormed into the subconscious. Neothel noted Omis's subtle warning, and almost began to explain that she already had the required degree of paranoia for a more political career, but he probably knew that by now. If he didn't, she was slipping. I'll bear that in mind, she said. Omis was a consummate statesbeing, who'd survived attempts on his life and his career several times. He'd understand the entire conversation that was packed into that one line that she knew Jason was a loose cannon, that she knew he was massively, overwhelmingly ambitious, and that she knew she might find herself sidelined by him if she didn't keep on her toes, and that she knew Omus was aware that her eyes were on his job, and that he might make that accession easier for her one day if she worked with him rather than with Jason Solo. Us. Political code was a very economical way of imparting delicate information without actually using incriminating words. It saved a lot of time and trouble. Neothel took the silence as a cue that the meeting was over. As the doors closed behind her, she glanced back at Omis. Her last glimpse was one of a man who shut his eyes for a second, as if completely exhausted. He'll strut back into the Senate in a couple of hours, as if everything's under control. Do I really want a job like that? She still thought she did. She had lunch in one of the Senate's many eateries. There was always at least one tap calf or restaurant open at any time of the day or night. Some of them relaxed, some of them formal. All of them hotbeds of gossip, debate, and deal-making. More government business went on in these places than ever transpired in the Senate chamber. They were also relatively safe places to talk to beings who might attract attention if she met them at the officers' club. Hiding in plain sight worked remarkably well now, and nobody took much notice of the fact that she happened to be grabbing a snack at the same table as a gossam called Gafal Keb, a senior civil servant in the Public Protection Department. Their voices were drowned in the general chatter. They referred to Jason as the new boy, the G.A.G. as the club. Omis became, inevitably, the boss. It was unoriginal, but for ears attuned to picking out names from across the room, it seized no attention. Is the new boy under any threat from our boisterous friends in Keldabe? she asked. Not a word coming out of there. Keb had a way of slowly taking in everything around him, 360 degrees. But if they were planning anything, they wouldn't tell CSF. Word is that Shevu is seriously hacked off with his way of doing business, too. Shavu's very old-fashioned about losing prisoners. Anyone else in the club unhappy with the management? Oddly, no. The new boy's willingness to lead from the front does breed loyalty, I admit. Who's he spying on now? Not you, as far as I can tell. I'd be very surprised if he wasn't keeping an unauthorized eye on the boss— but I don't have any hard evidence yet, 
The club's good at covering its tracks, as you'd expect. Anything else I ought to be aware of? Minor procurement issues, but that's nothing to do with the new boy. How minor? Griping in the mess about substandard kit and difficult shortages at the moment. You might want to kick a few data pushers before it turns into a problem. I'll have someone look at it. It would keep Jason occupied. He cared about troop welfare. Matters like kit seem to hit morale hardest. It was a brief conversation. Two GA personnel who had every reason to be exchanging a few words. Nobody took any notice. The Supreme Commander and senior domestic security staff talked all the time. Nobody knew that the three individuals who were running the war dared not turn their backs on one another. That was politics. Admiral Cha Niathal was determined to get used to it. Star System M2X32905, near Bimiel. There was a presence following her, and Lumia could pick it out like a beacon even at this range. So could the meditation sphere. Broken, said the ship. In the back of her mind, the presence manifested as a jagged, shattered mass of black and white glass. If she concentrated on it long enough, it resolved into a whole vessel again. But the cracks were still visible. It's broken, all right, Lumia said. What shall we do, allow it to catch up? Or shall we see how good a hunter it is? The meditation sphere felt elated. The smoldering red flame that seemed embedded in its bulkheads grew brighter and more golden, and Lumia felt a conspiratorial sense of humor flood her. The ship was enjoying itself. Of course, it had been dormant on Zeost for untold years, a conscious thing waiting for purpose and interaction. Nothing in the galaxy enjoyed being alone, be it flesh or metal. Lumia rocked back on her heels, still a little disoriented by a cockpit that didn't wrap around her. It didn't feel like an extension of her body, as a starfighter did. Instead of neatly arranged screens and controls within her reach, there was nothing except stark, grainy, stone-like surfaces in which images appeared and then vanished again. The ship's bulkhead showed her a pattern of lights— a small craft matched their course at a range of 5,000 kilometers. The asteroid belt, where her base was hidden, appeared as a sprinkling of stars on a dark blue ground as if a hole had been punched in the bulkhead, and she almost expected to feel air rushing past as the vacuum beyond claimed her. Time to jump, she said. The meditation sphere felt as if it took a deep breath and lunged forward. There was no inertia, no sensation of movement whatsoever, and yet Lumia was sure her stomach leapt and her head spun with the acceleration. The tracking screen was gone. She was looking at the streaming lights of stars and then velvet blackness, unlit except for random pinprick flares. She could see beyond the ship. It was as if it weren't there. She knew where she was. She could feel the pursuing vessel dwindling to nothing behind her, and the transparasteel shattering into broken chaos again. For a moment she felt panic. For a moment she was in a stricken TIE fighter, struggling for life, broken, fired upon by Luke Skywalker, certain she'd die. Instantly the bulkheads became red-hot pumice again. She jerked back to the present. You're safe the ship said. It felt almost guilty for alarming her. She wanted to reassure it. Just a memory, she thought, nothing to concern you, and it seemed reassured. Nobody, nothing, had cared about her welfare for a very long time, not since she'd been in Imperial training. 
Luke Skywalker's brief affection didn't count. The broken pursuer has jumped, too, said the ship. Try not to outrun it too far. Lumia searched herself for regret and loneliness and found none. It was still good to find a sense of kinship with another intelligence. We don't want it to lose us. It is still following us, said the ship. What did you think of your last pilot? Lumia asked. Not like us. Not Sith material, then? No. The ship knew Ben wasn't fit to be Jason's apprentice. Less like us than the one who follows. The meditation sphere dropped out of hyperspace and made convincing speed for the asteroid. Lumia gave it a mental image of marking time until the pilot on their tail had located them again, and then showed it her habitat on the asteroid. They prepared to dock, Lumia and the ship, somehow one mind for brief moments. Ben had proven he wasn't the right apprentice for Jason. For all his fierce courage on Zeost, the boy had still succumbed to a sentimental Jedi urge and risked his life to rescue that child. He lacked the ruthless edge a Sith needed. But at least he had done something right. Without him, she wouldn't have this rare vessel. It would be instrumental in Jason's future. She could see it in the Force. Somehow her own future wasn't linked with it, but she'd look after it until the time came to relinquish control. Ben. She bore the boy no ill will, but he was simply surplus to requirements now. Is it him, though? Is this who Jason has to kill? Perhaps the Force had spared Ben from her plot for a reason. Perhaps it was his destiny to help his master by sacrificing his life. And so it wasn't Lumia's to take. I don't know what Jason has to do. I just don't know. I can't see the bridge he has to cross to become the Sith Lord he's destined to be. Did Jason believe that she had no more answers to that question than he did? She doubted it. He had to immortalize his love. To kill it. To destroy what he loved most. As the meditation spheres slipped into the docking bay of her habitat, Lumia pondered on what Jason Solo loved and couldn't bear to lose, the sacrifice that would take him beyond the mundane world and into greatness. His sister, Jaina? No, he'd already tried to have her court-martialed. His parents? He'd ordered their arrest. But punishment was one thing, and killing was another. Home, said the ship. I can defend you against the one who follows. Thank you. Lumia was taken aback. It's not necessary. Let the other ship land. Would it be Ben Skywalker? The boy was the nearest Lumia had seen to someone Jason loved. He wanted Ben to succeed. He ignored the weakness in the boy. Luke Skywalker? No. Jason cared nothing for Luke, and perhaps even despised him. Mara? She might have been the last person to stand by Jason, but he had less feeling for her than for his own parents. Ben, then. It was almost certainly Ben. Or maybe it wasn't a person. Maybe he had to kill an organization or something abstract. Perhaps he didn't have to kill anything at all. Lumia fought impatience. Whatever Jason's destiny might be, whatever pivotal act he had to perform, it would be soon. She could almost feel the fabric of the Force anticipating it. And perhaps it's going to be me he kills. But she was Sith, 
and any Sith would expect that of her pupil. It was a price she had to be ready to pay. Very broken, said the ship, snapping her out of her thoughts. Lumia got to her feet and stood in front of the bulkhead. The glowing pumice thinned to transparency, but it wasn't a visual illusion. The bulkhead opened to the atmosphere, and a ramp formed from the ship's casing. When Lumia walked down it into the hangar area, an old Conqueror assault vessel was edging through the airlocks. She hadn't seen one of the figure-eight-shaped ships in a long time. The hatch popped, and someone emerged, partly swathed in a cloak, but with a distinctive limping gait. You take your risks, Dancer. Lumia was beginning to find Alima Rar a liability. I might have fired on you. The Twi'lek threw the cloak back from her face and tilted her head. It was the practiced pose of a woman who had spent so much of her life being coquettish that it had become unconscious habit. She had been used to male attention, and still behaved as if she deserved it, even if there were no males around, and even if her looks had been ruined by lightsaber wounds. The severed stump of her leku gave her a grotesquely comic look. But Alima wasn't a laughing matter at all. She was, as the ship put it, broken. This was a damaged, vengeful creature that wanted to lash out, and Lumia had no patience with lack of discipline. Alima was also insane, and a dark Jedi with those problems was a very dangerous complication. But you didn't. The Twi'lek's eyes were on the meditation sphere. We find this ship interesting. I thought you might. Lumia indicated the doors leading to her chambers. Home wasn't the word. Seeing as you're here, you might as well come in. Alima prowled around the ship, gazing at it from all angles, clearly fascinated. It thinks, she said. This ship thinks. Thinking's useful. Try it sometime. Lumia knew she ought to handle a madwoman more carefully, but she was short on tolerance today. She strained to sense what the ship might be saying, but all she could detect was its watchfulness, its sensors taking a wary interest in Alima. It could probably taste her darkness. What brings you here? We have been tracking the Anakin Solo. We have considered Jason Solo's attitude to his parents, and we think we might gain access to Han and Leia Solo by working with Jason. Alima put a caressing hand on the meditation sphere, and Lumia felt it flinch, then somehow soften. It knew Alima was damaged. Its duty was to aid, to take care of its pilot. That tendency seemed to make it oddly sympathetic to those in need of assistance. Lumia sighed to herself. That was the last thing she needed, a Sith vessel that felt sorry for a crazy Twi'lek trollop. She sent the ship a sharp image of Alima. Face twisted with psychotic rage, crashing the sphere into a jagged mountain. The ship got the idea right away. Alima pulled back as if burned. It would be helpful for all of us, Lumia said carefully, if you avoided crossing Jason Solo's path at the moment. There's a war on, you know. We have our task, and you have yours. Ours is to have balance for what the Solos did to us. Leia will still be trying to bring her precious son back to the light, and that means he remains good bait for our purposes. Let me put it another way, Lumia said kindly, steering her toward the doors. Get in my way, and I'll kill you. Alima gave her a curious lopsided smile but allowed herself to be ushered into the living quarters. Do you know who you're dealing with? 
Alima asked. Lumia probed Alima's presence again. It felt like shards of broken glass in her mouth, as alien as any being she'd ever encountered. She'd been in the minds of the insane before, but never a Jedi, and never one this deluded. It was almost frightening. It was the sense of us that was most disturbing. She found it hard to pick her way between the hive-mind elements and the fragmented personality of one being. Yes, I do, Lumia said. And I'll still kill you if you let this feud ruin bigger strategies. There'll be time for you to have your revenge later. Interfere with my plans and I'll kill the Solos myself, and then you'll never have your balance. Lumia lowered her voice to a soothing whisper. And you know I can do that, don't you? Seemingly unperturbed, Alima gazed around Lumia's quarters. They were sparsely furnished now, because she'd taken most of her necessary possessions back to the safe house on Coruscant, or the latest address anyway, except for duplicates of the equipment she kept to maintain her cybernetic prosthetics and basic essentials for a brief stay. Alima had the look of someone sizing up an apartment and deciding whether to buy it. No, you can't stay here, said Lumia. Telepathy was beyond her, but she knew a proprietorial look when she saw it. It made sense to keep an eye on Alima. She was so fixated and reckless that she might, just might, put a hydrospanner in the works, and that wasn't something Lumia was prepared to risk. The stakes were too high. The moment too close. If I had any sense, I'd kill her now before she becomes too much trouble. But... Alima still had her uses, until her madness became too unmanageable. You understand revenge, said Alima. She settled on a sofa, one arm conspicuously limp, and a petulant frown creased her brow for a moment. Luke Skywalker destroyed your life. He left you scarred, too. Oh, much more than scarred. Lumia pulled her veil from her face and let Alima see the damage to her jaw. Then she placed one boot on a chair, took out a vibroblade, and rammed it into her thigh. There was a metallic scrape. Alima's expression was suitably surprised. I'm actually more machine than organic, Lumia went on. There's a point, I think, at which a woman ceases to be human with cybernetic implants and becomes a machine with organic parts. I believe I've passed that threshold. And you know what? I'm not unhappy with that. You want to punish Luke? as we want to punish Leia. Lumia leaned over Alima and caught her by her collar, jerking her face close to hers so she couldn't look away. Luke seems to think that too, which I find staggeringly arrogant. Was that a little fear in Alima's eyes? Sometimes it was interesting to play the madwoman herself. The galaxy revolves around him, he thinks. But then many men think that way. No, I don't miss my beauty, you fool, because it would have vanished by now anyway. Once I understood that my injuries freed me from worrying about such trivia, I realized I had a task that only I could fulfill. She tightened her grip on the flimsy fabric at Alima's throat. And that task is close to completion. So if you thwart me in any way, I'll become very focused on you. Do you understand? For a moment, Alima lost that oddly demented expression and looked like a normal sane person in fear of her life. Lumia wasn't sure what she looked like herself at that moment, but it seemed to work. 
we will respect your wishes, Alima said imperiously. Lumia decided not to backhand her, but it took an effort. She didn't have time for this nonsense. Do yourself a favor, she said, and let Alima's collar slide out of her grasp with a hiss of sheer fabric over her gloves. Ask yourself what you have against Leia Solo, other than the fact that she made you ugly. If there's nothing beyond that, then your quest for balance is a waste of time. Alima blinked as if she'd been slapped. Maybe it was the first time anyone had used the word ugly to her. She wasn't. She wasn't anything. In a galaxy of vastly diverse life forms, Lumia had ceased to be able to judge appeal, or even want to. It was fascinating how the once beautiful fared so much worse than lesser mortals when age and disfigurement overtook them. It was all illusion. The millions of species in the galaxy couldn't agree on what constituted beauty anyway. But Alima looked as if she was thinking it over. We still wish to help you achieve your objective. Good, said Lumia. The way Alima used we gnawed away at her patience for some reason. She knew it was a hive-mind remnant of her joiner days, but it irked her. Because if hurting Leia is what you want most, letting Jason get on with what he has to do is going to hurt her most of all. Do you want to hurt Leia? She's done nothing to me. I have no feelings either way. There might be something you can do to help me. Something you do better than anyone. Appeal to her vanity. It's big enough. Keep tabs on Jason for me. Covert observation. We will. But can you not locate him any time you want? Not closely enough. Lumia didn't have the complete Sith ability to see all the pieces in the game, every element in the battle. That was for a full Sith master. But she didn't need to let on that she had fewer powers than Alima might think. I don't have time to log his movements, but for his own safety I need to know exactly where he is at all times, especially when he leaves Coruscant. Do you think you can do that? It's tedious work, but necessary. We can. And lose the Conqueror. I'll find you a less conspicuous ship. The Orange Sphere? No. Alima seemed to have taken a fancy to the Sith vessel. Perhaps it was because she could communicate with it. Once Lumia penetrated the jagged chaos in her mind, there was a sense of isolation in the Twi'lek that made her recoil. Something more suitable, and cover your tracks when you leave. Don't lead anyone back to this asteroid. Our expertise is surveillance and assassination, Alima said stiffly. We aren't an amateur. Lumia took her through the winding passages that honeycombed the asteroid and brought her to the emergency access. Even in space, she thought of it as the back door, where a few small ships were standing idle. Once she'd had a battle fleet, but it was long gone in the Yuzhan Vong War. Her needs were different now, anyway. She needed stealth, not firepower. There! She pointed Alima to a decidedly scruffy shuttle, the kind that priority couriers used to ferry urgent consignments between worlds. It was fifteen meters long, and a third of that was now given over to a hyperdrive and discrete armaments. A courier shuttle needed to be fast and able to defend itself against piracy, but this one had considerably more than the standard specifications— Lumia waited for Alima to complain about it. We won't be noticed in this, 
the Twi'lek said, appearing satisfied. You can change the identification transponder and the livery panel to any of a hundred courier companies. That configuration was actually standard, but Lumia had added a few bogus and untraceable companies for good measure. It's not luxurious, but it does the job. Alima lifted the hatch. It sprung away from the casing to form an awning. She peered inside. She took everything from us. Her voice was muffled by the hatchway. Then she pulled out again. We're alone. She's made us solitary. Oh, give me strength. She's rambling again. Who did? Leia Solo. She took our leku, and so we can't communicate fully with others. She caused the destruction of our nest, too. And she took what attracted others to us. Our beauty. Alima had been thinking then. She'd chewed over Lumia's challenge and worked out what really drove her. We're lonely, and we can never touch the world properly again. Lumia had been trained never to drop her guard, and pity wasn't something she was accustomed to feeling. She didn't quite feel pity for Alima, but she did get a sudden and painful glimpse of her loss, and it must have been a particularly agonizing one for a Twi'lek. Without both Leku intact, she would have difficulty communicating with others of her kind, feeling pleasure, even loving someone. The head tails were part of her nervous system, and how much more in need of intimacy was she now, after becoming part of a close-knit Killick nest? Alima did have her reasons for wanting retribution then. Lumia was careful not to let that brief flood of pity start her thinking about what normality she, too, had lost. I'm sorry, Lumia said, and meant it. Now use that to remain focused and to bide your time. Alima looked at the courier shuttle and seemed to be somewhere else entirely. Then she gazed down at the deck of the hangar and began swaying a little as if listening to music. She raised one arm, the other hung limp, paralyzed by Luke Skywalker's lightsaber, and seemed to be going through the motions of a dance, turning slowly and with difficulty on her crippled foot. For a moment Lumia thought it was one of her affectations, then she realized that it was quite genuine. Alima was remembering her past, and what she could no longer do. We were a dancer, she said wistfully, but she was talking to herself. We loved to dance. Lumia tried to think of all the things she had once loved to do, in the days before she entered Imperial service, and remembered none of them. Get a move on, dancer, she said. You can start by tracking the Anakin Solo. The past didn't matter. Any of it. There was only the future. Sanvia Vitajuice Bar, Coruscant Mara swirled the sediment of ground apple and dewflower juice around her glass and drank reluctantly as Kip Duran watched. He clearly had something to say that he didn't want to bring up in the Jedi Council Chamber, or in front of Luke. And Ben still hadn't called in. The Anakin Solo had arrived back at Coruscant two days earlier, and there was no sign of Ben. Somehow she'd hoped he would have made his way to Jason even if he wasn't feeling communicative. Just feeling that he was alive and unharmed wasn't enough. He was her little boy. She didn't care how many center points he could take out. This was her kid, and she couldn't stand it. Sometimes, when she looked at their lives through the eyes of a normal mother for a brief moment, she was horrified. If I didn't know better, Kip said, I'd think you were avoiding me, the whole Jedi Council, in fact. 
just busy. But you called me here for a reason, and it wasn't to boost my antioxidant levels. Well, maybe I'm just observant, but we have an out-of-control Jedi on the loose. Maybe the Council can help you with that. You know, combined efforts of the most experienced Jedi in the galaxy? What if I say Luke and I can handle it on our own? Oh, family business. That, and the fact that not all the Council is on the same side, so we don't want to open a rift, Mara said. Been there, done that. Put yourself in Corin's position. Would you feel comfortable helping the chief of the G.A.'s bully boy police after what he's been doing to Corellians and even his own parents? Better we clear up our own family mess. I'm surprised that Luke's tolerated Jason this long, Kip commented. I wasn't entirely joking when I said we should make Jason a master. People tend to stop throwing rocks when they're inside the tent. I think now might not be the best time. Is Luke embarrassed he's got problems within his own family? Mara almost blurted out that she'd stopped Luke from acting more than once, and now she bitterly regretted it. But that wasn't wholly true. If I tell you that I've identified the root cause and I'm going to deal with it, will you back off? I note the pronoun... Luke knows what I'm doing, which is... I'm going to kill Lumia. That removes the threat to Ben, but how does it deal with Jason? She's infiltrated the GAG. I don't know who her insiders are, but we have to assume she can get at Jason, too. She might even influence him. She's got to go. What took you so long? The old cyborg must be running low on lube oil by now. You could take her any time. Luke tends to favor taking people alive and trying to talk them around. She couldn't bring herself to tell Kip that Luke had had a civilized chat with Lumia on the resort satellite. Touched her, even when she had her light whip in the other hand. He said her intentions felt peaceful. What was he thinking? But she's not so decrepit. Believe me, I won't have an easy time of it. I'll help you if you want backup. I don't think I'll need it, but thanks. Mara couldn't avoid the next question. What are the rest of the council members saying? That you need to get a grip on this. We talk, you know. So we have a Jedi Council with the Skywalkers and a Shadow Council meeting without them. Sounds like a fault line's forming. Well, you decided to go whack a Sith without consulting us. Mara tried to see the double standard, spotted it easily, and ignored it. If I'd stood up in council and said, Hey, this lunatic is threatening my kid and keeps coming after my husband, so I'm going to take her head off, you really think the other members would have nodded politely and voted on it? There are folks who think like Luke does, that the Council doesn't condone assassinations, and that would make that fault line into a big rift faster than a greased pod racer. Kip inspected the depths of his juice. He'd ordered something thick and opaquely orange that he didn't seem to be enjoying. So you're saving us from the moral dilemma. If that's the way you want to see it. The Vita Juice Bar was quiet, and smelled unappetizingly of wet, raw greenery like a flower shop. Maybe that was why it was so quiet. It made it a good place to meet. Nobody knew them here. Most of the customers seemed to be Ementis, probably because they could guarantee getting totally fruit-based nourishment here, prepared right in front of their six eyes. Ementis weren't big on trust, least of all in Coruscant's catering industry. How much do I expect everyone to trust me? Mara struggled with not telling her husband the entire truth while she confided in a friend. That was the problem. They were all friends, the whole Jedi Council. 
the Galactic Alliance Senate could tear chunks out of itself and not feel it, because it was thousands of rivals and enemies and even strangers. But the Council, they'd grown up together in many cases. They'd fought together. They were family, and not just because they were Jedi. Silgal often cited the ancient rule of no attachments, but the Council was one big attachment in its own right. Mara realized she didn't like Dewflower, mused on ways to get around a light whip, and then flinched as her comlink chirped. She pulled it from her belt and raised it to see Ben's face. Mom, I just landed, he said. I— Ben? Are you at the military port? No, the civilian one. Galactic City. Look, I'm sorry that— Stay right where you are. Don't move, okay? I'll meet you at Arrivals 7B, okay? Mom, no arguing this time. Be there. Mara snapped the comlink closed and grabbed her jacket. If you're thinking of telling Luke, Kip, give me a head start. Wouldn't dream of getting involved, he said, shrugging. I'm glad Ben's okay. Just remember that kids like clear limits. He's still too young to set his own. Tried that, Mara said, and strode for the doors. And he set his own just fine. She worked her way through the crowds at the spaceport, sensing Ben's location. There were black-suited GAG personnel operating openly now, on foot patrol in the arrivals hall with blue-uniformed CSF officers. They were pretty conspicuous for secret police. Jason was adept at hearts and minds operations. He seemed to like to have his deterrence visible. It certainly seemed to reassure the public, despite the black visors that gave the G.A.G. troopers the facelessly dispassionate air of battle droids. And suddenly there was Ben, sitting on the white marble pedestal of the ten-meter abstract statue of Prosperity that formed one of the supports for the central dome of the roof of the arrivals hall. Prosperity, progress, culture, and peace. Peace. Fat chance. Ben looked like any other fourteen-year-old kid, drumming his heels idly against the marble, staring intently at his data pad, and keying in something one-handed. A G.A.G. trooper passed him. Ben looked up, nodded in acknowledgment, and got a respectful nod back. If Mara needed a reminder that Ben was anything but a normal teenager, that was it. He was a junior lieutenant. He commanded troopers like that. Her son helped run the secret police. But she'd learned the most silent and efficient ways to kill the Emperor's enemies by Ben's age, and Luke had been just five years older when he joined the rebellion. What did we expect to give birth to? A librarian? Hi, Mom. Ben slid the data pad into his jacket pocket. He had that tight-lipped look that went with bracing for a dressing down. You're mad at me, right? Mara paused, wanting at the same time to yell at him for terrifying her and to grab him in a ferocious hug. She settled for swallowing both reactions and ruffling his hair. He'd never live it down back at the barracks otherwise. You couldn't call us? She said. You couldn't even tell Jason where you were? Ben frowned slightly. I'm sorry. I was on a mission, and I didn't want to give away my location. We can talk about it later. Let's have lunch. She gestured toward the exit. It's okay. Your dad will be happy just to see you back safe. No yelling. I promise. Ben slid off the pedestal in uncharacteristic silence, and they walked to the speeder platforms. Mara kept a careful eye on the crowd not entirely sure if she'd recognize or even sense Lumia if she was around. Lumia might even send one of her minions, and she had people within the G.A.G. The biggest threat might be one of Ben's own troopers. "'What are you frightened of, Mom?' Ben asked. Mara didn't take her eyes off the crowds around them. She scanned constantly, as she had been trained to do. "'Okay, you might as well know.' Lumia is trying to kill you. Ben gave a little grunt that might have been disbelief, 
and seemed to mull over the idea rather than show alarm. Because she's still got this vendetta with Dad? Mainly because you killed her daughter. Uh, okay, I'll take her word for it. Mara shielded Ben as he got into the speeder. It was always a vulnerable moment. She'd taken a few targets as they ducked into vehicles, caught off balance for a moment. The hatches closed with a sigh of air, and she turned to look at him closely. I mean it, Ben. She's dangerous and she's subtle. So until we neutralize her, you have to be on your guard. She's got connections within the GAG. It could be anyone. If she was going to have this spy of hers in the guard kill me, she'd have done it by now. He slouched in the passenger's seat. But I'll be careful. Wow, this is getting messy. What with Jason on Fett's list for killing his daughter, and me killing Lumia's. I suppose that's what the job's about, isn't it? You collect enemies. Hey, the boys have got a bet going on when and how Fett's going to come after Jason. Mara wasn't sure if Ben was making light of the threat for her sake, or just indulging in normal teenage dismissal. Fat was the least of her worries. And have you placed your bet? Oh, Jason can take him. But it's kind of weird that Fat hasn't made a move. The longer he waits, the more people get freaked, I suppose. If Fat comes for Jason, she said, let him handle it, okay? The speeder climbed into one of the automated sky lanes and headed for the rotunda zone. Ben gazed out of the side screen in silence. So can you tell me what this mission was? Mara asked. Ben did that three-second pause that meant he was framing his words carefully. I had to bring back a prototype vessel. I wasn't in any more danger than I could comfortably handle. That was a relief. It was just an errand. Although why Jason hadn't known about it baffled her. And you missed your birthday celebration. You know how folks say that you get to a point in life when birthdays don't matter? That's how it felt. Sweetheart, that's only when you get a lot older, not fourteen. If anything could break Mara's heart, it was that. Ben's childhood had passed him by. Next year, I promise, we'll have a family get-together. Really mark the day. You think the war will be over by then? If it's not, we'll still have a party. All of us. Uncle Han and Aunt Leia, too? Even after I tried to arrest Uncle Han? And that was the bizarre reality of a civil war. A teenage boy sent to detain his aunt and uncle, and then fretting over whether they'd attend his next birthday party. Mara sometimes tried to add up the days she'd lived that weren't about killing and warfare. And there were so very, very few. She wanted a different future for Ben. Yes, even after that, she said. Ben, does Jason know you're back? Yeah. He didn't volunteer any more. It's okay. I report back for duty at 0800 tomorrow. I haven't gone AWOL. I'll have one last try, then. Ben, I worry about you. Your dad and I would really sleep a lot better if you left the GAG and came on missions with us. Mara braced for incoming. But Ben thought visibly for a while, and when he spoke his tone was soft and unsettlingly adult. Unsettlingly old. Mom, have you ever had to do something you didn't want to do, but knew you had to? Mara certainly had, so many times that she took it for granted. And at any given time, whether working for the Empire or the New Republic, or whatever the stang her paymaster called itself, she'd always thought it was right. Yes, sweetheart, I have, she said, and knew she now had no moral high ground from which to look down upon her son, or anyone else for that matter. And the problem was that when I looked back, I found I'd done the wrong thing sometimes. But it'll be years before I'll know if what I'm doing now is right. 
you have to go with the best data you have at the time. It was a weary man's statement, not a boy's. Ben was a soldier. He was what she and Luke had made him. She'd wanted a Jedi son, and now she had one. Next year, she said, next year we'll have that party, come what may. Chapter 3 Mishuk Gotalu Mishurak Pako Kiore Pressure makes gems, ease makes decay. Mandalorian Proverb Slave 1, en route to Bador, Kuat System Mirta Gev had settled for being tolerated by her grandfather, and although she made an effort to love him, it was hard. Part of her still wanted to make him pay for the life her mother and grandmother had endured, and part saw a man who had every form of regard shown him except love, and pitied him. Overall she saw a man who put up duracrete barriers and defied anyone to breach them. As he took the fire spray out of Mandalore's orbit and prepared to jump to hyperspace, his expression was set in apparent blank disdain for the everyday world. She decided his helmet presented the softer face of the two. At least she got to sit in the co-pilot's seat. That seemed to be the nearest that Boba Fett could ever get to approving of her as his own flesh and blood. Your clone's not an active bounty hunter said Fett. There was never any preamble in his conversations. No small talk. No intimacy. He was all business. I checked every bounty hunter and wannabe on the books. But none is called Skirata. Plenty of people on Mandalore knew Cal Skirata. And then... gone. Vanished. But he was on a hunt. I know that. He told me to get out of his way. Did Fett believe her? She'd stitched him up and tried to lure him to his death, so she could hardly blame him if he was having second thoughts about the clone. The man was real, all right. So we're retracing his steps? Yours. How are you going to pass yourself off as a client looking to hire a bounty hunter? I'm not. You are. Myrta suddenly realized why he'd agreed to let her ride along. My, I do come in handy, don't I? Earn your keep. Rules of any partnership. Myrta thought that sounded remarkably like her dead mother. Aelin Vell was more a chip from the granite block of Fett than she'd ever admit. But that was impossible. She'd been a baby when Fett had left her grandmother too young to pick up his callous ways. How do you cope? Myrta asked. What? How do you cope with being alone? Are you going to yap all the way to Kuat? You can't bring yourself to tell me to shut up, can you? I cope because I like it that way, Fett said. Well, Mama was all I had, and I don't like it that way. Fett paused, and there was the faintest movement of his lips, as if he was stopping himself from saying something he'd regret. He ought to have understood, she thought. He'd lost his father at the hands of a Jedi, too. Yeah, he said. What about your dad? He died in a hull breach, not even in combat. Why'd Aelin marry a Mondo? Sintas must have warned her were bad news. Myrta found she was clutching the Heart of Fire pendant tight in her fist. It was just half of the original stone. The other slice, split from it with a blow from the butt of Fett's blaster, was buried with Aelin Vell in a modest grave outside Keldabe, in an ancient wood that the Vongese hadn't managed to destroy. I can't feel anything from this stone. It ought to tell me something. I'm Kifar. Part Kifar, anyway. 
She hung around Mondoade to get a better idea of how to hunt you. Then she met Papa. It didn't last. Romantic. She cared about him. Then she let him make a Mondo of you. I spent two summers with Papa on Null, after he and Mama split up. He taught me everything he could, and then he got killed. She didn't say it to shut Fed up. He was hardly a talkative man anyway. But there was quiet, and then there was breath-holding silence. That was what she heard now. That's too bad, he said. Don't try to out-orphan me, Babuir. I know what it's like. She struggled between the hatred she'd been taught to feel for him and the evidence of her own eyes that he wasn't a monster. At least, not the monster painted by her mother. The very thought felt disloyal to the dead. After almost two months, she'd reached the stage where she had days when her mother wasn't her first waking thought, and didn't haunt her dreams. That felt like betrayal, too. But life had to go on. She had to make sense of this, and not let Aelin Vell's death be for nothing. No need to discuss it, then. He inhaled. He looked like he'd been holding his breath all that time. Are you okay living where you are? Yeah. I could buy you a house of your own. Anywhere. Myrton never knew when he was going to flip over into awkward generosity. Bevin said he had his moments. He might, of course, have been trying to get rid of her with the lure of a place on a far planet. I'm okay where I am, thanks. No, that sounded dismissive. I meant that I like living with Vevut's family. Fett said nothing. She knew what he was thinking now. Yes, I do like Orade, she said. He's a good man. You're a grown woman. None of my business. But everyone knew she was a Fett now, and that carried with it some burdens. It took a brave man to risk a Mandalore for a grandfather-in-law, especially one with Boba Fett's reputation. Myrta shut her eyes and tried to listen for whispered messages from the Heart of Fire. Why can't you get information from that? Fett asked suddenly. I'm only part Kifar. I don't have the full ability to sense things from objects. She opened her eyes again. Fett was still an implacable statue of detachment. She studied his profile to see what of him might be in her. It's called psychometry. They say some Jedi can do it, too. Mentioning Jedi might not have been a good idea. But Fett didn't show any reaction. The stone absorbs memories from the giver and receiver, he said. Sintas said so. Ah. Under the veneer, there might have been a man who wanted to either relive happier times or hide the ones he preferred to forget. The stone held a little bit of Sintas Vell's spirit, and a little bit of his. There was more veneer to him now than Kor, Myrta suspected, but she'd seen him cry— and nobody else had ever seen the adult Boba Fett weaken. She was sure of that. Maybe he hadn't even cried as a kid. I'm trying hard, Babuir. Worst thing you did was tell me you knew what happened to Sintas. It was a slap in the face. When she'd said it, she hadn't even known if it would do the trick and lead him into her mother's ambush. Now she regretted hurting a dying man even if she had been raised to loathe him. We'll find out how Grandmama died. I promise. After I get that clone, Fett said, all gravel and calculation, I'll find a full-blooded Kifar to read the stone. Myrta took it as a cue to shut up. 
playing happy families wasn't the fet way. She wondered how many other families had the record of violent death and attempted murder that theirs did. I hope what's in me is more like Papa. Then she recalled Leia Solo deflecting her blaster shot at Fett, and knew that it was Babuir's blood in her veins after all. Grandpapa's. Stand by, said Fett. He didn't deploy full dampers when Slave One jumped. He never did. The acceleration to light speed and beyond felt like being punched in the chest and then sat on by a hut. She made a point of biting her lip discreetly as the stars streaked to lines of blue-white fire and the crushing sensation passed. That had to hurt him, too. He was a sick man. Myrta fumbled in her pocket, pulled out some painkiller capsules, and held them out to him. He took them without a word. His fingertips were cold. It felt like a long, silent lifetime to Kuwadi space. Myrta filled it with planning how she would disembowel Jason Solo if and when she got the chance. There was already a line forming for the privilege. Babuir wouldn't say what he had in mind for him. All she was certain of was that Boba Fett never turned his back on a score that required settling. Decelerating in half a standard hour, he said. She wanted very badly to love him, but couldn't. If she had found out what happened between him and her grandmother, she might have found it easier. But she knew it might also have confirmed her legacy of revenge. One thing she'd learned fast was that it was a subject to avoid. It wasn't that she was afraid of asking. She just couldn't get past the silent routine. He could make the world outside vanish if he wanted to. Bador was a striking contrast to Mandalore. Slave One swept on a descent path past orbiters and over cities studded with straight roads and open plazas. Myrta checked her data pad to orient herself. What was your dad's name? Fett asked. Makin Marek. Fett always had a reason for asking questions. Perhaps he was wondering who else he might be related to. They landed at one of the massive public ports in Bunar and Fett went through his ritual of setting all the alarms, trip beams, and other lethal traps that would greet anyone stupid enough to try breaking into Slave One. He brought a small speeder bike in the hold, and he swung onto the seat a lot more easily than he had last time. The painkillers were strong enough to anesthetize a bantha. You're navigating, he said. He bounced a little on the leather saddle, as if testing whether he could feel any pain. Get on. Myrta patched her data pad into her helmet system. Head down that speeder lane and go south for five kilometers. She was getting used to wearing a boucher. At first it had seemed suffocating and disorienting, but weeks of being surrounded by people who relied on theirs had made her feel a misfit without one. The streaming data on the HUD now got her attention without distracting her. She hadn't fallen over anything for a while. And it made her feel mondo. Her father would have approved, but she tried not to think what Mama would have said. I miss you, Mama. I miss you so much, and I never even said goodbye. Fett's tattered cape slapped against her visor in the slipstream, jerking her out of her memories and Myrta wondered if she'd eventually become like her grandfather, or like her mother. Bitter resentment about being robbed of a parent seemed to run in the family. Fett steered the speeder through increasingly seedy neighborhoods and canyons of high-rise warehouses and apartment houses. Bounty hunters tended not to ply their trade in the better parts of town. The number of shabby family homes decreased, and the scattering of unsavory characters loitering on corners and in speeders increased. So what were you after here? Fett asked. Recovering stolen data. You mean people around here can read? No, I have clients who can. 
The locals steal anything even if they don't know what it is. I go and persuade them to hand it back. And your clone with the gray gloves was definitely here. Yes. After a couple of wrong turns, the cantina appeared right on cue. In daylight, it looked even worse than it had when she'd last visited. A peppering of blaster burns had left blisters in the paint on the doors, and the masonry was pocked with holes from ballistic rounds that hadn't been there last time, as far as she could tell. A trail of blood drops from the door ended in a larger pool, dried to a dull, tarry blackness. Street cleaning wasn't frequent here. A sign above the door said, Welcome to the Paradise Cantina. It also said, No helmets. I'm offended that they don't respect cultural diversity, Fett muttered. That's how I know what the clone in gray looked like. He took his helmet off. Fine. A couple of low-life males, a human and a Rodian, ambled to within ten meters of the speeder and stared at it. Then they seemed to notice Fett, and then his blaster and rocket-loaded backpack, and suddenly they appeared to remember pressing business elsewhere. Fett locked the speeder and set the anti-theft device with a thermal detonator. The two males broke into a run in the opposite direction and vanished. They don't seem to know me here anyway. Fame's fleeting. Myrta took off her helmet. Fed ignored the request above the doors. The bar smelled as bad as it ever had, a mix of vomit, stale ale, and oil that could have been from machines or very old fried food. The clientele matched their environment, possibly because they'd spent their disposable income on state-of-the-art weaponry. The Kuwati barkeeper was filling small dishes on the countertop with pickles that bore an unappetizing resemblance to eyeballs. So they stood at the bar trying to look normal. Normal for the paradise, anyway. The barkeep caught sight of Myrta first. She must have been staring at the pickles too carefully. You got to buy a drink, he said. No snacks without. Then his gaze swiveled. The helmet got his attention the way a chest plate alone didn't. Oh, you got the nerve to come in here, have you? You mondo slag! He ducked below the counter for a split second. And that meant only one thing. Myrta wasn't sure if she had her blaster level before Babuir did. But when the man straightened up with a highly illegal short-barreled ten-loss disruptor that could have reduced them both to ground nerf, he was looking down the muzzles of Fett's sawn-off EE-3 and her Blast Tech 515. It startled the barkeep long enough for Fett to land a left hook straight in his face. He fell back against the glasses stacked behind him, and a couple smashed on the tiles. Fett caught the disruptor as it clattered onto the counter. Myrta instinctively covered his back, but none of the customers moved. She was starting to feel comfortable doing this double act. The sense of camaraderie, a long way short of family bond, had crept up on her. Fett examined the disruptor and jammed the safety catch on hard, one-handed. Remember, no disintegrations. The bartender staggered upright, cupping one hand under his nose to catch the dripping blood. The last mondo who came in here wrecked this place— you're all the criffing same, and I don't want you in here, so why don't you— Myrta realized she must have missed some fun and games after she'd left the gray clone to his hunting. That was a long-lost relative, she said. We're looking for him. Well, when you have your family reunion, I want him to pay for the damage from last time. The man didn't seem to recognize Babuir but then Fett wouldn't have taken a contract from this low down the food chain. Senators, crime lords, and the wealthy who could afford him knew his armor. Barkeeps tended not to. Time we shared some reminiscences about my wayward kin, said Fett, 
tapping his forefinger impatiently against the trigger guard of his blaster. I'm not as careful as him. My name's Fett. The barkeeper's face drained of what blood there was left in it. Myrta actually watched his color change to a pasty gray. She'd never seen physical fear like that before. The man's eyes scanned Fett's visor, and the revelation was almost comic. It was a while ago. Mandalorian in gray armor with gray gloves. Called Skirata. If the bartender was expecting some credits to be slapped on the counter to jog his memory, Fett wasn't playing. What do you know? Okay. He killed a guy here. Lot of damage. Lot of attention from security, too. The barkeeper stared at Myrta now, and he was evidently piecing things together. Yeah. You were with him, weren't you? Not for long said Myrta. She'd moved out of the clone's way fast. Into a different cantina, in fact. Who did he kill? Gang boss called Cherit. It made the local Holonews even. Obviously, most shootouts here didn't warrant a headline. Myrta made a mental note to check the archives. What do you know about Cherit that didn't make the news? Nothing. I realize a blow to the face can affect your memory. Fett still hadn't lowered his blaster. Try again. Okay. Cherit's outfit supplied rack, luxatalic, and twillet girls to some minor Kuati knobs. He was doing his deals here for a while. Maybe he was muscling in on your relative's turf. Doesn't sound like our line of work. Fett stood facing the man for a long, long time. The barkeeper looked like he was grasping for something else to say to fill the silence. Eventually, Fett leaned his blaster against his shoulder, muzzle up in the safety position, and seemed appeased. If you see him again, tell him little Boba wants to see him about a job. How's he going to get in touch with you? Mandalore. Right turn off the Hidian Way. Can't miss it. Okay. And where does Cherit's gang hang out now? The barkeeper turned to the shelves behind him and fumbled frantically in a pile of flimsy sheets. Don't tell Frigg I gave you this. It was a napkin embossed with a logo that said, The Tekshar Falls Casino. You'll find Frag there most afternoons, at the Sabat tables. Kuat City. Frag took over from Cherit. Fett pocketed the napkin and strode out. Myrta followed him, backing through the doors more from habit than fear of attack. You reckon Frag paid the clone for a change of management? She said, scrambling astride the speeder behind him. That's what I'm thinking. If he did, he'll know how to find him. The speeder bike swooped over the rougher parts of Bunar and headed back to Slave One. Do you play Sabak? Fed asked. Myrta knew without asking that her grandfather wasn't a recreational gambler. No. Plan B, then. What plan B? I'll tell you when I've worked it out. What was plan A? Dress you up nice, send you in to play a hand or two, and wheedle something out of Frag. Thanks. It'd never have worked anyway. You're not the wheedling type. It might have been an insult or a compliment, but she had no way of knowing with Fett. I want to like him. He's not likable, but he's not what you told me he was either, Mama. How could you even know? Myrta found herself arguing with a dead woman, hating herself for it, and finding that nothing she thought she knew was solid any longer. She took one hand off the speeder's grab bar and eased the heart of fire from under her chest plate to grasp it. 
Maybe it would tell her something sooner or later. Great painkillers, said Fett. She could see the dried blood on the knuckles of his left glove as he flexed his fist. The stain was bothering him. Thanks. There was the faintest tinge of warmth in his voice. It was a start. Jason Solo's Office G-A-G-H-Q, Coruscant There was a voice in Jason's head, and he never knew whose it was. At times it was clearly Verger, clearly a memory, but at others he wasn't sure if it was his own thoughts or Lumia's suggestions surfacing from his subconscious, or something else altogether. There were times when he even thought it was his conscience— it was his conscience now, he was sure of it. All he could see was his daughter, Alana. So you're not thinking about Tenelka, then? Whatever act he had to perform to become a full Sith Lord, it would be extreme. It had to be harder than killing a fellow Jedi, harder even than herding Corellians into camps, or turning on his own parents and sister— or subverting democracy. It had to be the most painful decision he'd ever taken. I just can't kill my little girl. Who says I have to? What would that prove? That you'd do anything to acquire the powers to bring peace and order to the galaxy. It was Alana's future that had made him start down this path. Now it would be a secure future for everyone's kid except his own. That's what it's about, Jason. Service. Painful service. Embrace that pain. No, it wasn't service. It was insane. He wouldn't do it. But was it any different from sending your own children to war? Making the same sacrifice as millions of other parents? Wasn't it always harder to give a loved one's life than your own? No. The only sacrifice worth making is your own life. But Lumia said he'd know. She said he'd know what he had to do when the time came, and she couldn't tell him. He'd been with Tenelka and Alana since then. He'd felt nothing, no hint from the Force that this was the final step— that these were the people he had to kill. Maybe this is denial, delusion. It's not Alana. It's not even Tenelka. It's not them, he said. It has to be Ben. And then he was back in his office, horribly aware, looking up at a bewildered Corporal LeCalf. There was a cup of calf on the desk in front of him, and he hadn't seen anyone put it there. He'd never been that distracted before. It scared him. He couldn't afford another lapse like that. Lieutenant Skywalker hasn't reported for duty yet, sir. Lecauf, grandson of the officer who had faithfully served Lord Vader, had a scrubbed, freckled cheerfulness that prevented him from looking menacing, even in black G.A.G. -G armor with a B.T. 25 blaster. Can I help? Jason felt his face burn. Apologies, Corporal. I was thinking aloud. That's okay, sir. I thought you were doing some of that Jedi stuff. Communing. Jason had to think for a moment. Melding. That's the stuff. I think I need more calf before I try that today. Thank you. Did you get Admiral Neoffel's message about Kit, sir? What's that? Jason checked his datapad and assorted comlinks. Bureaucracy didn't come easily to him. He'd make sure he had the best administrators when he... When I what? When I rule as a Sith Lord. The idea was ninety percent sobering, nine percent inappropriately exciting 
and 1% repellent. If he could have identified the source of the revulsion, a distaste for power, an old Jedi taboo, plain ignorance, he would have listened to it. But the voice wasn't loud enough. It was his small fears, his reluctance to accept responsibility, and that was something he had to ignore. She says some of the frontline units are having problems getting the kit they need, Lekauf said. Annoying stuff. Specialist ordnance, comm parts, but some seriously non-negotiable items like medical supplies, too. They're also complaining that the cannon maintenance packs aren't up to standard, and they've had some malfunctions. Lekauf raised his eyebrows. We're starting to find problems acquiring what we need, too, sir. That got Jason's attention. This is the richest and most technically advanced planet in the galaxy, and we can't keep our forces adequately supplied in a war? Lekauf gave Jason a significant nod that directed him to his holoscreen. I think the Admiral put it a little more emphatically, but that's her general reaction as well. Is there a reason for this? Procurement and supply seem to be dragging their feet, sir. Time I undragged them, Jason said. He hit the comm key and opened the line to procurement. I'm sure it's fixable. If you'd like me to talk to them, sir, I think they need a full colonel to motivate them, Lekauf. But I'm grateful for your offer. Jason suddenly felt it was the most pressing task on his list. He and Neothel expected a lot from the armed forces, and it wasn't too much to expect the military bureaucracy to back them up. I'll get things moving. Find Captain Chevu for me, will you? He's out on surveillance, sir. Intercepted some nasty ordnance, so he's out with Sergeant Weirat watching a drop-off point. Chevu was hands-on. He didn't seem to be as enthusiastic about the G.A.G.'s role as he had been a few weeks earlier, but he did his job and led from the front. There was nothing more Jason could ask of an officer. Okay. I'll catch up with him when he's relieved. Procurement frustrated Jason from the start. When he got an answer from the comm, his status as commander of the G.A.G. didn't seem to open as many doors as it did in the rest of the Alliance. By the time he was put through to a senior civil servant in fleet supply, a woman called Gellis, he wasn't impressed, and his calf was cold. "'We can't bypass the supply system, sir,' said Gellis. "'All requests are dealt with in sequence. Shouldn't they be dealt with by urgency, as in front line?' "'I don't have the power to do that under the procurement regulations, sir.' Who do I talk to about quality of supplies? Which supplies? You see, we have four item departments, cannon maintenance packs. We're getting complaints about poor quality replacement parts. That would be engineering support. They have their own system. You'll have to— Jason had learned patience and a dozen ways to calm his mind in crisis from as many esoteric force-using schools. He didn't want to use any of them. He wanted to lose his temper. He wanted action. There's a war on, he said quietly. All I want is for the right kit to get to the people fighting. What's the fastest way to do that? You're not fleet, are you, sir? G.A.G. is domestic. Meaning? This isn't your chain of command— We'd need authorization from a senior officer from Fleet to pursue this request. It's the regulations, sir. But I'm commander of the Galactic Alliance Guard. I don't even have this much trouble getting to see Chief Omis. The apparently limited scope of his authority galled him. He could call on star destroyers and entire armies, but getting past a bureaucrat was impossible. Would the Supreme Commander's word do? Gellis swallowed audibly. Yes, sir. Then I'll come back with that. Jason closed the link, furious. Rules. 
he wasn't used to these arbitrary limits. If he couldn't get simple supply issues ironed out, then his future as a Sith Lord looked limited. His rational mind told him this was an annoyance that could be solved with a message to Neothal and a little delegation to a junior officer. But another sense entirely told him he had to stick with this. Good for morale, he thought. No, it was something else. He couldn't put his finger on it. Rules and regulations. He scrolled through the comm codes for the Alliance Defense Departments and found legal and legislative. He tapped the sequence, and a human voice answered. Can I borrow a legal analyst droid? He asked the assistant. Jason preferred his legal advice from the most dispassionate and unimaginatively honest sources. A droid could grind through the small print in the statutes for him. Right away, sir. That was more like it. Jason's mood improved. In the meantime, he still needed that simple authorization from Admiral Neothel to get the kit moving. Good officer. Good tactician. Hidebound attitudes. But he needed her as much as she needed him. Lecalf returned with fresh calf. He should have been off duty, according to the roster. You're too busy to do routine administration, sir, he said. Are you sure I can't take it off your hands? I'm sure, said Jason. Procurement and I need to get a few things straight between us. Lecalf grinned. You show him, sir. Something told Jason that it was more important to show him than he could ever imagine. And that voice, he listened to it. The Skywalker's Apartment, Coruscant Luke looked at his hands, right, then left. One was prosthetic, and one was flesh, and had been touched by someone he was beginning to think of as his nemesis. Lumia In the middle of a battle, he'd had the chance to kill her, and they'd ended up touching hands in a gesture that between normal people might have been considered reconciliation. I said I didn't want to kill her. Luke Skywalker had never wanted to kill anyone. Sometimes it happened, though. He stood up and took the Shoto out of his belt, the short lightsaber that he felt he needed to deal with Lumia and her light whip. What's happening? What does she want? She'd never been one to play mind games like Verger. She was a soldier, a pilot, an intelligence agent, a fighter. He'd yet to put the pieces together, but she was connected to Jason's slide into darkness in some way. Luke made a few idle practice passes with the Shoto and tried to visualize what might happen if he ran into Lumia again. Then he wondered what he'd have done at nineteen, and he knew he wouldn't have thought about it too much. He wanted things to be that clear again. The doors to the apartment opened, and he heard Mara and Ben talking. Relief flooded him. He laid the Shoto on the table, and every rehearsed line of warning and disapproval vanished, replaced by a simple need to grab his only son and crush him in a hug. Ben stood rooted to the spot and submitted to it. Mara gave Luke a warning with a raised eyebrow, but he wasn't planning to scold Ben. I'm glad you're safe, Luke said. But if anything I did made you go off like that, we need to talk about it. Ben looked at Mara as if seeking a cue to explain. I was working. I was on a mission, that's all. Jason, you liar. You said he resented the fact that I stopped him being your apprentice. Only Jason would, could send him on a mission. Luke considered casually asking Ben who'd sent him, but he knew anyway, and he didn't want to descend to tricking his own son into giving him information or putting him on the spot about Jason. He didn't need any more proof that his nephew wasn't going to turn back to the light without some substantial help. It was help that Han and Leia couldn't give. It was beyond the Jedi Council, too. This was family trouble. 
he'd sort it out, with or without Mara. Comlink silence? he asked. Yes, Dad. Sorry. Ben might have been surprised by the hug, but he hadn't recoiled either. I can't discuss it. You understand, don't you? Of course I do, son. And I bet I know who told you not to. I really hoped you weren't going to stay in the GAG. I'm good at that kind of work. I know. I can't ever be a good little Academy Jedi now, Dad. I have to see this through. We've had this argument before, haven't we? Ben's tone was regretful, not a whiny teenager's protest about his parents' unfairness. It was sobering to see him growing up so fast. Growing up? No. Aging. There's a war going on. And once you've served, you know you can't walk away from it and sit it out while your... while your friends risk their lives. Luke... Mara's tone was reproachful, with that slightly nasal edge that said she wanted Luke to stop. Is this really the time for all that? He ignored her. I understand, Ben. I do. But the G.A.G. isn't the place you should be. Isn't it? It's not the way the government should deal with dissent. Then that's why I should stay in, Ben said quietly. If it's a bad organization, then it needs good people to stay in it and change it from the inside, and not abandon it to the bad guys. And if it's a good organization, then all you're really upset about is my safety and I can handle that better than you think. You wanted me to be a Jedi. I'm being a Jedi. Ben's logic and moral reasoning were impeccable. You have a point. So am I a good person, Dad? Or do you think I've gone bad, like you think the G.A.G. has? It was a question Luke had never wanted to consider. What was a bad person? Most people who did evil things were neither good nor bad, just fallible mortals. The only truly irredeemable being he'd ever known was Palpatine. And presumably even Palpatine had once been a little boy, never dreaming he would be responsible for the deaths of billions and savoring his power. Luke realized he wasn't sure he knew what a good person was when he saw one, or at which point they turned bad. He was painfully aware of Mara's gaze boring into him, green and icy like a river frozen in its flood. You're a good person, Ben. Is he doing anything I didn't? You think about what you do. Thanks, and I'm not leaving the G.A.G., Dad. You'll have to make me, either physically or through the courts, and none of us wants that. Leave me where I can do some good. Fights could be had without raised voices or angry words. Ben had fought and given his parents an ultimatum. Luke knew he would have to tackle this another way. And blast it, Ben was actually right. The G.A.G. couldn't be abandoned to the bully boys. Just look out for Lumia, Luke said. You told him, Mara? I told him. So are you going to stay for something to eat, son? he asked, feeling Mara's gaze thaw a little. I'd like that, said Ben, fourteen going on forty. It was hard to have a family conversation over a meal without mentioning the war. Ben wanted to know how Han and Leia were doing. Mara shunted vegetables around her plate as if trying to sweep them under a carpet. Things aren't too good between Jason and your aunt and uncle at the moment, sweetheart, she said, but whatever he tells you, they still care about him and want him to be okay. It's not personal, Ben said. Hey, I tried to arrest Uncle Han because it was my job. I didn't mean him any harm. Luke thought about Jason's haste to abandon his parents during the attack on the resort satellite. He couldn't see Ben doing the same thing. If he could, he didn't want to see it. Dad, 
Was the Empire really a reign of terror? Just a bit. I know you and Uncle Han and Aunt Leia had a rough time of it, but what about ordinary people? Mara chewed with slow deliberation, her gaze in slight defocus on a point in the mid-distance. You might want to ask Alderaan. No, wait. It's gone, isn't it? Oops. That's what happened to ordinary people, and I know better than most. Because you did some of it. Luke faced up to the fact that he couldn't expect Ben to believe a word either of them said to him. They'd both done things that they were telling him he couldn't do now. But most people didn't really notice, did they? Ben seemed to be fixed on course. Their lives went on as before. Maybe a few people who were political got a midnight visit from a few stormies, but most folks got on with their lives. Right? Right, Mara conceded. But living in fear isn't living at all. It's better than dead. You think the Empire was okay, Ben? Luke asked. I don't know. It just seems that a handful of people can think they have the duty, the right, to change things for everybody else. It's a big decision, rebellion, isn't it? But most decisions that affect trillions of beings get made by a few people. Luke and Mara looked at each other discreetly, and then at Ben. He'd acquired political curiosity somewhere along the line. Whatever mission Jason had sent him on, and he had, Luke was certain, it had made the boy think. Or maybe Luke was just losing touch with the fact that his kid was a young man now, and changing fast. When he left, though, Mara still helped him on with his jacket. Luke almost expected her to ask him if he was brushing his teeth every day, but being Mara, she did her maternal fretting in more pragmatic ways and pressed a matte gray object into Ben's hand. Humor me, she said, and kissed his forehead. Carry this. You never know. Ben stared into his palm. Wow! That, she said, was the best vibroblade the Empire could buy. It saved me more than once. A lightsaber is great, but a lightsaber and a vibroblade is even better. Plus a blaster, Ben said. He grinned. That's better still. The triple whammy. That's my boy. After Ben had left, Mara cleared the plates. When did we produce a communally-minded political analyst? Too many Gorog buddies, maybe. Does that look like an out-of-control, screwed-up boy to you? No, Luke said. But it's not Jason's influence that's making a man of him, even if he's the only one who seems to be able to handle Ben. Luke, we still have to do something. Oh, now we have to do something? What happened to leave him with Jason? He's good for the boy. Luke almost had to bite his lip to avoid saying that he'd told her so, which he'd always thought was the mark of someone who wasn't looking for a solution to the problem, just points to score. Besides, he doesn't seem to be getting corrupted by what's happening. Maybe he is that good man on the inside. Maybe you were right to make me let our kid join the secret police. I meant about Lumia. Mara had a way of bracing her shoulders that said she knew she'd made a big mistake, but he didn't have to rub her nose in it. Okay, I've changed my mind. Jason's gone bad. My fault we've wasted a few months placating Ben. Satisfied? Now what about the root cause of this? We haven't picked up her trail again. And then what happens when we do? Mara smacked the plates down on the counter so hard they rattled. What are you going to do? Hold her hand again? He should never have told her that Lumia had offered him her hand when they were fighting. It was eating away at her. Because the poor old girl doesn't mean any harm. Lumia? Queen of the Stanging Sith? 
There really was no ill intent in her. Mara rolled her eyes. Of course there wasn't. She doesn't want to kill you. She wants to kill our son. She grabbed Luke's face in both hands and made him look into her eyes. Luke, you could have killed her. Cut her in two, finished the job. But you didn't. Luke felt inexplicably ashamed. I couldn't. I know. We come from different schools of justice, don't we? Sweetheart, she's not your father, Luke. There's nothing good left in her to redeem. She's a threat that needs to be taken out, and that's what I'm trained to do, and you're not. Forget this take-her-alive-if-possible garbage. The only way anyone's taking her is dead. Luke had had a feeling Mara might say that. He knew when she was building up to something. She might have thought she could keep things from him, but he knew her well enough by now to see the cogs grinding and the plan forming. He'd missed his chance with Lumia. He wouldn't get another. You're telling me you're going after her. You might tag along if you could be trusted not to go soft on her. Mara let him go and looked embarrassed. Her cheeks were flushed. You can have Alima. She needs a serious attitude readjustment with a lightsaber, too. It's not as if we haven't got enough kill-crazy stalkers to go around. No matter what happened, Luke knew he didn't have that assassin's ability to kill someone who wasn't trying to kill him right there and then. If he had... So Ben wasn't the only one navigating a moral maze. Luke had been doing it for decades. But the maze was only acquiring more twists and turns each year. Let's see how much Jason perks up with Lumia gone, he said. Wait, did I just bless an assassination? And with Alima out of the way, then Leia and Han can come back into the fold, and we can face this war as a family again. Mara patted his cheek with a regretful smile and set a droid on cleaning the dishes. She spent the rest of the afternoon assembling and checking an array of weapons that definitely didn't come from a civilized age. I never knew you had one of those, he said, pointing to a blaster that had the wide-mouthed muzzle of a grenade launcher. How are you planning to use it? With a flechette cartridge. Let's see her try a light whip on that. Do you want to take my shoto? You offering? Good luck token, maybe? Under the rib cage token, more like? Unless that's all Durasteel, too. This was his wife. Sometimes he caught a glimpse of the woman she once had been, and she was a stranger for a second or two. How are you going to track her? She hides very well. I can hunt very well. Mara took the shoto hilt and spun it like a blade. A little bait, a little investigation, and a little force help. She ignited the energy beam. Plus, if Alima is trailing after her, as seems to be the case, then one of them is going to slip up and show herself. Lumia doesn't slip up. Well, she's not running the galaxy right now, so I guess she does sometimes. Mara spun the shoto in the air and caught it by the hilt as it fell. And she keeps showing up lately, so I'll be ready. Just keep me informed where you are, okay? You'll know. Mara gave him her best I-know-what-I'm-doing grin. And who better to go after a former emperor's hand than another one? You did that before... And that was before I had a son to worry about. The grin faded. I'm much more dangerous now I have a cub to protect. Luke had no doubt about that. But it was the first time in his life that he regretted not killing someone when he'd had the chance. Chapter 4 To Chief of Defense Logistics from Supreme Commander, Galactic Alliance Defense Force, CC, Chief of State, 
OCGAG, Head of Defense Procurement. Re. Fleet Supply and Procurement Concerns. The shortfall in supplies in theater and the failure of equipment to meet standards are intolerable. You are to give Colonel Solo, OCGAG, every cooperation in resolving this situation as rapidly as possible. This is to be your top priority, and Colonel Solo is authorized to use any means necessary to achieve it. Admiral Cha Niafel, SCGADF. Defense Procurement and Supply Agency, Coruscant. Are you sure? Jason had no reason to disbelieve a legal analyst droid. Metal lawyers were even more meticulous than flesh-and-blood ones. HM3 clunked along beside him as they ambled up the apparently interminable corridor to the offices of the head of procurement, explaining the hurriedly assembled data as they went. Jason believed in understanding the enemy, and that meant grinding through the tedium of small print. He was set on taking a lightsaber to a planet-sized ball of red tape. Yes, sir, this is routine. HM3 reminded him a little of C-3PO, humanoid in shape, with a necessarily pedantic personality. But he was a sober dark gray, and had a reassuring air of solid professional authority. A piece of legislation that's overdue for reform. Would you like the full explanation, or a simplified lay being's version? Consider me as lay as they come. As the legislation stands, it takes the agreement of the Defense Council to change the regulations on procurement. It's designed to stop civil servants from bending the rules to line their pockets, or to stop anyone from commissioning an entire army and its accompanying fleet and weapons without the Senate's knowledge, which I do believe happened not so long ago. You might want to look back at the final years of the Republic, sir. Jason mulled that over, and tried to strip it down to basics. So senators have to vote on what flimsy to purchase and what flavored dry rations to serve to the troops. Monumental waste of time and expense, if you ask me. I admit it involves top-level decision-makers in very low-level decisions, sir, but it's the law. Every time you want to change something about supplies or any other minor administrative issue— you need Chief Omis or Admiral Niafel or someone else equally senior to rubber stamp it. It's the same for other departments, health, education, all of them. HM3 seemed apologetic. Jason had little patience with people who found comfort in impenetrable rules and ritual. He wanted things done. I don't want to take every complaint about hydro spanners and fuel inductors through committees. How did I ever become the procurement go-to guy? Is Neofel sidelining me? Never mind. I'll learn a lot. Is there a way around this? Actually, there is. Go on. It's a simple matter of giving appropriate officers of the GA, in the most general sense, the power to change regulations, to remove the requirement for every cough and spit to be dealt with by senators, how do we do that? By removing the requirement for approval by Defense Council members. Shall I draft an amendment, sir? How does that work? I draft a request for a change in the existing law to relieve regulatory burdens, so that order-making powers can be devolved to appropriate persons, such as senior military officers and ministers of state, without the need to refer the issue to committees, councils, or even the full Senate. H.M. 3 shuddered. It was a very human touch. Give them something to debate, and the more trivial it is, the more hours they'll spend on it, because they can grasp the small concepts better, you see. Yes. But what happens to the amendment, and how long is that going to take? If I table it today, then it goes before the Weekly Policy and Resources Council in two days' time, and, as an appropriate person who already has the Chief of State's sanction, you can start changing what you need the next day. Jason clasped his hands behind his back 
and thought about it. This was making a new law to allow him to change laws. Bizarre. I wonder how much the Defense Department spends on carpeting, HM3 said peevishly, scanning the floor. Droids preferred smooth surfaces. Here's one area where they could economize. As he walked, Jason was calculating how many simple decisions were mired in approvals. But he had the sensation of someone trying to get his attention. It was wholly in his head. He wondered if it was the voice again, and then realized it was his common sense screaming to be heard. You're changing laws about changing laws. Think about that. Jason only had a vague idea about what use he might make of that beyond getting supplies moving. But it struck him as a promising area to address. What would I be limited to? He asked. Well, there has to be a failsafe in the wording, or you'll never get PNR to agree to it. But if I were to cap the scope of this, say that the existing budget can't be exceeded, then that would satisfy them. Legislation was terminally boring. No, it should have been. But something in it was forming a hard ball of an idea in Jason's mind. Would it be possible to word it so that if I come across any more stupid red tape in the process, I can change that too, even if I don't know where I'm likely to find it? I don't want some jobs worth holding up vital supplies because I didn't specify the right subsection of some obscure regulation. That would make it somewhat open-ended. But it's just administration. It's not the Constitution or a common charter. HM3 ground his gears quietly. I'll word it generically, so that you can change any administrative procedure you need to. The other failsafe is that only authorized individuals can make use of this, and that can be limited to whomever the Chief of State decides, so there'll be no spending sprees on secret armies, and only a few very visible, accountable people can make use of it. That will reassure the PNR members. HM3 went silent for a moment consulting his agenda link. I do believe the day after tomorrow is a very, very busy day for PNR, sir. I think the amendment will get through rather more quickly than usual. It was a good day to bury the legislative and regulations statute amendment. Jason smiled. You'll have to tell me more about how this fits in with the emergency measures legislation that Chief Omis already enacted. Full explanation, or the lay being's executive summary, please. The three of you can do anything you need to for the duration of the war. With Admiral Neofel, you are effectively a triumvirate. I have yet to hear Senator Gavli Gassil take note of that, despite his position as head of the Security Council. The Defense Council is simply nodding everything through, when it actually meets, of course. The thought took Jason aback. He had his own plans for upending the galaxy, but they were large-scale, strategic, and focused on order, justice, and the benign application of military might. The petty minutiae of bureaucracy had never crossed his mind as a weapon in the battle for order. He'd spent five years learning the most arcane force techniques in the galaxy, but, again... He didn't have to use a single force skill to gain power this time. It was simply a matter of using psychology to manipulate people around him. This is what makes Jedi weaker and lazier. They instantly resort to force techniques, without thinking. HM3 didn't have to remind him to look at the fall of the Republic— in his desire to understand the environment that had turned his grandfather from Anakin Skywalker into Darth Vader, he'd examined that final decade. Palpatine seemed to have grabbed most of his power by brilliant manipulation 
and understanding of people's weaknesses, not simply by channeling the power of the dark side. Jason and the droid reached the mighty carved doors of the procurement center. They were almost as fine as the doors to Chief Omis's office. No, they were actually more opulent. Jason turned to his infallible legal advisor. Do you think it's wrong that we're effectively a triumvirate, H.M.? Jason asked. Undemocratic? I'm not programmed for right and wrong, sir. H.M. 3 sounded a little disappointed, as if Jason hadn't fully understood the complexity of his art. I can tell you only what's legal and illegal, because they have definitions. Right has no parameters. Justice doesn't either, nor good. Flesh has to make those decisions. Flesh makes a different decision on those every day, my friend. Jason put his hand on the controls, and the splendid relief of an ancient Coruscanti cityscape split into two to admit him into the procurement offices. I can change a law to let me change laws. But can I use the law that lets me change laws to change that law itself? He thought for a moment that he was enjoying a few childish seconds of playing at circular logic. Then it struck him he'd just had an insight of significant proportions. Colonel Solo, said the head of the procurement agency. Tav Vello was an edgy human male who looked in need of a good meal. I've tasked one of my assistants to investigate the shortages. It might simply be a case of delays in the process. Is there anyone ahead of the fleet or the GAG in this line? Jason asked. Our suppliers do have other clients. I hope they're on our side. We source our equipment from allies. Are your people moving as fast as they can? Of course they are, Colonel Solo. We're also looking for ways to streamline the process. Jason smiled. So am I. He looked around the office. It wasn't gold-plated, but he was expecting to see some evidence of lack of frugality. Now about the cannon service packs. The parts that need swapping out frequently. I ask for an explanation of why there have been so many misfires. Vello consulted his datapad with the air of a man with a very good defense, or at least a robust excuse. We ran random sampling on those packs yesterday for all the main cannon specs, and the service packs we buy are adequate. But we don't want adequate. We want best. We do have budget constraints, sir. Is this decision made by a department? There's a senior purchasing officer, yes. Jason knew there was only one way to focus people who didn't quite understand what adequate meant in the field. He turned to the droid. H. Under the current powers, is there a mechanism by which I can co-opt civilian staff to carry out research? H.M. 3 hummed on the threshold of Jason's normal hearing for a few seconds. Yes, sir. Is there any restriction on location and conditions? No, sir. That's what I like to hear. Jason was starting to enjoy the rich scope for inventiveness that regulations gave him. They didn't limit his options at all. They created new ones. He started to see the joy of the letter of the law. I'd like to meet the chief purchasing officer who signed off on the cannon packs. Vello looked slightly bemused. I take responsibility for what my staff do, sir. That's very commendable. But I really want to understand the process. And that means getting to know the people. Understanding of the other person's situation is the key to this, I think. Vello, still looking bewildered, went to summon the purchasing officer via his desk comm. No, that's quite all right, Jason said. I'll go to his office. 
HM3 made an inscrutable clicking sound as the three of them took the turbo lift to the purchasing floor. They stepped out of the cab into an open-plan office that could have accommodated wandering herds without trouble. Good. Jason wanted an audience. Hearts and minds. Let me introduce you to Beerus Tay Goff, said Velo. He's our senior purchasing officer for engineering support. Tay Goff was visibly nervous, and his staff and co-workers, mainly humans, but Nimbanese, Gossams, and Cymerthian too, feigned work while watching discreetly. Jason could feel the pervading anxiety throughout the floor. Goff offered a damp hand for shaking, and Jason turned on his full charm. Tay Goff had a lot of data about why the cannon pack was fit for the job. It was a very good price, he told Jason. But we have misfires and various problems to iron out, said Jason. He checked that everyone could hear him, judging their attention by the close-range ripples in the force and their body language. I'd really like your help on this. I'm asking you to do some evaluation of the cannon pack. Of course, Colonel Solo. Anything I can do to help? H.M. 3 leaned in close and whispered to Jason. Article 5, subsection C-27. I'm glad to hear that. Jason smiled at the purchasing officer. That's why. Under Article 5, subsection C-27 of the Emergency Measures Act, I'm assigning you to the front-line ship that's had the most cannon misfires in the fleet, because there's no better place to gather facts than from the people who have to use this kit, and in the place where they have to use it. Jason glanced around. Even with force-enhanced hearing, he could detect very little breathing and no swallowing. I'm more than happy to extend this field deployment to anyone who wants to better understand the end-user's experience of procurement. Just say the word. We're always happy to accommodate you. In fact, I can guarantee you a ringside seat for the action. Jason smiled with all the diplomatic sweetness he'd learned from his mother and looked around the room knowing he wouldn't be mown down by volunteers. Tay Goff looked stricken. Jason felt he'd focused everyone on the significance of their job more effectively, and that they now knew what would happen if they thought adequate was good enough. If you think it's good enough, then it's good enough for you to use personally, on the front line. H.M. 3 followed Jason out of the building, and they took an air taxi back to the G.A.G. headquarters. It took a little while, because the traffic was heavier than usual, and by the time Jason got back to his office, the arrangements to transfer one civilian, Tay Goff, Beerus J., to the ocean, were already being discussed by G.A.G. personnel. Corporal LeCauf and two of the other 967 commando troopers greeted him like a hero in the briefing room. "'That was a good, clean thing you did there, sir,' said one trooper, grinning. "'My rifle parts feel more efficient already.' Lecauf gave him a thumbs up. "'Your grandfather would have done the same, sir. Nice move.' In these barracks, that was an honest compliment, and not a warning of the temptations of the dark side. Jason preferred the judgment of ordinary soldiers— to the arcane philosophical debate of the Jedi Council. It's all going to change. No more wars flaring up in each generation. No more career politicians wringing what they can out of the system. No more talk of freedom that just means a handful can do as they please while the rest struggle for survival. No wonder the old guard feared the Sith, if that was what they threatened, the end of chaos that served only the few. Jason returned the thumbs up to Lecauf. You ain't seen nothing yet.
HM3 plucked out a datapad. I'll keep you apprised of the progress of the amendment, Colonel Solo. Is that all for today? I may consult you again. You make all this easier to understand. That's my job. Jason just wanted to check. He had the germ of an idea. Funny thing, laws and regulations, aren't they? That amendment gives me, and others, of course, the ability to change the amended law itself, doesn't it? It's quite circular. HM3 didn't care about right and wrong, just legal and illegal. If Jason had designs on manipulating the amendment for uses beyond speeding up the dispatch of medical supplies, then the droid didn't regard it as part of his remit. Yes, HM3 said. It is. Jason tackled the pile of intelligence reports that had stacked up on his desk with renewed enthusiasm. The air was alive with imminence of things about to happen. The endless thoughts of whom he would have to kill to achieve his sacrifice had gone away for a while, but they'd be back. In the meantime, he had a new tool with which to effect change. I can change the law that lets me change laws. If I use that wisely, I can bypass the Senate when I need to. The power of simple human reason was as effective as the Force some days. Tekshar Falls Casino, Kuat City, Kuat What happened to the clones? Myrta asked. Kuat City stank of credits. Fett had never been able to understand how an industrial society, whose wealth was built on heavy engineering, still had an ancient aristocracy. Funny place. Anachronistic. Ahead of him, the smarter part of Kuat City glittered. Elegant towers and spires that seemed a refined echo of the industrial skyline of cranes in the orbital shipyards. He knew Kuat well. He'd once saved its shipyards from an attempt to destroy them. He hoped the place was going to show him some gratitude. Cannon fodder, he said, answering Myrta at last. He brought the speeder bike to a halt by an arcade of smart shops. They died. Not the one I saw. He said some left the army. The only way out, said Fett, was death or desertion. None of them retired? Depends what you mean by retired. I heard a few ended up in care homes run by well-meaning peace campaigners, though. Myrta seemed to be working out what retire meant for men who were trained to kill, who'd been kept apart from regular society, and who had an artificially shortened lifespan. The slight jut of her chin, a sure sign she was annoyed, communicated itself through the helmet. There was only so much she could hide. Did you ever hunt deserters? No. He'd seen plenty, though. Didn't pay enough. Did you care about them, Babuir? Okay. She finds comfort in playing Mondo. But I'll never get used to that name. Not really. They were your brothers. No, they weren't. He motioned her to get off the speeder. Blood isn't everything. You know that's the Mondo way. But I bet you'll be shooting that clone a different line, she said. How else are you going to get him to help you? Beat it out of him? He looks as tough as you are. Maybe I'll just ask nicely, said Fett. Right now I need to walk into the Tekshar and have a chat with Freg. That might be a little inconvenient for him. The Tekshar Falls was one of those feats of architectural near-impossibility at which the Kuwati excelled. Other establishments in the galaxy had impressive water features, but the Tekshar was a waterfall, 
a raging, hammering torrent from a river diverted at vast expense into the entertainment center of the city. It provided its own hydroelectric power, which was just as well given the ferocious array of lights that pierced the curtains of water. The casino was set within the waterfall itself, part construction, part natural stone, with turrets jutting through the water like tree fungi. To get to the entrance, gamblers had to walk through water plummeting five hundred meters. Pity, I've just had my hair done, Myrta said, solidly encased in armor from head to toe. Is this how they stop the riffraff from coming in? We are the riffraff, said Fett, and we're going in. He paused to hack into the Kuat police database from his HUD system. They wouldn't mind. He was just contributing to law and order around here. Images of scumbags, petty villains, and serious bad boys and girls scrolled down the display inside his helmet. He waited, and shortly Freg L. appeared. For gangland vermin, Freg looked remarkably respectable fresh-faced and framed with gold curls that would have made a mother weep. Fett suspected that if Frag still had a mother, he'd have sold her to a hut by now. "'So you're just going to stroll in?' said Myrta. "'I only want to ask him a question.' "'It's never that easy, is it?' "'We'll see.' Fett strode down the tree-lined boulevard that led to the foot of the falls, and forked around it. Only the stupidly wealthy had the time to gamble this early. It said a lot for Frag's business acumen. There's no reason for him to get upset. Just check that your jetpack's primed. We might be leaving rapidly, then, Myrta said, keeping up with him without apparent effort, a reminder that he was slowing down. Will they make a fuss about letting us in dressed like this? It's all about making an entrance. Fett wiped the windborne spray from his visor. People usually find my dress acceptable. Sooner or later. He walked straight across the bridge at the wall of roaring water and churning white foam. The falls parted like a curtain to create a wide portal. Behind the casino was a vividly lit and completely dry haven. Very impressive, said Myrta. It was a nice trick, played by automated force fields triggered by a motion sensor. But it was, as he often thought, all about presentation. A little theater. It always helped. Keep up, he said. The lobby of the casino was a study in opulence, as if someone had taken a bet on how many credits they could spend on each square meter. It was everything Fett didn't care for. Flocked wall coverings, gilding, mirrors, and low-level lighting. All the trappings of illusion, and hard to clean, too. The lobby parted into two sections, one leading to the restaurant and the other to the gaming tables. Fett consulted his investment portfolio via his HUD. He noted Tiruwal Construction Holdings. Let's not do too much damage, he said. I think I have shares in this place. There was a steward at the front desk and a few very large assistants, humans, Trandoshans, and Gran, walking in slow, considered circles around the thick purple carpet that dragged at Fett's boots like tar. He'd never seen a Trandoshan in a formal suit before, and wondered what poor old Bosk would have made of that, it was also unusual to see a gran in this line of work. It was clear none of them was there to help diners make informed choices from the wine list. The steward was scanning a screen in his desk, probably matching Fett's image to the database of guests he needed to recognize for one reason or another. Judging by his sudden flinch, he'd found Fett. Do you have proof of identity, sir? Fett touched his blaster. This used to do nicely. The steward, human, male, utterly ugly, 
was doing a very good job of not wetting his pants. Fat had to hand it to him. Ah, uh, haven't seen you here in a long time, sir. I've come to visit someone. Fett indicated Myrta with a thumb gesture. With my associate. Will that seeing require repairs afterward? Fett flicked a very large denomination credit chip onto the desk. Keep the change in case it does. Where's Frag? Credits talked. Blasters talked, too, but credits could whisper menacingly every bit as well. He's hosting a private sabac game in his suite on the thirtieth floor. Sir? The steward smiled valiantly and snapped his fingers at the hired help. I'll let him know you're on the way up. The Natalie attired Trandoshan rushed to his summons, looking like he'd picked the wrong outfit for a costume party. Take the, er, uh, President of Mandalore up to Master Frigg's suite. All drinks on the house. So they didn't quite grasp what being Mandalore meant. That was okay, because Fett didn't either. Myrta stifled laughter, but only Fett heard it. He switched to the helmet comlink with a blink. So do you have shares here, Babuir? she said. Depending on how many guests Frag's got, I might need your help. Try not to kill them unless they ask for it. Yes, sir, Mr. President. I liked you better without a sense of humor. He didn't dislike Myrta. She'd tried to kill him, but that was a couple of months ago, and things had moved on. She worked hard, and she wasn't mired in fluffy trivia like fashion and holovids. She was strong in every sense. Bevin, and Fett listened to Bevin, said she was a real Mondoad, a solid Mandalorian woman, because she could shoot straight, cook passably well, and had the shoulders of an armor smith. Mondoade valued the frontier kind of female, not decorative trophies who couldn't even dig a defensive entrenchment. She's just like Sintas. Not as pretty, but she's so much like her. He hadn't known Aelin long enough to tell if Myrta took after her mother. Sin. I used to call her Sin, and she called me Bo. Did Myrta have a nickname? What had Sintas told Aelin about him? And what had Aelin told Myrta to breed such hatred toward him? Fett pulled his attention back to the present and followed the Trandoshan, aware of a full three-hundred-sixty-degree vista around him, the dulled pain in his guts and the fact that the closer he got to death, the more he thought about people who hadn't been on his mind in a long, long time. The turbo-lift doors opened onto a floor of the same thick purple carpet as the lobby, with small salons leading off it. Gaming tables rattled, clicked, and flashed, with lives ruined and fortunes lost. Even through his helmet's filter, he could smell the cloying amalgam of a hundred different perfumes distilled from plants facing extinction and parts of animals he didn't even want to think about. The Trandoshan led them along a corridor to an imposing set of gilded doors, then beat a lumbering retreat. The doors parted, and Fett found himself visor to nose with a Hamadryas who didn't seem to know how to blink. Behind him, a group of six splendidly dressed gamblers, three human males, two females, and a weekwe, sat around a gilt-framed sabac table with Frag. There were two more heavies standing by the kitchen doors, probably on drinks patrol. Master Fat, said Frag, not looking up from the table. How good to meet you. Frag had a great hand. Fett could see it embedded in the table's display as he loomed over him. It was a pity to interrupt. His guests were trying to concentrate on the sabac game, 
but it was hard to give the cards full attention when there were two bounty hunters paying an unexpected visit. They all found reasons to go to the kitchen to top up their drinks, while the Hamadryas watched silently, one hand now on his holster. "'Got a few questions for you,' Fett said. "'About your predecessor.' "'Depends on what you want to know.' Frag was as well-spoken as his hair was quaffed. His gangster dad must have sent him to a very exclusive school. But he hadn't been tutored in the subtle art of putting his hand under the table to check his holdout blaster discreetly. Fat hoped he didn't have to shoot the man before he got some answers. I do hope you haven't been sent by Charit's associates to express their displeasure. I'm not going to kill you, Fat said. If I did that, then you wouldn't be able to tell me things. And I want you to tell me things. I'm a curious man. The Hamadryas on the door already had his blaster visible on his belt. But Myrta had him covered. Fett could see from their HUD comlink connection that she was watching him, the helmet sensors responding to her eye movements. Frag shrugged. What exactly do you want me to tell you? The Mandalorian who killed Jarrett. I need to find him. Frag had the kind of smile that spread like a crack in ice. I've been asked some subtle questions, but that's a good one. I assure you I didn't order Jarrett's death. I don't care if you sent a wreath and took care of his widow. Do you know where I can find the man who killed him? Shall we step outside onto the balcony? Frag gestured and picked up his drink. It's a sensitive matter to discuss in front of my guests. Suit yourself, said Fett, and decided instantly where he was prepared to be maneuvered. Step outside. Right. Myrta stood guard at the open doors but the Hamadryas bodyguard tried to move her out of the way. He made the mistake of putting his hand on her back, and a little too low at that. She simply raised her clenched fist to shoulder height and ejected her gauntlet vibrablade. Touch me again, Chakar, and I'll ram this into your carotid artery. I haven't got one. Then I'll have to keep stabbing you, until I find somewhere else that bleeds copiously. Frag intervened. Circu, let's not upset the lady, shall we? Let her wait wherever she wishes. Frag was making a lot of mistakes tonight for a crime boss. It was just as well Fett always assumed the worst. Frag might have thought that a balcony reduced Fett's options— but it didn't represent much of a problem for a man with a jetpack. Frag didn't have one. He also lacked a fiber cord line. This wouldn't take long. Amateurs. Fed had to fight an urge to explain to Frag how to do it right. Out on the balcony, Kuat City's lights shimmered through a veil of rushing water in the dusk. An overhang diverted the water a couple of meters from the face of the building. Fett leaned one hand on the rail, feigning casual disinterest, but actually testing the strength of the metal. He cast an eye over Frag to estimate his weight. Let me repeat that simple question. Tell me anything you know about the Mandalorian who whacked your predecessor. I had nothing to do with it. Cherit upset a lot of folks. Occupational hazard. Question still stands. I'll bet your organization was keen to find out, too. We didn't know who he was. All we knew was that he had a grudge about a certain Twi'lek clan. We do business with Twi'leks in the entertainment industry. I'll bet. Frag meant Twi'lek girls. What kind of grudge? 
He didn't think we were treating them properly. We lost a couple of very popular entertainers thanks to him. Frigg was lying scum, and the clone in Mandalorian armor was settling a score for some Twi'lax, but he wasn't a bounty hunter. Another link, then. Personal, not professional. Time. He didn't have time for this. Seen him since? No. Want to tell me who the Twi'lex were? Why do you want this man so badly? It has to be something big for you to be hunting him. Frigg examined his manicured nails. Or perhaps some of my associates regret Cherit's passing, so they've hired you to come after me? Not for hire right now. Fett could never understand why they didn't listen. They never heard what he said. He played it straight, and they always looked for a second meaning. I want the Mondo in one piece. I need him to do something for me. Frigg had missed his chance. Fett switched to the helmet comlink and got Myrta's attention, which was fixed on him and the Hamadryas anyway. I'm just going to help our friend remember a few things. Useful stuff, fiber cord. Fett shot out the line in a loop from his backpack and whipped it around Frigg, jammed the grappling hook between the bars, and shoved him over the railing. It took two seconds. Frigg screamed, clinging to the top rail, but a good hard whack on the knuckles with the butt of the blaster made the scumbag let go. Frigg plummeted, and Fett braced for the inevitable thump into the rail when the rope ran out. It nearly winded him. Frigg bounced and twisted in the line's strangling grip, still shrieking. Fett kept a few meters of line secured in reserve in the winch assembly. Myrta was taking good care of the Hamadryas. She'd half-closed the transparasteel doors on him, but the bodyguard wedged his body in the gap and tried to get a blaster shot through the opening. His arm was trapped. Fett watched, impressed, as Myrta headbutted the guard a second time, shoved the vibroblade into his thigh, and forced him, shrieking in pain, nice touch, back through the doors so that they crashed shut. Then she fired a few rounds into the controls. Make it quick, Babuir. She flexed her shoulders as if easing torn neck muscles. The doors might be blaster-proof, but they'll get them open sooner or later. Fett peered over the side. Frag was twisting helplessly like a devi hooked on a fishing line, making gasping sounds. The line was tight around his waist and chest. He was dangling fifteen meters below the rail. Don't struggle, and think calm thoughts, Fett called. It helps you remember, and it'll stop you from slipping out of the loop. You're crazy. I'll have your throat cut for this. You're on the end of a line. I'm on solid ground. Think about it. You're a dead man. Perceptive to the last. Give me names, vermin. I tell you, I didn't pay the Mondo. I'm glad he whacked Cherit, but I never paid him to do it. Try again. Frigg's voice was almost drowned out by the roar of the waterfall behind him. The Twi'lex were from some family called Hymar. Good start. Fett paid out another meter of line with a jolt. Frigg shrieked as he slipped farther toward the permacrete stone and raging water a hundred meters below. Is that helping? Memory often needs a trigger. Hymar. Any Mondo who pitched in hard to play the hero for a couple of dancers would be known in the Twi'lek community. It didn't happen that often. Nobody else cared what happened to Twi'lek girls. Fett had his lead. He'd have a contact somewhere. And if he didn't, Bevin would. Bevin wouldn't press him to find out why. Anything else you want to get off your chest? I don't know the guy, Fett. 
But I know you're going to regret this. Fett could hear the dull rhythmic thuds of Frag's bodyguards trying to smash the doors apart. If I find you've given me a load of garbage, I'll be back to finish the job. He braced his boot on the bottom rail and began winching in the gangster. Myrta stood next to him with her blaster trained on the doors. You're going soft. Why are you reeling him back in? I want the fiber cord back. It's my favorite ultrafine. When you get him on the balcony, I'll tranquilize him. Then back to slave one. Scenic route. You're lucky we've got jets. I wouldn't have come up here if I hadn't. Fett felt the sweat breaking out and running down his spine. This would have been an easier task a few years ago. And I wouldn't have gone much above thirty floors anyway. Why? Hundred meter line. In case I had to rappel down. Frag's face was two meters away now. He'd stopped yelling and settled for labored breathing. I haven't got a hundred-meter line, Myrta said. Lucky you've got jets, then. He heaved Frag over the rail in a tangled heap, and Myrta delivered a roundhouse punch that laid the man out. If that was her tranquilizer treatment, she was a born medic. Time to go. Myrta shot off at an awkward angle and crashed through the sheet of water ahead of him. There was no force field up here to part the falls. When Fett looked down, he could see speeders crisscrossing the plaza on either side of the boulevard. He needed to land and find the speeder bike. Jets were great for fast exits, but the flame made both of them conspicuous targets in the night sky. The speeder was still where he'd left it, primed with a detonator and hidden in bushes on the edge of a park. Both the painkiller and the adrenaline were wearing off at the same time, and Fett had never been more conscious of the reason for his search. He set off for the landing strip at top speed down freight lanes that had the lightest traffic, noting that Myrta was happily fixing a grenade launcher attachment to her blaster with both hands and gripping the saddle of the speeder with her knees. She looked like she was used to fast getaways. You're doing okay for a dead man, Babuir. Your dad trained you well, too. Most of that I learned from Mama. Well, she did a good job of it. Fett took one hand off the bars and activated Slave One's remote controls. Her drives would be primed. He could drop the speeder into the cargo hold and get off this planet inside a minute. In his HUD display, he was already scanning databases for that Twi'lek family name. This was the one time he felt truly, thrillingly alive, when he was winning, being the best, surviving. Is that it? Is that all I can do? He almost envied the Bevines and Carids of this world, who delighted in simple things like good food and family. But there was a clean, uncomplicated satisfaction in danger. It erased worries and fears and memories. There was only the moment, and surviving it. Fett concentrated on feeling good and ignoring the pain, right up to the time his rear view caught speeder headlights closing fast, and Myrta turned to level her blaster. They must be calling in our course, she said. You think it's Frag's grunts or security? We won't get the police's attention until you fire that blaster. His motion sensors showed two speeders in pursuit, and two coming at them from the right on the crossroads ahead. Another single speeder was approaching from the left. They might have been ordinary citizens, unlucky enough to be on the same route, or they might have been rushing to intercept him. If he timed it right, he could slip between them and give Myrta a clean shot at the speeders behind. He gunned the drive. Fett counted down the seconds. He was almost at the crossroads, but he wasn't going to make it. 
From the right, one shot in front of him, and he raised his arm to give it a burst of flamethrower. But the rider suddenly fell sideways and crashed to the ground without a shot being fired. Two speeders heading the other way soared to avoid it. Fett watched the speeder approaching from the left cut across him without even slowing down. He heard a loud crash, but no badap of a discharging blaster. Had they collided? Had they hit someone who happened to be on the wrong road at the wrong time? Myrta fired a grenade. Gotcha! A ball of flame lit up the night. One down, one to go. Reloading. Can't see the third speeder. Maybe they crashed. We've got a couple of minutes before the police join in, Fett said. Hey, where did he— There was a massive whoop of a white-hot explosion behind them— Fett saw the debris falling hot and red in the rear view of his HUD. Good shot. Not me. Didn't fire. What is this, a crash epidemic? I think we have help. I hate help I didn't ask for. But help it was. So he took the breathing space with grudgingly grateful caution. Maybe their invisible benefactor was saving them for himself. Slave One was standing between two battered freighters, looking nothing special to anyone who didn't know the ship, just an old fire spray idling her drives. Fett grounded the speeder bike and ran for the ship. Who would pick off Frag's morons for him? Generosity like that came with a price. Fett left Myrta to dock the speeder in the hold and climbed up into the cockpit. Come on, girl, what's keeping you? He tapped the console switches, and Slave One wind up to full power, a faint tremor passing through her airframe. It said safe. It said home. It was the most reassuring sound he knew. You've got twenty seconds before I close the cargo hatch. There was no answer. And just as that fact registered, Slave One's entry warning light flashed. There was someone else on board. The systems didn't recognize them. Myrta! Myrta! The internal security cams showed nothing but the speeder. Fett grabbed his blaster and went aft to check. Even through the helmet filter, he could smell a strong, oily stench that he hadn't smelled in years. He couldn't quite place it, but he knew it. The speeder was stowed. The hatch was open. He raised the blaster and wondered whether to just seal the hatch and launch Slave One and hate himself for the rest of his life. What was left of it? Dad wouldn't have left you stranded. He'd have risked anything for you. Fett had abandoned quite a few people over the years. He'd even left Sintas wounded the last time he'd seen her. The very last time. It had seemed the right decision then. And you wonder why your daughter and granddaughter tried to kill you. Fett stood to one side of the hatch. His sensors showed him two shapes on the ramp, one humanoid and one animal whose form wasn't clearly defined. He counted to three and came out, blaster and flamethrower aimed. Myrta, minus helmet, was in the tight headlock of a Mandalorian in gray armor, and a large gold-furred animal had its huge jaws locked around her leg, trailing a curtain of drool. It wasn't attacking. It was frozen, pinning her down, and stinking. And she didn't look scared, just embarrassed. Fett stared down the barrel of a custom verpine rifle aimed one-handed, and understood why he'd heard no blaster fire when the speeder bikes dropped from the air. Verpines were silent. Well, well, said the Mandalorian in gray armor. He really did have a very fine pair of gray leather gloves. It's little Bubica. Last time we met, my brother was shoving your head down the freshers, to teach you some manners. What do you want me for, Nervode? 
Galactic Alliance Guard Briefing Room, GAGHQ, Coruscant. Ben was glad to be back among people he trusted. The sea of black uniforms might have been a sinister sight to some people, but to him they felt like a brotherhood, like family. He was in that rare position of being young enough to be treated like one of the troopers despite his officer status, and he liked that. The sense of camaraderie and the knowledge that everyone watched everyone else's back was both comforting and thrilling. He settled into his seat on the end of a row in the briefing room. A trooper called Almac nudged him. Nice vacation? Glad you could fit us into your busy schedule, sir. Couldn't wait to get back. You didn't miss much, Almac said. Been a bit quieter. I think we've broken the back of the Corellia networks. I always miss the good stuff. A couple of the other troopers in the row in front turned in their seats and joined in. We'll find some excitement for you. Or some filing. Freshers need a good clean. Here's a toothbrush. Ben grinned and lobbed a pellet of flimsy at them. It was good to be part of a team. It was good to have friends. They didn't see him as son of Skywalker, Jedi to be feared. He was just Ben, and they looked out for him, as they always seemed to for young officers they liked. And they never asked him where he'd been. Everything was on a need-to-know basis. But the spate of bombings seemed to be over for the time being. It was just a case of working out who to keep an eye on and round up next. Corellians, Bothans, and now Fondorians. Captain Lon Chevu strode onto the dais at the front of the room, looking as committed as ever. But Ben felt the reluctance and misgivings in him. He could sense it in a few of the other troopers, too, generally the ones who'd been in the CSF. Jason followed Chevu and got instant, undivided attention. Jason could do that. Ben wasn't sure if he envied him or not. It was interesting that he seemed to enjoy being the focus for ordinary beings, but chose to hide himself from force sensitives. It was as if he only wanted to be seen by the mundane world. I have to learn how to do that. Mom says I did it as a little kid, but that was by instinct, like babies swimming. I want to learn how to do it like Jason does. Brief for the next forty-eight hours, ladies and gentlemen, said Jason. We're moving into a different phase. The priority now is to look for professionals, Confederation intelligence agents. Now normally we'd leave that to our colleagues in Alliance Intel. But seeing as we've got all their best operatives... Applause and laughter interrupted him. He paused with a big grin and picked up again. Seeing as we got the pick of the litter, we'll be helping them out. We'll also be providing close protection for Chief Omus and key ministers to relieve CSF and monitoring for them. Results of interrogation suggest we might be looking at more targeted and professional assassination attempts, as in government agents, not just disgruntled amateurs and bounty hunters. A hand was raised at the front. Ben couldn't see who it was. What's monitoring in this context, sir? Jason flashed a hollow image onto the screen behind him. It showed a diagram of the various routes by which GA ministers could be reached, physically or virtually. Offices, home addresses, private clubs, routes to the Senate, comlinks. Like this, he said. Are we allowed to tap Senator's comlinks, sir? asked Chevu. Under the Emergency Measures Act, we are authorized to carry out any surveillance to prevent acts of violence against ministers of state and visiting allies. Chevu's face was unreadable, but Ben felt the sharp unhappiness in him. Now there was a guy who knew how to conceal what he was thinking. Ben wondered if that was a more useful skill than hiding in the force. 
tapping Senator's com links didn't seem to bother anyone else at the briefing. Ben couldn't see the problem either. It made sense for their own protection. Jason tasked squads to their roles, and there was discussion about supplies. Draw up a wish list, Jason said, beaming. I think we've eased the supply situation. Or we will have by the end of this week. There was a ripple of laughter. Did you persuade them to see things your way, sir? Oh, I just made sure the flimsy was in order. There was more laughter and a ripple of applause. For a moment, Ben felt a conspiratorial closeness between Jason and the troopers. It was genuine. Jason wasn't doing his charisma act to persuade people to do what he wanted— although he was very good at that. He enjoyed the company of his troops, and they enjoyed his. There was a sense of shared danger, and that the rest of the world wasn't part of all this. Ben took mental notes about the art of effortless leadership. The briefing broke up. Ben hung back to talk to Jason, getting a few joking comments about his recent absence as the troopers filed out, and giving as good as he got. He felt a sudden pressure at the back of his head, and when he looked around, Jason was watching him from the side of the dais, smiling slightly. "'They like you,' he said. "'That's good for an officer, as long as you're liked for the right reasons.' "'Isn't it important to be respected instead?' "'What's respect, Ben?' Ben pondered the question, hearing a subtle test in it thinking that a person does something right, and that they do it better than you, and so you feel positive toward them. Excellent. That's not the same as being liked, though, is it? Not at all. We can respect those we dislike, Jason said. The way to be liked by your men is this, that they believe that you would never spend their lives cheaply that their welfare comes first, and that you wouldn't ask them to do anything that you wouldn't do yourself, to share their trials and triumphs without being one of them. And they know that's how it has to be, because they know an officer has to make decisions that cost lives, and that's something you can only do if you remain sufficiently separate. Ben hadn't lost a trooper from 967 Commando yet, in fact, they'd had no fatalities or even serious injuries. They led charmed lives as far as the rest of the military were concerned. He had no idea how he'd feel if he had to put them in a position where deaths were inevitable. Jason seemed to read his mind again. Until you can make those decisions, you're not safe to lead. But it's easier if you're prepared to die yourself right? Ben suddenly felt much better about Lumia's attempt on his life. He knew it was her now, piecing together what had happened on Zeost and what Mom had told him. But it was okay. He could look all the 967 in the eye now. Because if you're willing to make the same sacrifice, that's the one thing that matters. Jason leaned close to him. It inspires... It's the ultimate act of honesty with your troops. Ben knew that was how Jason led, and why everyone was so loyal to him. He led from the front, and he loved being in the thick of the fighting. The fact that as a Jedi he had survival advantages they didn't have rarely seemed to cross their minds. I don't know which way I'll jump when the time comes, Ben said. Nobody does but I'll try to do what's right for the majority. Jason's smile was utterly luminous for a moment, but then it faded as if he'd recalled something awful. His force presence vanished for a few seconds and then returned. That was weird, Ben thought. Jason was standing right next to him. So what was he hiding from? Can you teach me to do that? Ben asked. Hide in the force? Jason seemed shaken. Why? Because Lumia is trying to kill me. 
I thought it might come in handy. And for avoiding Mom and Dad sometimes. Yes, it would be handy. Mom says she's got evidence that I killed... that Lumia thinks I killed her daughter. I don't remember a thing about what happened on that asteroid, Jason. But maybe it doesn't matter, because Lumia believes it. And I bet she was behind what happened on Zeost. Jason's face was carefully blank. Ben couldn't tell what he was thinking now, not even from the Force. Yes. Why not? Jason said. His voice was softer, almost hesitant. Don't you worry about Lumia. She's not up to killing you. When can we start? It's very simple. Yeah, Ben said dubiously. No, it is. The principle is simple. It's the practice that's hard. It might take you years to master it. Jason motioned him to sit down on the floor. Come on. Meditation position. Ben sat down cross-legged and closed his eyes automatically, taking deeper and slower breaths until he reached the stage where the world beyond him seemed distant and he was hyper-aware of his own body, even the movement of blood in his veins. Jason's voice seemed to be coming from another time and place. You're contained. The world can't touch you. Yes. Now break the shell. Break the container. Jason's tone was even and soothing. See the world in its component atoms. See yourself as atoms, too. Find the line where you end, and the world begins. Ben visualized the room around him and the air in it. It became a frozen snowfall of varying density. Some particles clustered, some scattered. Then he looked into himself and saw the microscopic unevenness of the surface of his skin and the overlapping plates of keratin in his hair and then beyond that to where he was just like the room around him, a snowstorm of molecules. Some of the room was within him as oxygen and dust, and some of him was in the room as fragments of skin and droplets of water. There was no line. There was no edge that divided Ben Skywalker from the room, or from Coruscant, or from the galaxy. He merged with it all, and it merged with him. There was nothing solid just a warm, drifting sea of molecules, some of which assembled loosely and long enough to be Ben Skywalker. So you can do it. Jason's voice drifted from a long way away. Ben suddenly felt as if he were dissolving and would never be whole again. Panic gripped him. He jerked his eyes open with a massive effort like tearing open a rock with his bare hands, an effort so immense that he found himself gasping for air. Oh, wow! Now, Jason said softly, you see why practice is necessary, but full marks for technique. How does that hide me? You blend with the universe. Think of it as force camouflage. The trick is to become so comfortable with it that you can slip into this state of being dissolved, yet still carry on functioning, fully aware. Ben couldn't even manage another wow. He was absolutely determined to master the technique and at the same time scared by it, because it felt like a seductive, comfortable death. He was afraid he might sink so deeply into it that he'd never get out again. It was as close as he'd ever come to both knowing and feeling what the Force was. He felt he'd never be the same again, or see the world in quite the same way. 
Wow! If only all his force knowledge had manifested itself that fast and that vividly. You need to practice regularly, said Jason. Ben nodded, worried about looking too enthusiastic. It was more than just a useful way to evade his father now. It was worth pursuing in its own right, for the sheer sensation of it. I will, he said. The moment of ecstatic revelation had passed, and he felt oddly chilled. Any orders for me? Or am I just going to be listening to comlinks now? Oh, I have a mission for you. Like the amulet? Maybe he shouldn't have said it, but he felt bad about the whole thing, as if it had been not only a waste of a man's life, but also nowhere near as important as he'd been led to believe. He hated being humored. I can handle the truth, Jason. You'd be surprised. Jason was all serene composure. I've got a job that only you can do, and it's critical. You might not want to accept the mission. If it's an order, it's an order. Better hear it first. Jason reached into his jacket and pulled out a data pad. Read this. It's the original sources of the intelligence I received. So you can judge for yourself. Ben took the data pad and studied the screen. There were transcripts of comlink conversations, and even grainy images of a meeting taken from such an odd angle that it must have been captured by a spy droid in a very awkward location, probably on the top of a cupboard. Men in expensive suits and tunics, sipping calf and talking in hushed tones. A man with well-cut dark hair, younger than Jason. Ben recognized him as Dur Gedgen. That's the Corellian Prime Minister, he said. That's all intel gathered from our contacts inside the Corellian government offices. Read on. There was discussion of driving a wedge between Hapes and the Galactic Alliance. It sounded like the usual political maneuvering that always bored Ben, until he started to read recurring phrases like Queen Mother and seeing the disadvantages of siding with the Alliance. And then there were references to removing obstacles. It all fell into place when he flicked to the next hollow image and saw discussion of appropriate bounty hunters who might be willing to operate in the Hapen Royal House. Ben might have been bored by politics, but he understood better than he imagined, and he knew that he had to if he wanted to survive. This is about Tenel Ka. Correct. Gedgen really did plan the attack on her, then. Correct. We finally have hard evidence, and so we can act. Ben should have felt outrage, he knew, but what filled him then was despair that people found it so easy and so necessary to plot to kill each other. It was happening to his own family, and to him, and it was happening between heads of state. They were all crazy. They'd lost all reason. Or was this the way the adult world really worked? Doing all the stupid, cruel, destructive, impulsive things that they swore they'd grown out of. What do you want me to do? Ben asked, pretty sure what the answer would be. Assassinate Gedgen. Jason rubbed his forehead wearily. He's a piece of work, and he'll destabilize our allies. There's no negotiating with a man who routinely resorts to state-sponsored assassination like that. The Corellians need to know we can reach out and take them, too. Sober them up a bit. Way too cocky. Isn't that what we're doing, though? How is our assassination different from theirs? Won't it just lead to more killings? You want to do this by the book? Okay. 
call Karelian security and report Gedjin for conspiracy to murder. Oh, and for having Thrak and Sal Solo assassinated, too. Even though we can't call my father in court to testify to that. Let's see how fast they arrest him. I know... You don't have to do it. Jason had that slightly wounded tone that said quite the opposite. But you proved you were competent at covert ops when we hit center point. And you can get close to Gedjin a lot more easily than some big hairy commando like Duville. You can look like a harmless teenager. I am a teenager, and I'm usually pretty harmless. But Jason had a point. If anyone was going to do it, and the fact that Jason had mentioned it meant he'd already made up his mind, then Ben had the best chance of getting close enough to Gedjin without being spotted. Jason stared at him, head slightly on one side, with that almost smile that said he was sure Ben was going to say yes. I can't exactly ask Boba Fett to do this, can I? Jason said quietly. They're taking bets on how and when he's going to try to kill you. An officer shouldn't ask his troops to do anything he wouldn't do himself. I can't leave this to one of the 967. Okay. I agree Gedjin's rotten to the core. And once we can go public on this stuff, then the warrant on Uncle Han and Aunt Leia is dropped. Right? I can't, Ben. Jason sighed. Everyone knows they had nothing to do with the attack. But they're still working for Corellia. And I can't suspend arrest warrants just because they're family. That's how corruption starts. Besides, what example does that set the troops? Will they ever trust us again if officers bend the rules for family? Ben was reminded once more that he didn't take after his father, who would have insisted on arresting Gedjin. It was dirty work, but he should have realized that by now. He couldn't hand it on to someone else if he wanted to think of himself as a man, or an officer. I'll send you with good backup, Jason said. Shevu and Lekauf. Our contacts on Corellia are working out a time and place. You'll have to be ready to go at a moment's notice. Ben wondered how he was meant to kill Gedjin. It seemed a sacrilege to use a lightsaber. He concentrated on the practicalities and logistics, pondering briefly on where the hit would take place, how close he could get, and what would work best, blaster, projectile, or something more exotic. There was his mother's vibroblade, but Ben wasn't sure he had the stomach to use it in cold blood. He only knew how to defend himself and others not how to hunt for the sole purpose of killing. You can do it, said Jason, who always seemed to know his thoughts. Same techniques you use already, just a different mindset. Go talk to the sniper team. The best person he could have consulted on the finer points of assassination was his mother, once the Emperor's hands the best assassin of her day. Hey, Mom, is a headshot best? Double tap or triple? Do you think a silenced blaster is a better option than a lightsaber? Ben knew that was a conversation he could never have. Jason watched Ben leave the briefing room and took a deep breath. It was all he could do to keep the breath steady and not let it become a sob. I can't do this. I can't kill him. If the Force had made things clearer, explained explicitly what he had to do, go here, kill this, recite that, then it might have been easier. It was not knowing that was unbearable. Not knowing if he was reading too much into the uncertain interpretations of knotted tassels, into Lumia's vague pronouncements, into parallels with his grandfather that might not even have been there. 
he knew his destiny was to be a Sith Lord more surely than he knew anything. But it was this final test that left him in agonized turmoil. What if I'm wrong? What if Lumi is wrong? What if I don't have to kill anyone at all, and I kill Ben because I couldn't translate a stupid prophecy straight? The prophecy said, He will immortalize his love. It said a lot of other things, too, like he'd make a pet. He still didn't have anything fluffy, scaly, or feathered to his name, and it was stretching it to apply that to the faithful Corporal LeCouf, who served him as selflessly as his grandfather had served Vader. Immortalize doesn't have to mean kill. But he had no idea what else it might mean. This, this, was the worst thing about Sith teaching. There weren't just two possible interpretations of anything, but three, four, five— so only the Sith deal in absolutes, do they, Obi-Wan? You told Vader that, or so Lumia says. You liar. The Sith deal in anything but absolutes, because... Because life itself was like that. A million choices to be freely made, all of them to be lived with, and requiring the courage of conviction. Just a clue. How will I know? What will the sign be? Lumia didn't know either. Or if she did, he wasn't going to listen. Enough games. Enough guessing. This all rested on his judgment. I'm looking for signs and portents like a Rin fortune-teller, it has to be more rational than this. It was. Ben's comment from the conversation they'd only just finished leapt into his mind. An officer has to make decisions that cost lives. It was for the good of the majority, he said. And if Ben could think it, then Jason had to as well. He thought it, activated the security locks on the briefing room doors, sat down in a corner with his head resting on his knees. When he put his hand to his face, he found it wet with tears. Chapter 5 The main barrier to getting the Galactic Alliance to talk sense is Jason Solo. He leads Chief Omis by the nose, and he makes Admiral Neothel worse by encouraging her short, sharp shock tendencies. Get him out of the way, and things would calm down enough for us to maneuver around Omis. I think I'll have a statesman-to-statesman -statesman chat with him. Privately. Durgedjan, Corellian Prime Minister in Private Discussion Galactic Alliance XJ-7, in neutral space between Corellia and Coruscant. Mara wondered if she'd bothered to spin Jason a line about why she needed to take an XJ-7. Look, Jason, it's like this. You've turned into a thug since Lumia came on the scene, and the witch is trying to kill my son, so how's about I do what I do best and kill her for all our sakes? She would have loved to tell him that but she still didn't know who Lumia's accomplices were inside the G.A.G., and Jason didn't take kindly to doubts about his precious secret police. He wasn't being helpful. He didn't even seem to believe that Mara and Luke had found convincing evidence of Lumia's G.A.G. connections. Jason might have been a gifted Jedi, but he could also be a very human idiot, too or at least she'd thought in those more benign terms before the debacle of Galater Eight. She'd never imagined that Jason would leave his parents to die. Mara tried Leia's comlink again, hopping from frequency to frequency in case she was being tracked. Old habits died hard, and she didn't want crazy woman too, Alima, to get a fix on her, or Leia, or... 
Maybe she did. We can't go on meeting like this, said Leia's voice. She laughed, and that was pretty remarkable under the circumstances. She didn't have much to laugh about. Do I have to give you a password? I'll trust you. Mara checked her cockpit display, watching the frequency shift on the monitor in multicolored bars of light. You okay? For a woman on the run, I'm doing great. I don't know where to start. Try, hey, did your son really abandon you to suck vacuum? Because that'd be my first question. I'm so sorry, Leia. I really am. But I'm going to put a stop to this. Take Lumia out of the equation. And I think you'll see a major improvement in Jason's attitude. Is that where you are now? I'm trying to work out how Lumia moves around. Forget all this light whip garbage. I'm going to find her ship and finish what Luke started. They're always vulnerable in transit. Leia's end of the link went quiet for a few moments. Want me to play bait? Don't you think you've been through enough lately? I can guarantee that Alima would show up if I asked nicely, Leia said. And maybe Lumia wouldn't be far behind. Tell you what, why don't I lob in Ben and make certain of it? Mara, sorry, I don't want to expose you to any more risk. But if I can devise a safer way of exploiting the fact that neither of those crazies can keep away from us, I'll do it. We're going to need to break this link soon, Leia said. Okay. Look, I have to see Jason sooner or later. Do you want me to put it to him straight? Ask him why he ran when you'd come to save him? Mara couldn't think of a single thing Jason might say that would sound plausible, but she didn't want to make Leia feel any worse than she did. My fault, anyway. I defended him when Luke was telling me he was going dark. If I'd seen what was in front of me and acted then, things might be different now. She had that thought about Palpatine, too. She was spending too much time looking back, and not enough getting on with the here and now. The past couldn't be changed, just the future. What if he tells you, said Leia, and it's a reason I won't enjoy hearing. Your call. How much worse has it got to get before you accept he's treating you worse than dirt? Mara tried to imagine how she'd feel if Ben issued a warrant for her arrest or left her on a space station venting atmosphere. It would devastate her, but she'd take him back in a heartbeat. Now, there was no advice she could give Leia about her wayward son. But I want to know anyway, seeing as Luke and I were there to help him too and wasted our time. All I can say is do whatever you feel you must to get Lumia. Then we'll see about bringing Jason back into the fold. If I find Alima, I'll save her for you. I'd like that. Thought you might. You take care, Mara. Leia's link went dead. Mara had to assume she and Han were on Corellia, and that meant Alima couldn't get at her so easily. Take care? Oh, I will. I've got one advantage you haven't, Leia, and that's darkness. I've been that dark. I was trained by a Sith Lord. I can think like them. At least Leia hadn't made any cracks about Luke not taking the opportunity to finish off Lumia. Sometimes, when she considered her sister-in-law, Mara regretted her own temper and wished she could learn a little of that steely diplomacy. Mara turned the XJ-7 and checked Ben's transponder again. Still on Coruscant. That didn't guarantee his safety, but at least she could pinpoint him. She zoomed her screen in on the trace, and the coordinates resolved into a grid, and then into neighborhoods and sky lanes. Ben was at GAGHQ. She could locate him accurately to within three meters. 
He liked the vibroblade she'd given him. She felt bad not telling him it housed a long-range passive transponder, and that it had saved her more than once because she'd used it as a homing beacon. But that was just detail. It was a superb weapon, so it wasn't a lie. The tagged vibroblade ensured she knew exactly where Ben was at all times now. He'd never spot it. The GAG thought they had all the best kit. But she had a few devices that could get past them, using older technology, frequencies, and relays they'd never spot. A surveillance system using the most sophisticated technology wasn't looking for devices almost as basic as a code flashed with a piece of broken mirror. Tech could be blind. If they scanned Ben, they'd only find his comlink code, not the signal hiding within it. Because they didn't have the active end of the transponder link. She did. She had one more transponder left, and she was saving that for a rainy day. Sorry, sweetheart. Had to do it. She turned her attention back to Lumia. Now Lumia was showing up at confrontations with the Confederation. Perhaps everyone was looking in the wrong direction, and Lumia was working for Corellia. The last time she'd seen her on the resort satellite, Ben wasn't even around. But Jason was. Who was Lumia going after? Ben or Jason? If Lumia's presence was making Jason forget what being a Jedi was all about, then maybe Mara needed to keep tabs on Jason, too. That was easier said than done. She needed to try a more direct approach there. Maybe talk to him for once. Nobody else had managed to. It was hard to get Jason to listen, and even harder to get hold of him these days. He took the secret in secret police, literally. Then something vanished from the Force. Ben. It was like a shape flashing past her peripheral vision, and a familiar background noise stopping abruptly, leaving a dead, soundless ringing in the ears. Ben's gone. Ben had disappeared from the Force. Mara's hand was on the controls to jump to hyperspace and head back to Coruscant at top speed, when the sense of her son flooded back as if the sound had been turned on again. Her stomach rolled. Maybe it's me. He'd done it before as a little boy, scared by the last war, the one against the Yuzhan Vong. It was uncontrolled and instinctive. But what Mara had just experienced felt like something more deliberate. When she concentrated on him, he felt fine. No, more than fine. He felt elated. It still bothered her. She set a course for home, and before she jumped, she felt him vanish and return again. He seemed delighted. She could feel the profound wonder in him. So he was doing it deliberately. No son of hers was going to pull that stunt on her. She'd had enough of Jason doing it without Ben learning to hide in the Force as well. She'd go back and check on him, but pick her time to confront him about his new skill. Maybe he won't get any farther than short bursts. But he was Ben, and Ben had proved capable of astounding feats. He'd master it, all right. She just knew it. Suddenly she didn't feel quite so guilty about giving him a tagged vibroblade. A mother had to keep ahead of the game somehow. South Side Landing Strip, Kuat City So, said the clone. He hauled Myrta to her feet and dusted her down. And she tolerated it. His animal watched her with red-rimmed yellow eyes, and she grabbed her helmet from where he'd dropped it, expecting the creature to spring at her. What part of stay out of my way didn't you understand? Myrta opened her mouth to give him a piece of her mind, but Fett cut in. Nice of you to drop in, but can we continue this discussion elsewhere? Ah, the almighty Mandalore.
hanging a gang boss over a balcony in the center of town. Yeah, that's subtle. The clone motioned the animal into the cargo bay, where it lay rumbling ominously like a distant storm. It was the ugliest thing Myrta had ever seen. Loose gold fur that made it look like its skin was several sizes too big for it, six legs, and a truly ghastly mouthful of fangs. Thanks for getting everyone's attention. I was looking for you, Fett said. He closed the hatch. We have to go. Shut up and secure yourself for takeoff. You abducting me? Would you rather have a chat and a cup of calf while we wait for the Kuat police and all of Frigg's scumbags to show up? Okay. I borrowed the speeder anyway. Sort of. Tell you what. Drop us off on Coruscant, and we'll be on our way. The clone grabbed his helmet with both hands and lifted it off. He didn't look any less intimidating, but after a couple of seconds he broke into an unexpected grin that completely transformed him. He looked more like Fett's brother than his twin. Not identical at all. They say there's some family resemblance, but I don't see it myself. Fett paused for a telling moment, and then stalked off to the cockpit. Myrta wasn't certain whether to land a punch on the clone or thank him for showing up. What's your name? she asked. Jang Skirata. You? Myrta Gev. Then she realized it didn't have the required impact. Fett's granddaughter. Jang raised his eyebrows and burst out laughing. The animal lifted its head and whined. Myrta went forward to the cockpit to strap herself in for takeoff, unhappy at the laughter still ringing behind her. You let him ambush you, said Fett. Myrta seethed. I didn't pick him up on my sensors, and I didn't even see him coming at me. He flattened me before I could colleague him. Stab. You're learning. And you're not. Fett punched the controls, and Kuat dwindled to a disc beneath them. You didn't check visually. Don't rely on the helmet tech all the time. Hey, you didn't spot him either. That's got to be stealth armor. He's a null. There was some history there. She could see that. They were black ops clones. The Kaminoans attempt to improve on my dad's genome for cloning. You can see it didn't work. He says his name's Jang. And did they really shove your head down? Fett just turned his head. He still had his helmet on. And even though few things scared Myrta these days... He had a way of being glacially slow and silent that was unsettling. She was just trying to get him to talk, looking for the long-buried man within. It was a forlorn hope. She gripped the console in front of her as Fett tapped in the coordinates for Coruscant. Zero, zero, zero. And Slave One jumped to hyperspace. Chang's not as bad as I thought, Myrta said. They were all psychiatric cases. Considering he probably hadn't seen them since he was a kid, Fett's recollection seemed painfully vivid. They say Jang tracked Grievous in the war. Master assassin, sniper, general pain in the backside. Don't underestimate him. The war before last, you mean? It's all one long war to me. It was time to shut up, she decided. Fett was braced against the pilot seat, looking uncomfortable. It could be folded down so the pilot could stand at the controls or raised to form a ledge. He usually opted for the latter. She had a feeling that he was in too much pain to sit down. Course laid in, he said. Let's go talk to him. Myrta pulled out another painkiller, 
grabbed his hand, and slapped the capsule into his palm. And when we drop him off on Coruscant, you see Dr. Bellwine, okay? Fett grunted. That was as near as she'd get to an agreement. She could see his dread of mortal weakness. I'm not relying completely on drugs yet, he said. All the time I hurt, I know how far it's progressed. Jang was sitting cross-legged on the deck of the cargo bay, face to face with the animal, which was gazing into his eyes and making little whining, grumbling sounds as if trying to get him to understand something. He seemed oblivious to its smell. They both looked around when Fett and Myrta came through the hatch. What is he? Myrta asked. You asking me, or Lord Myrdalon? Jang held his gloved fingers up in front of the animal's face, some kind of signal that produced instant attention and made it lie flat on the deck. Jang got to his feet. He's an it. Strills are hermaphrodites. I promised Myrd's last owner I'd look after it when he passed to the Manda. Strills live a lot longer than we do. Heard of them, but never seen one. They're nearly extinct on Mandalore. Myrd, well, you might say it's a black ops strill. Saw a lot of commando action in a few wars. Fett shoved his thumbs into his belt in that I'm fed up with waiting pose. When you two finish the nature lesson. Jang had more lines, fewer gray hairs, and a heavier build than Fett. Myrta could see the cords of muscle in his neck, and he had no scars. He looked like a man who'd spent a lot of time in the sun without a helmet, and who'd laughed a lot. Genetically, this was Fett, but they couldn't have been more different. "'Ain't I gorgeous?' he grinned, and she realized she was staring at him. "'A vision,' Fett said sourly, and removed his helmet. I think I aged better, Bobica. It's the fact that you reached this age at all that interests me. So why do you want me? Need a loan? You've been looking for me for weeks, because I've been hearing all kinds of people putting out the word for me, I'm dying, Fett said. Jang chewed over the news head slightly to one side. Sorry to hear that. You're not the only clone who met a premature end. Fett usually cut to the chase. Now he stood silent for a while, jaw muscles twitching. Myrta wondered if he was hurt by the rebuff. She guessed that he was working up to the hardest thing he ever had to say. He was. I want your help, Jang. Jang just stared at him. The staring went on for a long time. Myrta wondered who would give in first. Then it went on a little too long. Oh, for Fearfex's sake, she sighed. It's the cloning. His tissues are breaking down and he's got tumors. He needs to know what stopped you aging at double the rate, because his doctor can't help him, and neither can the Kaminoans, not even Town We. Fat pursed his lips slightly. What she said. So Town We's still going strong, too, the old Iowa bait. Well, well. Jang looked fed up and down. You had trouble with your leg, I heard. Had to have a transplant, yes? You're very well informed. I'm still a Tipica boy at heart. I stay in touch with events in the old country. What have I got to pay you to quit gloating and give me what I need? No offense, 
But you can shove your credits where your armor don't reach, Mandalore. You don't know what I need yet. I can guess. Kosai's research. Fett gave Jang's gloves a pointed glance. Because I know you found it. You certainly found her. You get more with honey than with sour sap, Boba. Didn't getting your head shoved down the freshers teach you anything? Fett had no idea how to ask for help. Myrta wasn't sure if it was some male bravado thing, or just that he'd never learn. But he wasn't getting far with Jang, who seemed equally hard and obstinate. Can you help him? she said. Gadet ye? Mandalore needs him alive. And so do I. The clone was still staring into Fett's face. Remember leading an imperial force against clone troops on Kamino? Fett nodded, utterly impassive. Yes. You didn't feel that we were family then. Didn't see any of you defending your brothers either. And you deposed Shisa, you Hutun, the man who put us back on our feet as a people. Where were you when the Empire was bleeding us dry? Hutun was the worst insult any Mando could throw at another. But Fat didn't seem to notice or care. Myrta found out more about her grandfather's murky past every day so there was no reason to feel her mother and grandmother had been singled out for his total disregard then. He didn't give a stuff about anyone, except his father, who seemed to have been elevated to an icon of perfection since his death. So Babuir fought against his own brothers. Maybe he hadn't seen the irony. If he had, she suspected he'd made a point of looking the other way. I'm not proud of anything I've done, Fett said, no hint of emotion in his voice. But I'm not ashamed of anything either. I just do what I have to. You don't know what went on between me and Shisa, and maybe you never will. He was there when we needed him, said Jang, and you weren't. That's all I need to know. Fett didn't so much as blink. I take it you won't be handing over Kosai's data, then. Jang glanced at Myrta, as if he felt sorry for her. She wondered how different her life might have been if Jang had met Sintas Vel instead of Boba Fett. There isn't any data, he said at last. He was still looking at her, not Fett. Sorry, kid. Fett didn't even blink. You must have taken all your vitamins, then. Because you should be dead by now. I didn't say the research didn't exist. I'm saying that we destroyed it after we took what we needed. Fett absorbed that slowly. Myrta's heart sank in that conflicting way it had now part of her desperate to find a reason to love her babuir, and half of her wishing Leia Solo hadn't blocked her shot when she'd tried to kill him. Do something to make me forgive you. Please. Anything. You could have made a fortune from it, Fett said. We didn't want it used again. Ever. You can't stop cloning. You never will. No, but we put a dent in the Kaminoans. That's better than nothing. I don't like Kaminoans. I can tell. Fett glanced at Jang's fine gray gloves. But I've worked for worse. They paid you. They bred us like animals. Jang looked as if he'd remembered something satisfying. 
So Town Wee's still alive. I always wondered. Leave her alone, Jang. She's old now. So am I, no thanks to her. So how long have you got to live? A year. Maybe two, if my luck holds. How long before you have to hand over command? I don't know. The last thing Mandalore needs at the moment is a power vacuum. Myrta saw a glimmer of hope. So help him, Jang. Best I can do is a blood sample, he said. But I think you'll hand it over to the Kaminoans, Boba, or your doctors will, and we really wouldn't be very happy about that. Not at all. We? Myrta felt she was getting on better with Jang. She'd use her advantage as the harmless, tragic granddaughter. If Jang wouldn't cooperate, she might find one of his brothers who would. How many of you are there left? You don't need to know that. Look, I've got grandchildren too, Boba, and great-grandchildren. I've got family on Mandalore. So I care what happens when you're gone. As soon as he said it, it took on a terrible reality for her, and she wondered if it had the same impact on her grandfather. The great Boba Fett's on the way out. Much as it pains me, your buad here is right. Mandalore needs you for the foreseeable future. Fett made a very good job of looking bored. Maybe he was. Myrta doubted it. He was negotiating for his life, and if Fett was anything, he was a survivor. He didn't know how to die gracefully like everyone else. So I get the blood if I keep the Kaminoans out of it? Not that simple, said Jang. It never is. You give me blood and tissue samples, and I'll get something made up for you, if I can. And I'm supposed to trust you, as much as I'm supposed to trust you. And don't even think about taking a sample from me the hard way. Okay. Fett's jaw twitched again. Thank you. He made it sound like a foreign language, awkward and unfamiliar in his mouth. Myrta resisted the urge to react. Well done, Babuir. Was that so hard? Jang wasn't done, though. There's a condition, of course. There always is. Fett crossed his arms. What? Get your shebs back to Mandalore. Listen to Kadika's advice and build a strong, united, stable state. Prove you're even half the man that Jaster Mareel and Fen Shisa were. All you want to do is emulate your old man, Boba. But you're too scared to exceed him, aren't you? You can't be Better than Django. That would never do. Myrta flinched. Mentioning his father without due reverence seemed to be the one thing that really got Fett riled. His voice didn't change, but he unfolded his arms with slow care. My father, said Fett, finally destroyed the Death Watch. That's his legacy to Mandalore. Sectarian feud, irrelevant to most Mondoade's lives. Now, are you going to give me a sample? What kind of scientists have you got access to that I haven't? Some things... Jang said softly, can't be bought. 
I have my resources. Believe me. Got a med pack with a sharp in it? Yes. Draw some blood, then. I'll do it, said Myrta. With Fett, it wasn't a case of simply rolling up sleeves. He had so much equipment on his forearms that Jang ended up holding the flamethrower attachment, whip assembly, and assorted projectiles. Fett was an armory on legs. Myrta didn't expect him to flinch when she finally found a vein, and he didn't. The few moments while she applied pressure to the blood vessel with her thumb to stop the bleeding afterward were the longest of her life, because he wouldn't meet her eyes, and it reminded her that she could touch him and still not reach him. Jang held the vial of red-black blood up to the light and admired it. That'll do nicely. Give him some candy for being a brave boy, Myrta. What now? Fed asked, unmoved. You drop me off, and I'll let you know what we get. How? I'll deliver it personally to Keldabe. Better make it snappy, then, or you might be in time for my funeral. Oh, I'll be back, and so will plenty of other Mondoade. You asked us, remember? You asked us to come home. He turned to Myrta. When the old Chakar dies and they divvy up his armor, make sure you get the flamethrower, because his plates are douce, not even proper Beskar. So Jang wasn't out of touch with events on Mandalore, and he thought Fett's durasteel armor was garbage. The strill padded closer to Jang and yawned extravagantly with an expression that said it was totally underwhelmed by the discussion. Myrta could smell its breath, which, oddly, wasn't unpleasant at all. How does that thing hunt if it's got such a strong scent? Fat asked. Jang bent and ruffled Meard's neck folds. Only humanoids can smell it. And don't be too hard on Myrta for getting ambushed, Bobica. Few people can deal with a full-grown strill swooping down on them. These things fly, you know. I don't keep pets. Fat seemed on the edge of a concession. If you want something to eat, the galley's through that hatch. Jang opened a pouch on his belt and took out something dried and dark that looked like leather straps. He threw a strip to Meard and chewed on one himself. We're fine, thanks. It took a few seconds for Myrta to work out what was going on. He doesn't want to leave any DNA. He's even more cunning than you, Babuir. Fett turned and swung back through the hatch. Myrta had hoped the two men would find something else to talk about, but the fact they shared a genome clearly meant nothing. Still, this was a relative. This was her relative. A great-uncle even if Mandos didn't care about bloodline half as much as most species. The Kifar half of her cared about it a lot. I feel bad for you, kid, Jang said. I feel bad for him, too, I suppose. But apart from some admiration for his skills, I think he's the worst excuse for a Mondo odd this side of the core. On the other hand, he wins, and we need winners. And my dad would have expected me to help him, no questions asked. Jang spoke as if he came from a totally different family, not a vat that contained the duplicated chromosomes of Django Fett. He slipped a three-sided knife from his forearm plate 
and trimmed the dried meat into smaller chunks, utterly at ease. Django's not who you mean by dad, is he? Myrta said. No. Jang smiled wistfully to himself for a moment. Genes don't count. You ought to know that by now. The man who adopted me was my training sergeant, finest man who ever lived. Jang sounded like he'd come from a far happier family. A strange thing for a clone soldier. I seem to be bucking the trend of devoted kids, Myrta said. I tried to kill my grandfather. So did your mother, I hear. Boba's obviously got this magic touch with the ladies. You seem to know everything about me, but I don't know much about you. Jang just grinned. That's my job, sweetheart. So why did you get involved with Cherit's gang over the Twi'lex? Another promise I made a long time ago. He chewed, looking slightly past her in recollection. I tend to keep them. He went on chewing, occasionally throwing chunks to Meard. And that was it. Silence descended. She thought he might talk about his family on Mandalore, all the undiscovered relatives she now found she had, but he didn't. Myrta realized she wasn't going to get anything more out of him, and she didn't want to look needy. She returned to the cockpit, settled into the co-pilot seat, and clutched the heart of fire against her chest plate. Even if it told her nothing, it was still a connection to her mother and grandmother. You fed up with him already? Fett asked. She wanted to think Jang had given Fett some hope and raised his spirits, but it was hard to tell. Is your armor really rubbish? Why don't you use proper Mandalorian iron? Like Bevin says, Don't push your luck. I let you stick a needle in me. That's your fun for the day. It had cheered him up. Myrta could tell. She hoped that not only would Jang's unspecified resources come through, but that Boba Fett would redeem himself so that her only kin wasn't someone that she wished were someone else. G.A.G.H.Q. Coruscant Jason didn't want to look too interested in the Policy and Resources Council proceedings. If he showed up for the meeting and sat in the gallery reserved for those hardy citizens who actually cared about the minutiae of government, he might cause questions to be asked. On the other hand, he might just have been seen as a micromanaging, interfering colonel who put his troops' welfare above schools, health, and transport. That was fine by him. He did. But a low profile was called for, so he stayed at GAGHQ and switched to the Holonet channel that broadcast Senate proceedings. Lumia should have been there by now. He waited for the holocam to pan to the public gallery, and saw, as he expected, a woman in a sober business suit and veiled headdress. She wasn't the only one, either. Veils were considered very chic this year. She drew no attention at all. HM3's amendment to the procurement regulations was item 357 on an agenda of 563 mind-bogglingly boring tweaks and changes to laws Jason didn't even know were on the statute books. I'm going to have to do a lot of delegating when I'm... in charge. A hand-picked team of administrators. Led by HM3, I think. The session had already started, and senators who were happy to do the small routine work and not be noticed were on item 24, having a particularly arcane piece of hazardous waste legislation explained to them. Jason turned off the audio feed and set the monitor to alert him when item 357 was up. Then he got on with reading more intelligence reports, 
with the doors to his office wide open. He almost always kept the doors open. It reassured the troops. It told them that he was an accessible officer, always willing to listen. But Jory Lecauf peered in, boots still firmly on the corridor side of the doors, as if there were a barrier marked, Officer Territory, Do Not Pass. Lady at the security gate asking to see you, sir. Jason, distracted, felt in the force to see who it might be. Mara Skywalker. Lakauf grinned. It's great the way you can do that, sir. I don't get many women coming to see me, so I could have guessed. Jaina wouldn't be visiting, not without him feeling her resentment and mistrust marching ahead of her like a vanguard. And it wouldn't have been Tenel Ka. He missed her, and he missed Alana even more. I don't have to kill them. I'd know if I had to, wouldn't I? Bring her in. Yes, sir. Lekauf turned to go. Lekauf, sir? Have you ever considered a commission? Not sure if I'm officer material, sir. I think you could be. I'm not forcing you. But we need good officers coming through the ranks. Because we'll have a challenging role in the years to come. Lekauf seemed dubious. I'm willing to give it a go, sir. Excellent. I'll get the adjutant to fix the paperwork. We'll probably have to delay staff college until the security situation is more stable. But I'm sure Chevu or Girdon will be happy to guide you. And you'll be able to keep an eye on Ben. He really trusts you. Lekauf blinked but there was no expression on his face. Captain Chevu looks after me very well. I'll learn a lot from him. Non sequiturs said a lot. Lekauf wasn't naive, for all his cheerful schoolboy appearance. His careful avoidance of Captain Geerden's name confirmed Jason's observations that the ex-intel man wasn't a popular officer with troops from the military and CSF side. Spies had that effect. Chevu had come from the CSF, familiar, visible, reliable folks you were happy to see in a crisis. Jason couldn't afford divisions. You might do Captain Geerden good, too. It's interesting how a good apprentice creates a better teacher. Thank you, sir. Lekauf showed not a flicker of reaction. I'll show your guest in. Jason kept one eye on the silent holoscreen while he looked through the reports, one of which he forwarded for Neothel's immediate attention. The Bothans had a new class of frigate coming into service in a matter of days. The P&R meeting had reached item 102. A busy day. A lot of rubber stamping was going on. He opened his comlink and switched the signal to the small bead deep in his ear. Lumia had a concealed receiver in her cybernetic implants and would hear it in the depths of her skull, silent as a thought. He used her cover name, the one he'd used in front of Ben. It was common enough. It also helped avoid accidental slips. Are you helping them make decisions, Shira? Giving them a sense of urgency, that's all. Not that they don't have fancy lunches on their minds anyway. Does it look as if anyone troublesome has read the agenda sheets in advance? Not as far as I can see. But don't worry. I can deal with that. Jason felt Mara approaching down the corridor, a little tornado of determination. Unlike Lekauf, she walked straight in. Jason projected a veneer of weary good humor in the force and smiled at her. She glanced at the holoscreen. That looks thrilling. Just making sure we get our supply issues worked out. Hiding in plain sight was always the best option, Jason found. 
an amendment so that we can cut the red tape and get our people the right kit. It's been an issue with the troops. I'm all for that. Mara sat down in the rickety chair across from his desk. Jason believed in being seen not to spend budget on himself, and crossed her legs. She'd taken to wearing a gray jacket that looked more like battle dress, an indication of her state of mind lately. I've come about Ben. He's doing well. He's doing very well, in fact. You've certainly focused him. Quite the responsible young man now. Mara glanced at the open doors as if they troubled her. Let's get to the point. I know Lumi is trying to kill him. Whatever he did or didn't do, Lumia thinks he killed her daughter. Now, seeing as we also found evidence that Lumia has a mole in the GAG, that concerns me somewhat. A lot of somewhat. If anything happened to my boy from inside the GAG, I'd take it pretty badly, I think. Ah, has she worked it out? Has Mara actually seen what's coming? Jason felt a moment of sinking dismay as he wondered if this last mystery about his path was transparent to everyone. She was Palpatine's hand. If anyone on the Jedi Council can see it, she will. Jason managed to project genuine concern. His link was still open. Lumia could hear all this. I've investigated that, and I can assure you I found nothing to support it. He's been around. I don't see much of him these days. Ben was out on patrol, on routine weapons searches. Mara didn't need to know that. He's doing some research for me. Okay, Mara said. Just asking you to bear in mind that it's not the Confederation that's most likely to threaten his life. And even if you don't think Lumia has an insider in your ranks, then I'm assuming she has until I'm convinced otherwise. She stood up slowly, and Jason was on the edge of believing that she could see what was happening. Just ask yourself which member of the GAG would ally with Lumia. I'm not sure you'd see it being so close to it. Jason expected to hear some sigh or other reaction from Lumia, but either she was more concerned with the passage of the amendment, or she couldn't hear after all. I'll certainly ask that question, Aunt Mara, he said. Just bear in mind that Ben's learning to take care of himself. And are you... What do you mean? Well, if nobody else is going to say it to your face, I will. What's happening to you, Jason? Why did you run out on your parents like that? Okay, there's a warrant out on them, but... Jason wondered why it had taken so long for anyone to confront him. He'd expected Jaina to be the first, given her perpetual sulk with him. But Mara probably felt her defense of him had now made her look stupid. My fault, he said. I assumed they were okay and could get to safety. So I decided to get to where I could make a difference to the battle. My ship. Right, said Mara. Just a lapse in judgment. I'm human. We all have times when our judgment lets us down. I certainly do. Mara gave him an unconvincing smile turning for the doors. Thanks for your time. She knows. She knows because it's inevitable. And that proves it has to be Ben. It wasn't his parents, or Tenelka, or Alana. It was Ben. He wondered how long he could go on facing the boy knowing that. How would it happen? Would he have to kill him in cold blood, or would they end up in some violent confrontation where death was so much easier to deal out? Lumia's voice was a breath in his ear. 
If anyone overheard her, she sounded like any bureaucrat having a discreet comlink conversation. Not a Sith planning the greatest coup of all time. I think my former colleague will be looking for me now, with maximum disapproval. Jason closed the doors with his remote control. It was you who engineered the attack on Ben on Zeost, wasn't it? He'll never be your successor. He hasn't got what it takes to be your apprentice. It's my duty to retire the unsuitable. Stay away from him from now on. You've gone too far, and I think Mara suspects what's happening. My former colleague can't touch you if— Wait, they're taking your amendment out of sequence. Someone has asked to speak on it. Who? Someone in the public gallery. They've invoked the right to address the council, and they've identified themselves as Citizen Watch. It was interesting to note how fast things could come unraveled. The civil rights lobby was largely drowned out by events, but he still didn't want them to point out what nobody seemed to have spotted hidden in his amendment. You know what you have to do. Indeed. Lumia went very quiet, her voice almost inaudible. I think that they're going to decide that they wish to ask if this is going to be retroactive legislation. Yes, they have. How vigilant. If she thought she'd redeemed herself in his eyes, she was wrong. She was becoming a risk. But that was always the Sith way. Always this struggle between two. He turned the audio back on while the amendment was discussed. HM3 was right. Senators chewed over the sums involved and satisfied themselves that the budget wouldn't be exceeded without authorization from the Treasury. Nobody seemed to see that the finely tuned wording by HM3 would enable Jason to change other legislation, too. He'd think of things that needed changing. Once I kill Ben Skywalker, once Mara and Luke find out that it's me, and that day will have to come, then they'll hunt me down. I'll bring down the whole Jedi Order on my head. Who would be his apprentice then? It'll finish the Jedi. He just wanted things to become clear when the time came. He had to trust his destiny. He was too far along the path to stop now. Item 357 carried. Next item. Variants of regulations regarding the licensing of air taxis. And that was it. The amendment had been passed. And when the revised statute came into effect at midnight... Colonel Jason Solo, and Admiral Cha Niathal, because it applied equally to her, would be able to order whatever the defense forces needed, and get it fast. And change any other administrative legislation within existing budgets, without recourse to the Senate. They'd handed him an extraordinary power and one that he'd use to change the way the galaxy was governed. He'd use it to take down Chief of State Omis. He wasn't sure of the details yet, but he could do it, and soon. The Galactic Alliance would fall, not with a clash of lightsaber blades or ion cannons fired or troops surrounding the Senate, but with a sheet of flimsy and a nod of heads. Well done, he said softly, nicely influenced. Not me, 
Lumia said. He could hear the smile in her voice. They reached the decision themselves without any help from me. I just redirected a little opposition from the gallery. The irony was too delicious sometimes. Jason didn't know whether to be satisfied at the outcome or angry that senators were so stupid that they let him get away with this. They deserved to be ruled by the Sith. They needed to be. Chapter 6 Reports are coming in of a major battle between Seekan forces and invading Chekot troops on the Seekah homeworld. The Seekan administration has called for Galactic Alliance forces to intervene in what it calls an act of opportunist aggression, and share prices have tumbled over fears that the invasion will draw more planets in the expansion region into the conflict. HNE Newsflash Galactic Alliance warship Bounty On station with Alliance frigate Daring, Bothan Sector It was a tidy-looking vessel. She had to admit that. The new Bothan frigate wasn't even in their database. Admiral Neothel watched it on Bounty's bridge screen, curving out of Bathawi orbit trailed by five small unarmed tenders. The profile and signature were immediately logged in the ship's recognition systems. Looks like the Bothans have been shopping after all, she said. At least the intel was right on that. Seems they're still doing workups, too, said Captain Pyrrhus. The warship was being assisted by the tenders. Or maybe it was simply feigning helplessness. Neothel never took Bothans at face value. Let's see what specs we can collate on them before we scratch the paintwork. I hope they kept their receipts. KDY construction, do you think? Talon, Pyrrhus said. We'd know if Kuat was building them. Well, they're not going to level Coruscant with those. But they certainly will spread us thin if they've got as many as intelligence estimates. Admiral Neothel shared a number of military philosophies with Jason Solo, and being seen on the front line was one of them. She also liked to see things for herself, especially if Galactic Alliance intelligence was involved. The current overstretch gave her cause to wonder what Cal Omis was playing at, an anxiety that might have been visible to the bridge crew as she paced up and down, glancing over shoulders to check screens and readouts. We need every hull we can hang on to, Admiral. Bounty's commanding officer, Pyrrhus, had been on the bridge far too long. He was a Quarren, evolved for an amphibious existence, and the atmosphere on board was too dry to keep pulling double watches. His uniform was sealed tightly at the cuffs and neck, but he kept wiping his face with a moist cloth. He needed a rest in his humid cabin. If the Bothan fleet is growing as fast now as intelligence suggests, then I fail to see how we're going to contain it if we have to support Sika and every other local skirmish too. Looks like the chem store I dispute will be the next to boil over. Neothel had a brief moment of wishing that she could target one world, reduce its surface to slag from orbit just to make her point, and then ask who else wanted some of the same. But it passed. It always did. Every backworld with a grievance is resurrecting old fights in the guise of Alliance loyalty and asking us to help out. And Omis thinks he can hold the Alliance together by placating every call for a backup fleet across the galaxy. When is he going to admit he can't? When I give him no other option, I think. Maybe the Bothans were ahead of the curve. Instead of commissioning more capital ships, juicy, high-value targets in battle, they'd opted for a big fleet of smaller, more agile warships that could be stockpiled without anyone panicking about the escalation in arms. It's a different kind of war. Flexibility and rapid response. That's the name of the game now. 
Pyrrhus put his hand on the ship's comm control. Let's see what they're made of. Mothma Squadron, launch when ready. Karesi Squadron, remain on alert five. Confine them to their own space, but attack if fired upon. Neothel still wondered who'd assassinated the Bothans and kicked off this escalation. Could have been our assets if we'd played the Bothans right. Some intel moron, she decided. She'd get to the bottom of that sooner or later. If she was going to be chief of state one day, she'd weed out the loose cannons first. If you can get our furry friends to give us a ship's tour in one piece, she suggested, but intercepting and boarding the new frigate in these circumstances was next to impossible. The best break they'd get would be to retrieve debris for inspection. I'd love to know their top speed. Neothel quite liked Bothans, even if she didn't trust them as far as she could spit, which was a lot farther than anyone might have believed. She didn't dislike Quarren either, even if it was almost expected of Moon Calamari. Quarren were a rare sight on ships. She knew Moan Cal officers who made every effort to avoid being assigned Quarren crew, and few Quarren wanted to serve alongside Moan Cal's even now. But when they were good, they were very, very good. Pyrrhus was outstanding. If she caught any Moan Cal referring to him as Squidhead, they'd answer to her, and she didn't care how many whispered that she was an apologist. Did we have the right to take their kids for some social engineering experiment? For our benefit? She asked herself that question more often these days, and the answer always came up negative. Jason Solo would think she was a hopeless wet liberal. She wondered how she was going to wipe him off her boots when the time came. It wouldn't be easy. Bounty? Daring? Stand by! Twelve fighters shot out of the bounty's hangar bay, spiraling away from the warship and streaking off in pursuit of the Bothan frigate. Then the three flights separated. Observation cams in each cockpit gave Bounty's combined bridge and combat information center a composite view of the engagement. Daring sat off Bounty's starboard bow, ready to divert any Bothan retaliation from her larger charge. Did you ever train as a pilot, ma'am? Pyrrhus asked. No, you? Indeed I did. At times like this, I miss it. If we get any busier, Captain, there'll be a droid running this ship, and you'll be flying sorties. Where that leaves me, I have no idea. You'll be Chief of State, ma'am, said Pyrrhus. The worst thing about Quarren was that their amusement wasn't as easy to spot as a human's. With a human, all those teeth on display made life easier. Quarren face tentacles could hide a multitude of emotions. That'll be the day, she said, hoping to avoid more gossip about her ambitions. Right then, being chief of state didn't matter at all. She had a battle and all her training and instinct kicked in to say this was where she wanted to be, not behind a desk. The first flight to come within range of the Bothan frigate shadowed it, cutting back and forth across its path at a thousand meters. The second flight trailed aft of it, scanning the hull and sending back data. It took a few seconds for the Bothans to react. Perhaps some of their systems were still offline. The ship picked up speed and began to move out of the Bathawi limits, its accompanying tenders trailing like escort fish. So the Bothans thought they had a nice new asset to surprise the Alliance. But the Alliance had spotted it. Neothel waited for the reaction while the third flight of Mothma Squadron monitored the situation, weapons trained but not locked. 
There was no point blowing it to pieces before they'd taken the measure of the new class. Very heavy hull plating for a frigate, said Neothel, looking at the recce scans coming back from the starfighters. Pyrrhus poured over the images and penetrating scans, too. At least a dozen turbo lasers and twenty cannons. Not exceptional. Depends how many hulls they have. They didn't have long to wait to find out how many vessels were out there. The weapons officer shouted at the same time as the sensor warning klaxon sounded. Sir, enemy contact at... Correction, multiple contacts in range. We've got trade. Bounty, daring. Close up at battle stations. Synchronize command information. Helm, all ahead. Caracy Squadron, launch! Bronzium and remainder of air group, launch when ready. Nobody said ambush. The cockpit chatter from the pilots broke in. Copy that. Five, six... Correction. Ten. Detecting cannons charging. We'll engage. Targeting source. I make that nineteen. He's got a lock on me. Got your six. Deploying chaff. Pyrrhus's face tentacles were completely still. It gave him a commendable look of calm. Cannons, engage all Bothan vessels in range. In your own time. Go on. One moment, they'd been watching a single fresh-out-of-the-box frigate, and the next, more were dropping out of hyperspace at regular five-second intervals. Mothma Squadron picked up images on their cockpit cams, all in the same Bothan livery, all brand-spanking new and unmarked by debris, pox, and scrapes. A flare of red laser blazed on the screens as one XJ cam view winked out and the fighter broke up into spinning red-hot debris. Pilots' voices were still audible in the background, but the focus on the bridge was on fighting the ship, attacking the enemy. Daring moved between Bounty and the Bothan flotilla. Her cannons and lasers showed up on the synchronized command information screen as blinking icons, fully charged and acquiring firing solutions. Eight contacts not firing, sir, and no sign of charging cannons. Bounty shuddered from deflected pulsed laser fire. Neothel moved to supervise damage control, which was already under a competent commander, but there was nothing worse than an idle visiting admiral on a ship at battle stations. She needed to be occupied. Take them out anyway, Pyrrhus turned to Neothel. If they cripple us, at least we transmitted the data we have. If they don't, that's a whole Bothan flotilla that never leaves home. I don't expect a tactical withdrawal, Captain. Three more XJs were hit. Neothel noted it as lost assets, not knowing the pilots personally, and disliked her detachment for a moment. She always did. We're here. Let's do as much damage as we can. The Bothans, of course, had the same goal. Two Bothan frigates were on a ramming course with Bounty. Of the remaining flotilla, five were firing on the XJs. Daring opened fire. The bridge crew watched as a frigate's aft section rippled with a sequence of explosions before debris blew away from it and smashed into an XJ. Five minutes into the engagement, Bounty's air group was taking a pounding, not all of it from direct hits. The second frigate veered away from the stream of fire from the XJ, a red-hot rip in its hull. Their targeting's not affected by chaff measures, sir. The pilot's voice was breathless with effort. They're using narrow-range heat seekers. In future, we'll need to— And he was gone, his cockpit cam blank and flickering. Air group, pull out! Pyrrhus barked. Cannons, solutions on all targets, now! Species perceived time differently in battle. For humans, it slowed because their brains took in far more detailed information about the threat. But that also meant they didn't notice low-priority things. But Moan Cows and Quarren saw it all and factored in every cough and spit. 
That was what made them good commanders. Neothel's instinct was to fight back, and for a moment she couldn't imagine why she'd ever had designs on high office. She saw the tactical displays and heard the comm chatter, and the real-time three-dimensional image in her mind showed her the whole battlefield, and she wanted to hit hard. Nine Bothan frigates were now disabled, either drifting with no sign of power, reduced to cold debris, or venting brief bursts of flame into the vacuum as they broke up. Some of the remaining ten returned fire for a further thirty seconds, then powered down their cannons. "'Surrendering?' asked the officer of the watch. "'They're preparing to jump,' said Pyrrhus. "'Take, take, take!' Seven frigates jumped in a tight sequence. Three weren't so quick off the mark and took a furious barrage of laser and cannons. Pyrrhus gave Neothel a nod of relief and leaned over the command console. Air group, anyone too damaged to make an RV point? Mothma 5-0, sir. Slow hull breach. Caracy 8, sir. The bridge crew waited for a few seconds, utterly silent. Cannons still trained while XJs streaked back to the hangar and recovery units passed them outbound to haul in damaged craft. Secure hatches when ready, and prepare to jump, Pyrrhus said. Any sign of the Bothan cavalry arriving on long-range scans? No? Good. He looked at the chrono hanging from a fob on his jacket. Not quite twenty minutes, Admiral. Now, was that a planned ambush we walked into? Or are the Bothans making the best of an unfortunately timed arrival? The score's twelve nil to us, not counting starfighters lost. But did we win or lose? I let you know when our public information colleagues tell me, Neothel said. But this confirms my position yet again. If we're stuck with the resources we've got, then we have to focus everything on Corellia, Kaminor, and now Bathawi. If the Chief of State wants to extend to every bushfire that's starting, he has to give us at least another fleet. And even if the Alliance had the credits, where would we get the personnel? Pyrrhus shrugged. All empires become too big, and collapse under their own weight. Maybe that's what we're seeing. Her body was telling her that it was all over now. She felt hot as her biochemical defenses rushed around looking for damage to repair, and found none. The aftermath of battle was always a restless hour or two for her, so she occupied herself wandering around the bridge patting crew members on the back and telling them what a fine job they'd done. One young human male was wiping tears away with the back of his hand, his attention fixed unnaturally on the sensor screen in front of him. He'd lost a friend today, maybe more than one. There was nothing to say. She simply put her hand on his shoulder and stood there in silence for a while, until the helm crew began their checks before hyperjumping. I'll be in my day cabin, she said, pausing to shake Pyrrhus's hand. Well done, Captain. She knew what they'd be saying as soon as the bridge hatches closed behind her. They'd be expressing surprise that old iceberg face could go around patting backs and showing sympathy. Combat did that to her. She had a brief period of dropping her guard, and then she was back to normal, a politician who used to be a competent naval officer and still missed fleet action. The hyperspace vista from her cabin viewport was soothing. Sometimes she picked a streak of starlight that was stretched into a line and tried to think of it as a star with orbiting planets full of life and picture what was happening there. She did it now to clear her mind before deciding what to say to Cal Lomas. She knew she had to give him an ultimatum, and to make it stick, she needed Jason Solo to stand by her. 
GAG Headquarters, Coruscant. Captain Heol Girden smiled and beckoned Ben into a dark office. Somehow the two elements combined into Ben's least favorite way to spend an afternoon. Behold, he said, and Ben's eyes adjusted to the low light. There were no windows. The only illumination was from banks of holoscreens and monitors. Ben realized there were GAG troopers sitting at consoles, with that glaze of defocused concentration that looked like blank boredom. The eyes and ears of the guard. Welcome to the monitoring center. The ultimate in scrutiny. Sir, whispered one of the lieutenants, keep the noise down, will you? Geardin's grin was picked out in blue by the light from a frequency analyzer. They're all such artists. He steered Ben by his shoulder, taking him to an alcove away from the active consoles. Girden probably didn't realize how well a Jedi could navigate in darkness, but Ben humored him. This is where we keep an eye on senators and other social misfits for their own good. Whose calls do you tap? Ben felt uneasy about it. I bet it's not even exciting. All government staff. Our special list of probable and proven scumbags. And politicians, said Girden. And given the number of senators and the volume of hot air they emit, we get automated voice recognition systems to do it, or we'd be here for the next thousand years. If the droid picks up any key words of interest, it tags the conversation and alerts us. Then we have to sit and actually listen to it. One of the troopers, Zavirk, was ladling sweetener into a cup of calf. He sipped it gingerly looking slightly comical with an audio buffer lead dangling from his ear. "'I joined the army to see the galaxy,' he whispered. "'But all I got was eight-hour watches of listening to weird politicians making appointments to Ben's Fourteen, Girden said. "'Well, if you want him to do monitoring, he's going to hear stuff that'll make his hair curl, sir.' Ben had never considered what tapping comlinks of suspects and people in sensitive posts actually entailed. "'I won't faint,' he said. "'And if I'm old enough to get shot at, I'm old enough to hear... stuff.' "'Can't argue with that logic.' Girden sat him down at a console and gave him an earpiece. "'Okay.' The screen here shows you the sound files the droids lined up is worth listening to, as well as holocam footage. You just work through it and make notes if anything seems worth following up. You're looking for anyone who might be contacting senators and seems a bit odd. Any conversations about senators or government staff? Look, you're a Jedi. You've probably got a sixth sense about this stuff— just like you have about hidden explosives. So do neck battle dogs, said Zavirk. But Lieutenant Skywalker smells better, and he can do tricks. Ben decided he might like it here for a while. It didn't feel like Spy HQ at all, just a bunch of troopers he knew well doing a routine wartime surveillance job. Ben realized he'd partitioned his feelings so that he didn't have to think about Durgedjan as a person. The man had a wife and child. Tenel Ka had a child, too, though, and Gedjan had been happy to hire someone to assassinate her. Ben had been weighing the morality of his mission, and wasn't sure if he was only telling himself what he wanted to hear. And there was nobody he could talk it over with. He settled in his seat to begin checking recordings— and tried not to think about Gedjin. The conversations, mostly boring, some bizarre, a few incomprehensible, almost lulled him into meditation. It was an effort not to try hiding in the Force again, something he now practiced whenever he could. The monitoring center smelled strongly of calf. 
Ben felt in need of some too, after a few hours, and he lost himself in a conversation between two government staff about the regular route that a certain senator took from the Senate to her apartment. But he was jerked out of his concentration by a rustle of fabric and quiet, intense activity at another console. Xavier had summoned Girdin, and they both looked grim. Ben paused to listen. You sure? Girdin asked. Run a voice profile if you don't believe me, Xavier said. That's the Corellian PM. There were ten people in the room, and they'd all stopped to listen. Gedjin's soothingly persuasive voice, with its faint accent, was telling someone that there was no point doing this through the usual channels, because nobody else was in a negotiating mood. You and I know that this could be solved by the removal of a few hotheads. Some of our military needs slapping down, and so do some of yours. I'd call an immediate ceasefire if I could be assured of a few things. Such as, said the unmistakable voice of Chief of State Omis. They were tapping the Chief of State's secure comm line. Ben wasn't sure they had authorization to do that. We'll agree that Corellia pools its military assets with the GA, as long as we have an opt-out clause that says we have the right to withdraw it if our own needs are more urgent. Neothel has to go. Jason Solo has to go. Once that's out of the way, we're back to normal and you've got what you want. Center point. Well, we're having problems repairing it anyway. Center point has to be made inoperative. A pause, too brief even for most people to notice. But Ben did. It already is. But if you want a multiplanetary force or observers there, fine. What about the Bothans? And the other planets fighting their own wars. I can bring the Kaminorians into line, and the Bothans. Well, once we're all back in the GA, then Bathawi's got to toe the line. The little people? If the fighting gets out of hand, we'll commit troops to put a stop to that. The Senate won't agree to this. Take Neothel and Solo out of the equation first, and they'll calm down. What's left of the Senate, anyway? Take out. They won't go quietly. They might split the Senate. Gasil's totally in their camp, and he's got weight. Well, there's take out, and take out. Omis swallowed, but didn't respond. Gedjin filled the silence. You know we have a job to do before this draws in the whole galaxy. Okay. Okay. We need to meet. Can you get to Vulpter? Long pause. I'll find an excuse. Send me the details. Girdin stood looking at the screen, as if he could get some sense out of it if he stared long enough. Zavirk sat with his chin propped on his hand, gazing up at the captain for orders. Get a transcription of that to Colonel Solo right away. Ben still wasn't clear what was happening, even though he thought Omis should have mentioned the approach to the Security Council. Can't the Chief of State talk to the Corellian Prime Minister? Depends what he's talking about, said Girdin and what he has in mind for Colonel Solo and Admiral Neothel. If Gedjin could plot the assassination of the Queen Mother of Hapes and have Thrak and Sal Solo killed, then making Jason and Neothel disappear was just another routine job for him. Ben knew he had his answer about the necessity of his mission. Girdin leaned over Zavirk and tapped the console. 
That conversation was four hours ago. Better check on the Chief of State's travel arrangements, because he hasn't informed us he's going off-world, and needs a close protection squad. You think he needs one? asked Ben. With Gedjin, he needs two. Ben didn't know if he could mention Tenelka. It was always hard knowing who knew what inside the G.A.G. Would he really try something with Chief Omus? I think he does it out of habit. Just like I chew nerve sticks. Ben now had no idea if Cal Omus was bypassing the Senate illicitly to do a personal deal with the enemy, or walking into a trap like the one Gedjin had set for Tenel Ka and Uncle Han's late, unlamented cousin, Thraken. Jason was right, as ever. Gedjin had to be stopped. Supreme Commander's Office, Senate Building, Coruscant Jason read the transcript a third time and laid his datapad down on Neofel's desk. She had a hologram of Moan Cal on the wall behind her, all shimmering blue ocean and sinuous buildings emerging from the waves in floating cities. He wondered if she was homesick. Right now she was fresh back from a battle that hadn't gone as planned, and impatient to see Cal Omis about it. That meant she was receptive to ideas. He made a conscious effort not to influence her, because she wasn't the kind to fall for Jedi tricks, and it would only provoke her. Nothing like a united front in wartime. He leaned back in the chair, fingers meshed behind his head. So we're not the flavor of the month. Our glorious leader didn't exactly spring to our defense. Neofel's white uniform didn't look crumpled, even though she'd just disembarked from a warship fresh from a battle. Smacks of ingratitude, I'd say. She wasn't one for humor. Jason knew enough about Moon Cal body language now to know she was angry. She kept rolling her head slightly, as if she was getting hot and her collar was pinching her neck. Her nostrils flared. That meant she was ripe for a few radical suggestions about Omus. He laid the bait. You realize that when Gedjin says someone has to go... He doesn't mean a golden handshake and a framed certificate thanking them for loyal service. Spit it out, Jason. He was behind Sal Solo's premature death. She narrowed her eyes, heavy with sarcasm. I'm shocked, I tell you. Shocked! And the attempt on the Hapen Queen Mother's life. My lover... Mother of my daughter, my little darling, I wish I could see them. We're next. Neofel's nostrils closed tight for a second. It was a giveaway with Moan Cows, a little sign that said they were surprised, and not in a good way. He wouldn't be stupid enough to try that. Right now I don't know what he'd try. Omus isn't a fool, she said. He must have a good idea of what he's dealing with. What do you think he's up to? All he wants to do is hold the Alliance together. He always thinks a few raps over the knuckles can bring naughty governments into line. Well, it didn't work with Corellia. And now he's watching the Alliance shrink a planet at a time. She kept looking at the chrono on her desk. My rules say we should notify the chair of the Security Council about the meeting. He's beginning to feel sidelined as it is. I'm not sure what outcome that will have, though. Jason kept Gisele sweet by delivering results on terrorism and not telling him anything he would have to deny knowing later. If he had serious designs on Omis's job... He hadn't shown any sign of it. Yet. 
Senator Gassil would simply task me to take care of it, Jason said. I'm saving him the trouble of knowing. Plausible deniability. Do you enjoy the irony? What? Bypassing the Senate, about our head of state bypassing the Senate. Nice job with the procurement amendment, by the way. Slipped through like an oiled eel. Neofel got up and wandered around her office. Long, webbed, bony fingers clasped behind her back. She had that upright bearing all the G.A. military had, regardless of species or spinal arrangement. Now that we both have the ability to vary statutes, any statutes within budgetary limits, I imagine you've given its potential plenty of thought. Jason wanted her to stand still and look at him, but she continued her slow amble around the office. She plays these games beautifully. I'll have to be careful not to cross her. It's an emergency kit, he said. If we need to, we can change any minor law. And we can also change any big one, if we play this smart. We, not I. He thought it important to emphasize that they were partners. For example, if H.M. 3 were to amend the Emergency Measures Act to include in its scope the G.A.G.'s powers to detain heads of state, politicians, and any other individuals believed to be presenting a genuine risk to the security of the Galactic Alliance, and to seize their assets via the Treasury Orders Act, then I suspect people would look at Prime Minister Gedgen and nod approvingly. You even talk like a legislator now. But am I right? Neothel turned. She couldn't smile like a human, but the amusement was written all over her face in a slight compression of the lips. Jason felt her shift from her perpetual wariness and impatience to a satisfied warmth, even triumph, for a brief moment. That nobody will think of asking if the chief of state of the G.A. is covered by that amendment? Yes, Jason, you're right. She made a gesture, holding her hand like a blade and weaving it through imaginary water. That eel of yours will slip through again. If I feel we have to... act to restore stability and security. Will you be standing with me? Will you stage a coup with me? Did I really say that? Neofel did pause, but it wasn't the taken-aback pause of someone shocked by an outrageous proposal. Just a moment of sizing up Jason Solo. You might have the G.A.G. behind you, Jason. But you need the fleet, too, don't you? And the rest of the army. Is that a yes? It's an if things get worse. I put my allegiance to the G.A. before my allegiance to an individual. I'm... Interested to see that the military will cross the line from carrying out the government's will into deciding policy. In case you forget, said Neofel softly, the Office of Supreme Commander effectively combines the role of Defense Secretary and the Chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. I am a politician. I also happen to be the most senior military officer. She was his equal in maneuvering, but she didn't have force powers. He hoped he would never have to point that out to her. It's time we had a chat with Omis, then. Jason stood up and brushed down his black G.A.G. fatigues with his hands. Just to be certain... For all we know, he might be meeting Gedgen to whip out a blaster himself, 
and effect another Corellian regime change. Neafel followed him into the corridor that led to the chief of state suite. Elegant blue and gold marble and niche-studded walls with fine statues from across the galaxy. Jason found his heart pounding. Although he could control it, he let it race because it made him feel alive and human. These were momentous times, and if he cut himself off completely from normality, he might forget the magnitude of his task and the stakes. How can I forget Ben has to die? When Jason thought in words, when he heard himself in his mind, he realized how his language was shifting. He was distancing himself from the reality. Ben has to die. It felt very different from, I have to kill him. Perhaps the Force was telling him it wouldn't be a simple betrayal of Ben's trust delivered with a lightsaber, but death by another route. If it has to happen, perhaps not by my hand. The doors to the Chief of State's suite slid open, and he walked into the quiet, thickly carpeted reception room with Neafel at his side. Not behind, not ahead, but exactly level with him. Omis was leaning over his aide's desk, talking in hushed tones. "'I'm sorry to have kept you waiting,' he said, looking up. "'Do come in.' Jason moved his chair so he wasn't forced to squint at Omis against the light from the window. So did Neofel. It was an eloquent, silent statement of who would have the upper hand. And they hadn't rehearsed it. Omis, a man finely attuned to the subtleties of body language and psychological advantage, radiated wariness in the Force. He knew he was dealing with a united front. You've seen the battle report, I take it? Neofel said. Yes. Omis reached for a data pad, as if to reassure her that he had. Whether it was lucky timing on the Bothans' part, or a smart trap, the real issue now is how we deal with a Bathawi that's becoming even better armed and aggressive. Actually, it does matter if it was lucky or not, said Jason because it goes to the heart of the quality of our intelligence. I'm not happy with the quality of G.A. Intel, which, if you recall, is why I wanted to form the G.A.G. from selected personnel. Intel isn't up to the task we face now. Omis looked weary. Okay, you've both got a complaint. Who's first? Neofel inclined her head politely, but Jason could feel her resolution forming a box around her almost like durasteel. It was tangible. I'll keep it brief, she said. We can't get involved in every little skirmish to keep obscure senators and tin-pot heads of state in the Alliance. We're at overstretch. We couldn't maintain the Corellian blockade. And now we have the Boffins ramping up. Pick your battles, Chief of State. I can't fight them all. Omus did his displacement act and poured himself a cup of calf from the jug on his desk. There was just one cup, and he didn't offer more. If we fail to show support to Alliance member worlds, then we lose them, he said. This is basic numbers. We've been through all this. If more secede, then we've lost. The issue of how we maintain a joint defense force for the Alliance, which is what started this, in case we forget, then becomes academic. If we don't concentrate our forces on the worlds that present the most immediate and serious threat, then we'll be ground down a ship at a time and we might not even be able to defend Coruscant if it comes to the worst. 
You think it might come to that? Omus didn't appear convinced. He glanced at Jason, but Jason kept his counsel. Is this about Coruscant in the end? Of course it is, Neothel said. It always is. The Alliance and Coruscant are indivisible, and that's half the problem for all the other worlds. Omus turned to Jason. Your turn, Colonel. I share the Admiral's fears about overstretch. Now Jason slipped in his challenge, subtle and multi-layered, to give Omus a chance to come clean. He found himself hoping Omus didn't take it. Corellia is still the heart of this. I say we devote all our resources in the immediate term to an all-out assault on Corellia. Invasion, in fact. Destroy their industrial base and remove Gedjin and his cronies. The man's already had his predecessor killed and made an attempt on the Hapen Queen Mother. Jason paused a beat, because timing was everything. I've no doubt you'll be next. Jason felt Neofel's reaction, although her expression was set in neutral. Amusement, plus a little anxious excitement, like preparing for battle. Omus felt suddenly more wary. But Jason couldn't tell if that was aimed at him, or at the idea that Gedjin might be setting Omus up. You have intelligence to suggest that? Omus asked. Jason shook his head. No, and I don't need it, or help from the Force to work it out. It's how Gedjin does business. If we launch that kind of assault on Corellia, it's something I should take to the Security Council. And even if they agree to it, we're at war. You have all the legal powers to determine the conduct of the war with Admiral Neothel as you see fit. Until it costs more credits, said Omus. And once we are conspicuously focused on Corellia, what are Bathawi and Commonor going to do? Answers on a small piece of flimsy, please. Omus had the perfect excuse now to admit to the meeting with Gedjin. He could have said that he was going to give peace talks one last try. He could have said anything to indicate that he was going to talk terms with a state that showed no signs of understanding the words common good, and whose quietly lethal leader could have scared a hut ganglord. And, Jason thought, any smart politician might have suspected that his intelligence service spied on him, just as they spied on all the other senators. A little game of words— Omus could have made the suggestion and watched Jason's reaction, brazening it out to test if his clandestine call had been picked up. But he didn't, and his future and his fate were sealed. So where are we going with this? Neofel asked. Same strategy? Keep dividing up the fleet until we have one ship per theater? I think a full assault on Corellia is madness, said Omus. We might well have to consider it, but much later. In the meantime, my priority is to stop secessions from the Alliance from reaching the tipping point. Jason sat feigning suppressed anger and disappointment. It had to be subtle— because Omus knew Jason's capacity for smiling self-control. But Omus needed to pick up the faintest whiff of dissent and savor it for a few moments. His suspicions would be aroused if Jason caved in too readily. Jason placed his hands squarely on the arms of the Apasha wood chair and eased himself to his feet. For the record... I think this is a big mistake, sir, he said. 
and I would be happier if GAG could support our intelligence community in their efforts beyond Coruscant. I note your views, Colonel Solo, and I'm grateful for your strategic input so far. Omis meshed his fingers and leaned on the desk, a gesture that said defensive more than it said resolute. The GAG's remit is domestic, though. I appreciate your concern for the quality of our intelligence. Jason didn't catch Neothel's eye. He walked out, followed closely by her, and said nothing until they were back in her office. Well? Not good, she said. She wandered up to the window to watch the traffic streaming in orderly lines in the sky lanes around the Senate District. Not exactly open with us, is he? I never told him we have GAG personnel operating on Corellia. So we're even. We can't sustain the current strategy. Perhaps I should talk to Senator Gassil and get it referred to the Security Council. And then we divert our energies into an internal power struggle with Omus, while we have a war to fight. I'm sure I don't have to tell you that if you take a shot at someone, you keep firing until they can no longer return fire. Wound them, and you have an angry enemy who knows your position. I know where you're heading with this, Jason. You know I'm right. That doesn't make it any easier. If he does a deal with Gedjin, we're not just back to square one. The Alliance is in a worse position than when it started. And we'll be out of the game. That's academic. Jason almost asked Neothel if she had children, and then realized he had almost done the most stupid thing imaginable reveal his constant fears for the future of his own daughter, a child whose paternity had to stay hidden. He recovered fast, astonished at his weakness. Because the game will be recurring wars. Or Omis might end up with a vibra-blade in his throat. He's insane to meet Gedjin face to face without close protection anyway. He hasn't asked for it from us. He hasn't asked CSF either. GA Intel? No. We tap their comms, too. You're a source of constant revelation, Jason Solo. Are you in? Say it. Jason looked around the room, trying to look as if he was simply thinking but suspicious that someone else might be doing to him what he did to them. Eavesdrop electronically. Was Neothel setting him up? No. He was sure he could sense bugs in a room. There were none. You know what I'm proposing. I don't, actually. Not in detail. Say it. Regime change. Too late. But he couldn't sense any risk. His logical brain was the paranoid whispering voice, not his force senses. He realized he'd become less instinct-driven and more rational. And that was the problem. Thinking too much, feeling too little. Just like Lumia says. We remove him from office long enough to get this war won, and then hand it back to Senator Gassil when the situation is stable so that new elections can take place. His words emerged like uninvited strangers, and he didn't even believe himself. Neothel made a little splutter that could have been laughter. I get the removal. It's the gap in the middle between remove and elections that fascinates me. We run the GA during the interim as a duumvirate. 
No dictatorship. Joint control. Neothel indicated her uniform, and then reached out to jab a bony finger into the rank tab on his shoulder. Military coup. That's what it's called. Let's not prevaricate. Okay. I remove him, and you take over. Alone. I don't think so. Do umver it sounds best to me. Jason liked two. Two was the Sith way. Knowing the awful's ambition for the chief's office, he'd have the same circling, edgy power struggle with her as a Sith master with an apprentice who was expected and encouraged to plot to overthrow him. But he would rule as Sith Lord in due course, when the G.A. and elections were academic, and she would administer the state. That would satisfy her. I'll take care of Gedjin, by the way, he said. He's a massively destabilizing influence, and removing him will throw Corellia into disarray. How will you take care of Omis? I'll remove him by house arrest. Deposed heads of state tend to become martyrs and hostages. We can't be seen to kill our own, and framing Gedjin for it did occur to me, but it's not necessary. We need to show ourselves as civilized people working within the law. With a coup. Under the law, as the law will stand, it won't be. Ah, I forgot. No, she hadn't. He knew that. Your amendment to the law. I'm tabling it for next week. Through HM3. And in the meantime? Leave that to me. I'll have someone there when Omis meets Gedjin. Jason checked his datapad. He needs only a day to do his business with Gedjin. No more. So, my people have him under surveillance, ready to move. Then we have evidence to present to Gisil. And then you arrest him. I was thinking I might arrest him at the same time you present the evidence to Gisil. When we move, we have to move fast. No room to be outmaneuvered. Neothel let out a long breath. Jason waited. I'll be ready to move on your signal. Make sure you keep me up to speed with all this, won't you? It was done. Jason's takeover was in place. He had the G.A.G. at his back, and the Athel would deliver the fleet as well as the army. With the right presentation of Omis selling out to the Corellians, it would be a very orderly coup. There was no need for unnecessary bloodshed. That was what this was all about, an end to violence, chaos, and instability. That was worth everything he was risking. Jason took an air taxi back to a plaza a few minutes' walk from the GAGHQ. Just another citizen, no sleek black GA transport, no privilege. Either the driver didn't recognize the uniform, or he hesitated to say... Here, you're the chief of the secret police, aren't you? It was a silent, contemplative journey. It was time to make sure nothing went wrong. If manifest destiny could go wrong. He opened his comlink and called Lumia. Shira, he said, aware of the pilot up front. I need you to do a job for me. Chapter 7 Goron, in Fett's absence, I think you really ought to see this. I don't think it can wait. 
Sometimes the Vongis do you a favor. Site foreman Herrick Vorod, on examination of excavated rock from land north of Enseri, Mandalore. Safe house, Coruscant. So you're going to do it before you achieve your full Sith powers, said Lumia. She lit the candles and closed the blinds. Jason needed to shut out the world and feel what was happening. He was running increasingly on a mundane agenda, the agenda of the lesser beings he worked with. Why? If I do it afterward, when might afterward be? Jason watched the flames shimmering and settled down cross-legged on a floor cushion, but his eyes kept wandering away from the focus of concentration, and Lumia felt obliged to rap him sharply on the top of his head and point at the candle. Omus is doing a deal with Gedjin. The deal excludes me and Neathel, possibly in a rather terminal way. Working in the world of those who couldn't use the Force, Jason was falling into conniving and manipulating just like them. And while Lumia didn't think that was a bad thing, all tools were valid to achieve the outcome, he was letting himself be bound by their rules. He was talking about timing. He had full mastery of the Force, but he seemed to enjoy using the limited tricks of ordinary people. The Admiral was irrelevant in the long term. He had to be aware of that. Neothel is afraid of you, Jason. Or at least wary. Don't you think I know that? She'd be an idiot if she trusted anyone at this level of government. You waste too much energy playing mundane's games instead of using the Force. I'll use it when I need to. Most of the time now it's overkill. Jason always seemed to want to prove how much smarter, how much more skilled he was than his adversaries, how he could beat them on their own terms. Vanity wasn't always a bad thing in a Sith, as long as it didn't control him. It was just a matter of getting him to pause and refocus, Meditate, said Lumia. Jason stared through her for a moment, and then stared unblinking at the candle until he eventually closed his eyes. He opened one eye slowly, looking as if he might be about to make a joke. Lumia didn't feel in a humorous mood. Actually, I called you for a reason, he said. I know. But I'd like to approach this like force users, not like some tedious little committee in the Senate. It was time to remind him he still had one more step to take before he could begin to teach her anything. Calm yourself and put the world to one side. Jason shut his eyes again, and for once seemed to relax enough to allow a little of his state of mind to filter through the barrier that he now kept in place most of the time. Lumia sensed the solid confidence and focus that typified him. But there was still the faintest hint of the old Jason, wounded by bereavement and pain, scared of doing necessary things. That was the last tinge of doubt and reluctance that his final step would erase. It would enable him to cross the line into his full Sith legacy. She didn't know when afterward might be either, or even who. She only knew it was soon. You don't need to play their games, Jason, she said softly. Even now, your powers put you far beyond their reach. Omus can't touch you, neither can Gedjin. When you achieve your destiny, 
they'll be less than irrelevant. Powers or not, I can't control a galaxy on my own. I need to persuade, to carry people with me. The Force can't affect the minds of millions. Ah, you enjoy the power you can wield with simple mind games. Don't make Palpatine's mistakes. That's an indulgence. It's not worthy of you. Jason, she said, I want you to take stock and feel. Stop overanalyzing. It won't reveal any truths to you. Just facts. Facts only show you what you want to see. Jason opened his eyes again. But it's so fleeting. The line between a crazy impulse and guidance from the Force is getting harder to draw. Because you think about it too much. The impenetrable wall went up again. Lumia felt it as he lapsed into silence. It's Ben, he said at last. It has to be Ben. Now she understood. You're fond of the boy. Perhaps he's the child you don't have. This will be hard, and that's probably why it has to be him. For a moment, Jason's gaze flickered, too brief, too insignificant for any ordinary observer to spot, and she knew she'd hit a nerve. That was it. Conscious of his own mortality, he wanted a son, and there was a little subconscious desire to possess what was Luke's as part of the overthrow of the Jedi dynasty. Now that he had it, and Ben looked at him as a heroic father figure, he had to throw away that prize. It was an odd sort of love, but if it was powerful enough, it would do fine. That's probably it, Jason said, and looked down at his clasped hands. And it's hard to kill someone who doesn't deserve it. But you don't know how it'll happen. Exactly. You can't see yourself taking a lightsaber to a fourteen-year-old boy. Maybe it won't be so literal. I'm sending him to assassinate Dur Gedjin when he meets Omas to do his deal. It's a job that needs doing. It tests Ben's skills and commitment. It's far easier for a teenage boy to get past Gedjin's security. And... Perhaps it will put him in real mortal danger. Jason reached out to the low table nearby, leaning on one hand to stretch and pick up one of the candles in its transparent blue holder. Now is that a consequence of the task? Or is that why I'm sending him? Am I sending him to his death? Let it play out, Lumia said. Stop rationalizing and let it happen. She stood up to take the candle from him. She could see he wanted to play that brinkmanship game again of how long he could hold his hand in the flame. Some men would do it out of bravado after too many drinks, but Jason was testing himself a private struggle rooted in his experience of pain at Verger's hands and his lingering doubts that he could stay the course and make himself do something he wanted to run from. I need your help, he said. I need you to distract Mara for a while. Whatever you wish. She's taken the Brescia story to heart. Nothing like killing someone's child to guarantee a blood feud, is there? 
I thought that story might tie her up and explain my presence. In an ideal world, I would have avoided all contact with the Skywalkers. So, why did you offer your hand to Luke, instead of taking his head off? Lumia was still considering that. She might not have meant Luke any harm, but she didn't have to hate someone to kill him in the line of duty. Did it matter that he still thought all her actions were dictated by an old romance, and by a trauma that had been her destiny anyway? Why did she feel the need to show him they weren't? It certainly had its shock value in the fight, she said, and killing him would have changed the course of events for all of us. And you wanted to put him in his place, show him he had no leverage, that you were over him? Jason sometimes seemed to understand, and then he'd say something banal like that, which made her think he had missed the point of passing through powerful emotions to become stronger. The Skywalkers are too mired in their domesticity to be effective Jedi, Jason she said. It's a warning to us all. Luke can't see what's in front of him because he thinks my motive is lost love and revenge, because that's the level he thinks at. Family and friends. It would never occur to him that I want to see a Sith-controlled galaxy, and that the personal issues we had are trivial by comparison. You taught me that anger and passion are what makes Sith strong. There's anger, and then there's being controlled by it, not seeing the forest for the trees. Lumia had a moment of self-doubt and decided to meditate on it later. So what about Mara? She's hanging on to that G.A.G. connection she found to track you. Keep her occupied elsewhere. I'll let her find me. That should do the trick. Can you give me a possession of Ben's? Something that would prove to Mara that I could get at him easily, without being traceable to you? I'll get you a pair of his boots. He keeps several pairs in his locker, and Mara already suspects a G.A.G. connection. He gave her a little frown of concern, but she felt nothing emanating from him. What if she actually catches you? I might win. And anyway, it'll buy you time. Lumia was still testing herself to see if she resented Jason for leaving her to die, too. I'm expendable, as you've proven— my life's purpose is to enable you to become a Sith Lord, because that secures the stability of the galaxy. The ambition of most beings is just to stay alive, overeat, spend too much, and avoid hard work. I'm happy that I can achieve much more than that. And we all die sooner or later. A death in service of a great ideal is a fine thing. Jason gave her a long, blank stare, and she wondered if the idea of an eternal principle being more important than the short confines of his own mortal life was alien to him. He had to pass beyond that. He would. When you think of Ben's fate— she said. Think of the legacy you'll leave in years to come, and ask who'll be able to name the Skywalkers, or even the Solos. This is about the fate of trillions upon trillions for millennia to come, not one small family over a few decades. Jason got to his feet, but Lumia could tell he was looking at her without seeing her now. I'll keep telling myself that, he said. 
The boots will get Mara's attention for sure. I think I'll play up the maternal grief and do something emotional, too. What are you going to do when Mara and Luke come after you? When they find out about Ben in due course? I'll deal with that when I have to. It might be sooner than you think. I suggest you make sure you're properly armed. I have quite an armory, said Jason, and I'll be ready when the time comes. Think laterally, Lumia said gently. Luke can still take you in a lightsaber fight. I'm already a few steps ahead of him. Trust me. She had to. The future of the galaxy depended on Jason. He was the end of chaos and the beginning of order. And, like all forces of change, he would not be hailed by everyone as a savior. Some wouldn't see how necessary he was. Some would try to stop him. She would do whatever it took to clear his path, even if the price was her own life. Surveillance Center, G-A-G-H-Q, Coruscant Captain Geardon loomed in the doorway, backlit by the light from the corridor. Showtime, he said. Neothel's just been designated as acting chief of state as of midnight. The troopers on duty in the listening post looked up. Ben detached the bead amplifier in his ear and tried to make sense of that news. What's happened to Omus? He's going to be out of the office for a day. Oh, I thought... He has to give a little notice to hand over the reins of state to Neothel when he's out of contact. You know, command codes, that kind of stuff. So we have a window for his trip to Vulpter. Tomorrow. It was all moving too fast. Ben could recall feeling excited by the turmoil of events, but now that he was part of them, they were too fast for his comfort. They brought him closer to his mission. He wasn't relishing the prospect. He knew how he'd felt after killing a suspect he thought was armed, so he could work out that he wouldn't be any happier after dispatching Gedjin. I'm an assassin, and everyone else my age who isn't a Jedi is in school. What cover story has he given? Ben asked. Private medical matter. Yeah, saving his backside, said Zavirk. I think this is the opportunity you've been waiting for, Ben. Geardon beckoned to him. Come on, briefing room. He turned to Zavirk. I want to know his itinerary to Vulpter. He won't be taking us along but he'll still need transport, a minder, and a pilot. So let's keep an eye on the logistics. Betty takes an intel zombie or two with him for company. Well, we're keeping an eye on them, too, so that'll help us triangulate, won't it? Get to it, trooper. The captain strode off down the corridor whistling, which was unlike him. Ben hadn't realized Geardon disliked Omis so much. Maybe he just enjoyed a really major hunt. It couldn't get much bigger than tailing the chief of state to an illicit meeting with the enemy. There was no hate in Geardon, just a wonderful sense of focus and excitement. Ben wondered if darkness was as easy to spot as Jedi seemed to think. But what's darkness? Killing Gedjin? The worst thing about growing up was that there were fewer right or wrong answers every day. It wasn't a math test. When they reached the briefing room, Chevu and Lecauf were already there, poring over a wall full of illuminated holodisplays. displays. Lecauf, looking far from comfortable in his brand new lieutenant's rank insignia, gave Ben a nervous grin. Our source in Coronet confirms that Gedjins rescheduled all his engagements for tomorrow said Chevu. It's on, for sure. Timetable? 
no outbound timings, but he expects to be back in time for a meeting by 0800 the next day. The displays on the walls showed two sets of charts and data. One was Coruscant, the other Corellia. Ben checked off the list of surveillance points. Omis's private residence, the security cams from the Senate offices, the handful of private landing pads nearest to both, and a tally of flight plans filed for Vulpter. The Corellian status board also showed recent flight plans logged with that planet as a destination. What if Omis breaks his journey somewhere and doesn't fly straight to Vulpter? Ben asked. That's where marrying it up with arrivals and flight plans for Vulpter helps. Lekauf pointed to a data pad on the table. Check that out. Even if the flight doesn't originate from Coruscant, we can run checks to see what's arriving with Coruscant as its point of departure within that time window. The boring number crunching stuff, said Girdin. Don't worry. A computer's narrowing down the choices. Once we spot Omis moving, or even Gedjin, then we put a tail on them. Easier to tail Omis, but we might get a break from Gedjin. How? We have an informant in the Corellian government building. This is the thing about information, Ben. It's not a case of finding a big X on a chart labeled The Secret Meeting Is Here. It's actually about assembling a lot of apparently routine stuff that's not secret at all and looking for the patterns. Ben watched the flight plans from Coronet appearing on the screen. Any neutral pilot entering Corellian airspace could get access to this. Anybody could get information from ATC on Vulpter. And Coruscant ATC was an open book, available from any data port. There was a daunting amount of data, but a computer or a droid could sift through it just as they sifted through the thousands of comlink calls to flag those that were worth the scrutiny of flesh and blood. It was just a matter of setting the parameters right. Ben wasn't sure why he was here, other than to learn the tedious and painstaking side of the job. Chevu and Lecauf seemed to be planning an interception. They're just working out how we get you close enough to Gedjin. Girdin seemed to assume Ben knew what he was talking about. And that has to be after he's finished his meeting with Omis, because the boss wants the evidence of the meeting for the Security Council. Revelation dawned. Ben had hoped he'd have more preparation time. But this was it. We're doing the hit at the same time as the meeting? Not when he's on the way back, or... We might not get another chance to take a crack at Gedjin away from his home turf. Lekauf beckoned to Ben and made him look inside a fabric holdall leaning against the wall. Like it? Ben couldn't work out what it was at first, but when he took it from the bag, it turned out to be a rifle with a folding stock. He unfolded it and snapped the stock into place, staring at it in numb realization. It's a modified Karpaki 50, Lekauf said, totally misreading Ben's reaction to the weapon. Can't leave lightsaber marks all over Gedjin, can we? Bit of a giveaway. You're now going to make a very fast acquaint of a ballistic sniper rifle. You know, projectiles. If you're trying to get me close to Gedjin, why do I need a sniper weapon? In case we can't. Come on, let's get in a few hours on the indoor range. Ben wondered if it was his last chance to refuse. But he knew he couldn't. If Shevu was taking part in this, and Shevu was dead straight, a man the other officers described as an old-fashioned kind of cop, then it had to be the right thing to do. Girdin responded to his chirping comlink. It was Zavirk, judging by the side of the conversation that Ben could hear. Girdin slid the comlink back in his pocket a big grin on his face. Intelligence is sending a couple of handlers with Omis, he said. Just overheard their arrangements. O five hundred start, leaving from his private landing pad and transferring to an unmarked intelligence cutter in Coruscant orbit. Sneaky, eh? But it helps when you know their code names for various VIPs. He checked his chrono. If I ever end up back in intelligence... 
Remind me to make them better. Got to go. Shavu raised an eyebrow. He loves his work. Are you okay with this? Ben asked. Okay with what? Gedjin. I'm not a spook, Shavu said. Never was. But if Gedjin has Omis killed, it'll destabilize the whole GA. So I'm okay with it. Do you think he will? I'd want proof that he wouldn't. Personally, I think we should blow our cover and stop Omis from going. But that just compromises our whole operation. So we're riding along with you to make sure Omis gets home in one piece. Shavu never made any comments on whether he thought Omis was a traitor betraying the G.A. or a visionary taking a massive risk for peace. He didn't get involved with politics and opinions. He just stuck to the law as best he could. And that wasn't easy in the G.A.G. What are you waiting for? Shavu asked. I just wondered if you think I'm right to do this. That's not my call. Shevu busied himself with holocharts of Vulpter, opening 3D images of the spaceports and public buildings. You've got your orders. Lekauf gave Ben a nudge in the back. Come on! I've got to turn you into a passable sniper by tomorrow morning. The indoor range had that ozonic discharged blaster smell with a tinge of burned plastoid. Something in the air made Ben's eyes sting. It was an expensive facility that Lekauf said had been cobbled together from equipment originally intended for intelligence. Hologram simulations, regular targets, and even something he called dead meat. I'm not sure I'm going to be much use with a rifle, Ben said. Aw, oh, come on, Lekauf was unconvinced. You're a Jedi. You're not like the rest of us. You've got this visuospatial ability we haven't. My granddad used to tell my dad amazing things about Lord Vader. Really uncanny accuracy in three dimensions, whether he was flying a ship or using a weapon. I used to think Dad was making it up until I saw a real Jedi doing that stuff. Why not a blaster? Loads of reasons. We need overkill. We need something that doesn't light the place up like fireworks. And we want something that can be silenced. Believe it or not... That thing is quite discreet. Ben steadied the Karpaki against his shoulder, sighted up a few times, and took his firing position. He was quite pleased to get that far without making a fool of himself. You seem to have a good opinion of Vader. My granddad thought the world of him. When he got badly burned on a mission and had to be discharged from the Imperial Army, Lord Vader made sure he was taken care of for the rest of his life. Whatever some people say about Vader, monsters don't look out for lieutenants. That's good to know, said Ben. He liked the idea of his grandfather having his kind moments, and that some people still thought well of him. Not everyone had been sympathetic to the rebellion. Ben imagined Vader doing the difficult things that Jason was facing now. And that I'm facing... At the end of the range, a shadowy man walked quickly across Ben's field of view and vanished. Ben's instinctive reaction was that this person was real and breaking safety regulations, so he lowered his weapon and called a warning. Lekauf burst out laughing. Ben, that's your target. That wasn't a hologram. It was solid. Uh, yeah. Lekauf put his hand on the control console and the man walked back into view again to sit on a chair in the target zone. It's a gel form. It's an adjustable droid made of gel and plastoid to mimic flesh and bone. So you... Well, so you get used to a target moving like a real person. That one's been adjusted to match Gedjin's build and gait based on news footage. So you get used to what he'll look like and how he'll probably fall. Ben was transfixed. It was just a dummy, just a clever piece of training technology. He checked it in the force. Yes, it was just a machine. 
but he still felt awful about it. That's pretty yucky. You know how much those things cost? What happens when I shoot? It. It gets up and repairs itself. Okay. Ben found it disturbing to watch the figure walking around in the small bay at the end of the range. Through the rifle's optics, it was clearly a featureless, translucent gel figure with the shadowy framework of artificial bone within. You sure it doesn't feel anything? It just moves, Ben. It doesn't think. It's not even a proper droid, more like a puppet. He looked at the chrono display on the wall. You've got less than nineteen hours to get up to speed. No pressure, then. In your own time, fire when ready. Ben recalled his recent training. Why not center mass? That's the army way. Kill or wound, you've still put the target out of action. Police snipers have to worry about hostages and stuff, so they're trained to incapacitate instantly. Headshot. Assassination doesn't have to be as instant, just dead. But a headshot's still best. Lecalf crooked his forefingers and thumbs five centimeters apart and made a gesture as if he were putting on a blindfold. That's the zone you're aiming at. A five-centimeter band around the head at eye level. Put one in there and you've got a kill. But with the kind of frangible round you'll be using, as long as you hit the head or neck at all, the result's the same. What if I can only get a shot at center mass? He won't respond to cardiopulmonary resuscitation after a round hits him. Believe me. When Lecalf was getting technical... Ben knew he was enjoying his subject. Optimum is still the headshot, though. But there's wind speed and everything. This Karpaki has smart sensor optics, senses the windage and allows for it. They've improved a bit in recent years. If it's that clever, then why do I have to train? To get used to shooting someone who's not trying to kill you, who doesn't even know you're there. Not the Jedi way, is it? It was just a dummy, but it moved like Gedjin. Ben aimed. It was just like using a lightsaber, really, letting the force guide the hand, the eye. He squeezed the trigger as the gel form sat down on the chair, and the round caught the point of its right temple. Gel and fragments plumed in the air, and the dummy slumped forward. Lecalf, arms folded, considered the inert form with the eye of a connoisseur. Ben was taken aback by how uncomfortable it made him feel, especially when the gel form suddenly sat upright, then stood. He was sure he couldn't shoot it a second time. And again? said Lecalf. Ben spent the next hour getting used to anticipating movement, waiting for the gel form to settle for just long enough to take the shot. It was harder than he thought. The dummy made no impression in the force, which limited Ben's senses, and it kept getting up and walking around each time, a distressing gel ghost of a man he was going to kill. There was no emotion in it. That made it hard, but he was getting good single shots. He tried to see it as a technical exercise, like lightsaber drill an action totally separate from the nasty business of taking off heads, and imagined the gel form with the short dark hair of Dur Gedjin. Ben, Lecalf said quietly, I'll be there, and so will Shevu. You've got backup if anything goes wrong. If you can't get at him, or you don't get a clean shot, we'll make sure he drops and stays down. Don't sweat it but that'll expose you to. Like I said, it's just in case things don't go according to plan. Makes sense to build in some contingency, in case we don't get another chance, because it'll be easier than hitting him on Corellia. Ben pondered. We don't even know the location. I could be doing this in the middle of a field or a crowded restaurant. You sabotaged Centerpoint. 
This is going to be a lot easier. When I did that, I still thought it was fun. Come on. You can do it. There was something about Lecauf's faith and admiration that galvanized Ben. He concentrated on the dummy and tried to see himself not as shooting a helpless automaton or even a corrupt politician, but as solving a problem. A couple of hours later, he was hitting the five-centimeter zone ninety-five percent of the time. "'Better have a break now,' Lecauf said. Ben checked to make sure the adjacent lanes were clear and walked up the range to look at the gel form. The more times he'd hit it, the slower the self-repair became. Its internal power supply needed recharging. It was struggling to get up, and Ben found himself increasingly disturbed as he watched the pathetic, anonymous figure scrambling to roll onto its chest and get on all fours. He forced himself to stop looking at it. It was all the worse for there being none of the real aftermath of injury that he'd seen once too often. Lunch, Lecauf called, more insistently this time. Ben wasn't certain he was that hungry. Bevin Vasser Farm, ten kilometers outside Keldabe, Mandalore. Goran Bevin looked up from the trench, a pitchfork in one hand and a muddy grin on his face. It was beginning to rain, and he was up to his ankles in animal dung but it seemed to make him perfectly happy. And they said being acting Mandalore would go to my head, he said, rubbing his nose on his sleeve. So you came home fast, then? Fett kept his distance. Found what I was looking for. You didn't expect me back. I did. Some of the clan chieftains didn't. You have a habit of wandering off for a few years at a time. Bevin heaved himself out of the trench and wiped his palms on the seat of his pants. He looked very, very pleased with himself. If you'd been away any longer, I'd have called you. But since you're back, want to see something amazing? Fett wondered if now was a good time to tell Bevin the truth about his illness. The man had to know sooner or later. He could have formally declared himself Mandalore while Fett was gone, and probably found a lot of support among the clans. But he hadn't. He'd gone on shoveling dung and running his farm. He was happy with his life as it was. The galaxy would have worked better with a few more bevines around. Okay, Fett said. Amaze me. Bevin beckoned, and trudged through the mud toward the farm buildings. The fine drizzle was turning into rain, and the land looked bare, not in the ruined sense of the post-war devastation that blighted so much of the planet, but as if it had settled down to sleep for the coming winter. Despite the derivation of the Fett surname, derived from the word for farmer, and his father's childhood on his parents' Concord Dawn farm, Fett knew nothing about agriculture. He wished he could learn, sometimes, to better understand who his father had once been. Myrta behaving herself? Bevin didn't look back over his shoulder. Well, at least she hasn't tried to kill you again. It's a good sign. Kids can be such a handful. Fett felt the mud suck at his boots. She's a useful pair of fists in a fight. She'll produce wonderfully ferocious great-grandchildren for you, Bobica. Bevin paused a few beats. Fett tried to take in the phrase great-grandchildren, and it left him stranded. So whatever it was you went to do, ended in a fight, did it? Just had to ask questions emphatically. You going to tell me about it? It seemed as good a time as any and Fett didn't see the point of sugarcoating it. I'm terminally ill. Two years, tops. Eight, nine months, if I carry on like this. Bevin still didn't turn around. 
He walked on for a few more meters, head lowered against the rain, and then stopped in his tracks and finally faced Fett. He looked genuinely upset. Fett couldn't recall anyone being upset for him before, except his father. Lack of caring worked both ways. Maybe Sintas had felt for him. He hadn't noticed. You're not going to sit back and let it happen, are you, Bobica? We can do something, surely. Using the way-too-familiar form of his name didn't bother Fett at all now. I found a clone who survived. So they did get a little more out of Ko's sigh than revenge and a few souvenirs then. There's no research data. Just the clone, Jang Skirata. He wouldn't give me a blood sample, but he says he's got good medical resources. Now that Fett was back on Mandalore, and Jang was light years away, though, the whole premise struck him as flimsy. The man hadn't even accepted a meal from him, which would have at least left useful traces of his genetic material on the utensils. Fett had nothing except time counting down and a suspicion that his judgment was failing just like his health. I'll explain later. Why didn't you tell me? I could have tracked some clones for you. Enough of them deserted and ended up here. Ones who'd had the accelerated aging stopped? I don't know. But I could have worked from those leads. Shab, Bobica. Couldn't you have squeezed a little sample out of him anyway? It's done now. And there was never a guarantee that Town We or Bellwine could make anything from it anyway. Bevine looked disappointed for a moment, as if Fett had let the side down by not simply grabbing what he needed. But Jang had been right. Fett needed Town We to decode whatever it was in that clone cells that stopped the degeneration, and Town We would have turned that research over to her new bosses at Arcanian Micro. That was a bad deal for the clone, and a bad deal for Fett because if anyone was going to make credits out of that data, it was him. And Mandalore needed those... Well, there's a funny thing. Now I'm thinking long term. Bevin turned around and started walking again in silence. Fett's news had certainly taken the shine off whatever had made him so happy a little earlier. The farm was a rambling collection of buildings scattered around a stone farmhouse with impressive dirtworks and defensive walls. The other structures, including the outbuilding that Fett was staying in, weren't so well defended, just variations on the traditional circular veillem set in deep pits and so thickly thatched that they were camouflaged. But the farmhouse was the last bastion in the event of an attack. At the back of the building, and connected to it by an underground tunnel, stood a workshop with a smithy. Fett could hear the rhythmic hammering of metal across the clearing. There was no smoke curling from the roof. It vented many meters away to hide the location. And Fett was sure there was a network of tunnels extending a long way into the hills to the west of the farm. It was one of the ways the Mandalorians had fought and beaten the Yuzhan Vong. Bevin walked down the steps cut into the hard-packed soil and leading down to the front door. It opened, and Dinua, his adopted daughter, stood with hands on hips. "'Boots,' she said ominously, pointing at the clods of dung and mud. Two small children clung to her legs. "'You too, Mandalore. And you can take those coveralls off as well, Buir. Okay, okay. Bevin, spy, fixer, veteran commando, was driven back by a resolute woman. But Denua had fought and killed Yuzhan Vong from the age of fourteen, so making a mess on her clean floor wasn't to be attempted rashly. We'll go the long way around. They tramped around the perimeter of the farmhouse 
following the sound of ringing metal. She's a good girl, Bevin said. Just a bit irritable now that Jintar's away fighting. She's not one for staying at home. But the little ones are too young for both parents to be away. So some had already taken mercenary work. Fett didn't think Bevin's farm was doing that badly, but maybe Jintar was too proud to accept his father-in-law's support. But you and Medrit are good with kids. Yeah, but this way one parent stays alive. That was the harsh reality Fett had grown up with. It bred hard people. As the door to the workshop swung open, a blast of warm air registered on his sensors. The interior was bathed in a red glow. Sparks flew in arcing showers. How Bevin stood the noise, Fett would never know. His helmet controls had decided the volume was above danger level and buffered the sound. A mountain of a man in a singlet, burn-scarred leather apron and ear defenders was hammering a strip of red-hot metal. Every time he raised his arm, sweat flew from him and hissed into steam on the hot surfaces. He folded the strip with tongs as he hammered, layering the metal with a steady rhythm that said he was a master armorsmith. After a while, he realized Fett and Bevin were standing watching. He gestured with an impatient jab of his finger to show he was going to finish working the metal before he'd stop to talk. It was actually fascinating. Fett could see from the length and emerging form of the metal bar that he was making a beskad, the traditional saber of the ancient Mandalorians. Bevin had one, an antique blade fashioned from Mandalore's unique iron, beskar. Fett had watched him swing the weapon so hard into a Yuzhan Vong officer that he'd had to stand on him to pull it free. There! Medrit Vasser cooled the rough form of the saber in a tub of hissing liquid and turned it this way and that to check the line. He took off his ear defenders, and his face cracked into a beatific smile of satisfaction as he wiped the sweat from his brow with his forearm. Now that's going to be a thing of beauty. Medica, I haven't told him yet, said Bevin. Shall I blurt it out then? You're the metallurgist. Mondalore, Medrit said stiffly. You're looking at a test forging from a new load of Beskar. It took Fett a slow second to grasp the importance of what Medrit had said. But the Empire strip-mined Mandalore. They took all the iron. They missed a bit. A big bit. How? And how big? This is a big planet, with a tiny population. And even the Imperials didn't survey all of it. They stripped the shallow veins. This is a deeper load, and we'd never have found it if the Vongese hadn't left craters you could sink a small moon in. Medrit picked up a cloth and wiped his face. Fett couldn't feel the full impact of the temperature in the workshop, but Bevin had started sweating visibly. He left a mucky smear across his forehead as he wiped it. There's a crew a hundred clicks north of Inseri, still doing test drills. But it looks like a big, big load that was exposed. Inseri was remote even by Mandalore's standards. No wonder it had taken years to stumble across it. The Yuzhan Vong had used Singularity Ordnance indiscriminately, smashing huge craters across the planet because they wanted to annihilate Mandalore, not conquer it. Fett enjoyed a rare moment of pleasure imagining the look on their vile, arrogant, disfigured faces if they'd known they were helping Mandalore find a new source of the metal that had once made it mighty. Beskar was the toughest metal known to science, even lightsabers had trouble with it. 
There had been a time when every army in the galaxy wanted a supply. It was still the most valuable metal on the market, and there was a war raging around them. I feel a new economic era coming on, said Fett. Bevin winked. Oya, Manda. And it's not on anyone's land. Fett realized the reason he'd never quite got a handle on what Mandalorian government actually meant was because it was so nebulous. This is a resource for Mandalore as a whole. If you say it is, then it is. That's the Mandalore's prerogative. Okay, I say it is. Time to gather the chieftains and do a little forward planning. Shab, said Medrit, underwhelmed by the Mandalore's power to requisition resources. You're sounding just like a proper head of state. Fett would normally have found a family meal and a long explanation of the finer points of metallurgy worse than a spell in the Sarlacc. It was hard enough getting used to having a granddaughter without being besieged by Bevin's noisy, messy, demonstrative family. But that evening, he tolerated it. It's not just the ore, Medrit said drawing an imaginary graph in mid-air with a Nuna drumstick. It's the processing. Part of the strength of the metal is in what's added during smelting and how it's worked. What you saw was just a test batch. Have we got the facilities to do that anymore? Fett wasn't used to eating in front of anyone else. Denua's son and daughter... Shalk and Brila, seven and five, he estimated, stared at him unimpressed across the table. The scrutiny of small children was unnerving. Do we have a windfall we can't exploit? On a small scale, we can do it, Bevin said. I've done a few rough calculations. If the load produces the yield we think it will. We're going to need some help from mining right through to processing. Mandel Motors could process some of it, if they're willing to shift resources from combat craft. But the rest... We need droids. But what are you going to do with it? Dinua asked. What? Sell it for foreign currency? Or use it to arm ourselves? Dinua orphaned on the battlefield like Fett, was a savagely smart woman. Bevin had adopted her the moment her mother was killed. But Fett found that ability to turn strangers into family, that central part of Mandalorian culture, was beyond him. Even Medrit, impatient, critical, short-tempered, had accepted the unexpected addition to their household without a murmur. Adoption was what Mandalorians did and always had. If he can do it, why can't I? With my own flesh and blood, too. We do both, said Fett, trying to stay on the subject. Some manufactured goods for export, some for our own rearmament. You'll find a lot of support for that, Bevin said. Satisfies both camps. What else can I do with the time I have left to me, except leave Mandalore in decent shape? If we've got it, someone will want to take it. You think anyone's stupid enough to try invading like the Empire did? Bevin said. After we kicked Vong Shebs like that? Babuir's cussing said Shalk gravely. Can I say Shebs, too? No, you can't. Denua clicked her teeth in annoyance. Buir, please, not in front of the kids. Mandalore, how are you going to announce the find? Other than the old-fashioned Mondo way, by showing up at the border with an invading army. Do we have to announce it? If we want foreign revenue... We don't have a finance minister, but the job's yours. 
I'm serious. Commission a few starfighters and see who notices, Fett said. Maybe this Kataka has a point, that we don't have to be on one side or the other. There's a third side, as Goron says. It was only courtesy to address him by his first name in his own house. Fett had so little non-hostile interaction with anyone that basic etiquette felt like a minefield. Our own. I could make sure the Arue Tisse notice, said Bevin, but maybe a surprise is better. What kind of surprise? The kind that makes you look up and run for a bomb shelter, Bevin said, with a Mandel Motors logo on the fuselage. We've got no territorial ambitions beyond the sector. We've got at least a dozen planets here to worry about. I know, but take a planet in post-war recovery, an ongoing civil war, and a new find of Beskar, and we might have visitors. If not armed, then at least trying to do deals. Whatever. I don't lose sleep over what... Bevin filled the gap. Arue Tise. Arue Tise, think of us. I'll talk to Yomaget in the morning. See what Mandel Motors can commit. Medrit chewed thoughtfully, staring at Fett. You could have a decent set of Beskar Gam to replace that Durasteel Osik you're wearing, too. It'll last several lifetimes. It only has to last a year, then. Medrit stared at Fett, got no response, and turned to Bevin. He shook his head. Later. Denua took the hint, too. Her kids gazed from face to face, looking for an explanation of what had plunged the grown-ups into silence. Fett was past caring whether anyone knew he was dying. Most wouldn't believe it anyway. It was hard to imagine the mortality of someone whose face you couldn't see. Plenty more, Nuna, Bevin said suddenly, pushing the serving plate of glistening spice-crusted meat in front of him. Home-raised, too. It was never going to be a relaxed family dinner anyway. Just being fat made sure of that. The food was spicier than he was used to, and the portions were too big, but he cleared his plate because these were generous people who gave him a refuge here and who refused payment, even though he could have bought the entire planet twice over. It was what Mondo Ade did for one another when someone was in trouble. The fact that he was Mondalore was irrelevant. He could almost hear Medrit telling Bevin later what a surly Shabu Irfet was, and asking if Bevin really had to invite him around so often. You didn't tell me how the load was found, Fett said. It was his best shot at small talk given that they didn't seem to want to talk about his death. After ten years? In the middle of nowhere? From orbit. Medrit paused in mid-slice as he carved a sticky pile of nut-studded glistening pastry into six portions and licked his fingers. Little burn scars peppered his hands. Fett wondered if he'd find metal filings in the cake— some Mondoade coming home after a few generations in the Outer Rim. A minerals engineer and a geologist ran a few scans, compared them with the old geological charts, and decided to take a look on close approach. Result? Why? -e. Good timing, Fett said. We're getting a lot of skilled people coming home, Bobica. Bevin said. You said you wanted Mondoade to come back. And some already have. Impressive, 
Fett was surprised at the willingness of people to abandon all they'd ever known simply at his suggestion. Let's hope they're all that lucky. More resourcefulness than luck. Fett thought of the last thing that Fen Shisa had said to him. If you only look after your own hide, then you're not a man. No, Jang didn't have any idea what went on between them in those final moments. People generally believed what they wanted to. Makes me wonder what else is still lying undiscovered on this planet, said Fett. That night, lying awake far too long on the rickety trestle bed in the outbuilding, Fett reflected on the fact that Myrta hadn't been in touch since they'd returned, and wondered what his father would have done had he been Mandalore now. Exhaustion was the best sleeping pill he knew. Before he let it engulf him, his last thought was that the Beskar changed everything. Except his own mortality. Chapter 8 Once Omus pulls his troops back, we'll talk the Bothans into behaving. Give it a month or two. Let everyone calm down and get used to a ceasefire— and we'll use that lull to regroup with Kaminor, Fondor, and Bathawi to give Coruscant a pounding it'll never forget. Corellian Prime Minister Dur Gedjin, discussing longer-term plans with Confederation Defense Staff. GAGHQ Locker Rooms, Coruscant, 2100 hours. Shevu took a long look at Ben, and handed him a small container. It was filled with a dark brown fluid. You look dead beat, said Shevu. But before you turn in for the night, there's a few loose ends to tie up. Ben, slumped on a bench, with his back resting on his locker door, was ready to drop. He had to be up at 0300 to prep for the flight to Vulpter, and he still didn't know his final destination or the location for the hit. That wasn't unusual, apparently. It was just as well he was used to improvising. I'm scoring ninety-seven percent, sir. Chevu sounded as if he'd stifled a laugh. He exuded a sense of pity. It's hard to know what to say. I'm ready. Really, I am. I meant that it's amazing that we can pretty well train a sniper in a day. If he's a Jedi, of course. Shevu put the bottle in Ben's hand. There was the slow and steady drip of water somewhere in the locker rooms, and the scent of faintly herbal soap. You're being inserted ahead of time with Lekalf, and I'll be shadowing Omis's flight. We'll RV on Vulpter at Charby City Spaceport because he's meeting Gedjin in one of the conference rooms there that they hire out for business meetings by the hour. Personally, I think G.A. Intel is insane to let him do that. No sterile area, no screening, no security except for two guys with him for close protection. But it's anonymous. There's no advance booking to trace. Charby is a slum, and we can stroll in. Won't someone recognize him? Shevu pointed to the bottle of brown liquid. I don't think it'll even take some of this to let him get through a spaceport unrecognized. How many checks does a business passenger go through, landing in a private vessel? One, at the Customs and Immigration Desk. And this is Vulpter, for goodness sake. Their security isn't exactly a ring of Durasteel. He could even use the rooms on the other side of that control and he never has to be seen at all. Effectively, it all happens on the landing strip side. Ben thought it through, seeing the spaceport in his mind's eye, adding permacrete and passengers to the holochart image of red and blue lines. He was getting used to thinking like this, and part of him relished solving the puzzle, while the other half wondered what was happening to him. In a way... It's better for us if he meets Gedjin in the conference rooms on the public side of customs, Ben said. 
a bigger crowd out there for us to disappear into. I agree. In the end, we'll grab what chance we get. Ben held the bottle up to the light. So what's this? Hair dye? Most species tend to recall red-headed humans a bit too well. You're still a genetic minority, and Omus knows you well enough to look twice if he spots you. Tell me I don't have to wear makeup to cover my freckles. Ben's mind was a couple of hours ahead, thinking of the few hours sleep he could get on the flight. He could study the layout of the spaceport on his data pad. It was all going to go fine, he told himself. So the second vessel's for backup in case he diverts? Partly, and partly so we have something incriminating to abandon on Vulpter. Read the label, dye your hair, and report to the landing strip at 2230. I'll see you there. Shavu started to walk away. Ben jumped to his feet. Sir, what's going to be incriminating? The captain always seemed old to Ben, but he was younger than Jason. Twenty-eight, maybe. He looked at Ben with that mix of sadness and patience that Ben had seen on his dad's face too often. I think anyone would believe Corellians had neutralized Gedgen, given the right vessel abandoned at the port. You, now. Corellian registered, Corellian traced for forensics. You can do a Corellian accent, can't you? If push comes to shove and you need to speak, that is. There have to be plenty of Corellians with a grudge against him, knowing their politics. Ben thought of Uncle Han's accent, or what was left of it. He sounded more coruscant these days. Can do. But how do we know we won't fall over real Corellians trying to stop Gedgen doing a deal with the enemy? That, said Chevu, would be unbelievably hilarious for all the wrong reasons, assuming he has a deal to put on the table anyway. I'm going to kill someone and in twenty-four hours I'll be back here as if nothing's happened. Any reason why I can't take my vibroblade? Ben fished it from his pocket and held it out to Shevu. My mom gave it to me and, well, you know. You can take whatever works for you, as long as you don't leave or carry evidence that links the hit to us. Shevu examined the blade. Yeah, I understand. He pulled down the neck of his shirt a little to reveal a gold chain. No ID, of course, but my girlfriend gave it to me, and I never go on patrol without it. It helped to know everyone got edgy before a mission and needed a little reminder of their loved ones. Shevu got halfway to the doors before he turned around and seemed to be working up to saying something. I realize your father might find it hard to accept what you do, Ben. But I'm proud of you, he said. Still, if I had a son, I wouldn't be letting him do this kind of thing until he was an adult. It's not as if we haven't got enough trained men to do it. But, well, Colonel Solo has his reasons, I'm sure. Ben sat thinking over that statement for a while and realized that Shevu had said, Father, not parents. Maybe he thought that his mother would understand a job like this. Ben felt he was hanging on to the relationship with his family by his fingertips. But there had been no more fights, and he didn't feel quite so angry about having to compromise. Maybe that was really what growing up was about, an increasing distance from parents knowing that there would always be tomorrow, and that he didn't have to get what he wanted right now, and starting to understand the things they'd been through when they were younger. I wouldn't be letting him do this kind of thing until he was an adult. But his father had done this kind of thing, more or less. He'd just been a little older, that was all. This was no different from blowing up the Death Star, 
and plenty of ordinary people just doing their jobs had died when Luke Skywalker had done that. Ben was removing a single man. No bystanders. He'd remind Dad of that if it ever came out, and he had to defend his decision. Dad would probably say Jason made him do it. Ben stood in the refresher with the dye worked into lather on his head and caught sight of himself in the mirror. He felt ridiculous. The foam looked mauve, and he wondered if something had gone horribly wrong. When he rinsed it off, though, his hair was brown, just brown, and he was looking at a stranger. Good. He needed to be someone else for all kinds of reasons. When his hair had dried, he took out the civilian clothes the cow had left for him, all Corellian style all Corellian labels. This is in case I get caught. The thought chilled Ben, but it was standard procedure. Nobody had spoken to him about what would happen if he did get caught, and what interrogation might be like, but he could guess. They probably didn't know what advice to give a Jedi about resisting interrogation anyway. Maybe they thought he could just nudge a mind here and a thought there and walk out of the cell. Maybe he could. Ben checked himself in the mirror a few times, trying to see himself as a stranger might, and was satisfied that he looked unlike Ben Skywalker, and disturbingly like a Corellian boy a little older than he was, but blonde. Barrett sighed. He hadn't seen Sai since they'd rounded him up with the other Corellians. After that, Ben had stopped asking what happened, but he still wondered silently. He squatted down and placed his boots in the locker. Then he counted the various pieces of kit. Daily pair, battered raid pair for good luck, but no parade best pair. He couldn't imagine where they'd gone. No, actually, he could. Le Calf. Ben would find them full of something unmentionable just before kit inspection, or painted bright pink. Jory, I'm going to think up something special for you, he said aloud, and grinned, wanting the diversion. It was nice to be one of the boys. Ben slipped his data pad into his pocket, wondered where he was going to leave it for safekeeping, and went to pick up the carpaki and some ammo packs from the armory. It was just a job, and he had to do it. The Skywalker's Apartment, Coruscant Luke woke in a heart-pounding panic and reached out toward a hooded shape at the foot of the bed, knowing he was dreaming but unable to stop himself from reacting to the specter that dissolved as he became fully awake. He hadn't had the dream of the menacing figure in the hooded cloak for a while. Now it was back. It was four in the morning, and Mara still hadn't come home. Usually, the forced dream vanished and just left him with that sick jolt in his gut as if he'd seen a speeder crash. But this was different. As he swung his legs over the side of the bed, he had a sense of someone still being in the room. And he was sure he wasn't asleep. He checked the chrono to make certain he wasn't still mired in the nightmare. Oh, four ten hours. He wasn't. Luke reached for his lightsaber, which he'd been keeping on the nightstand lately, and made a cautious inspection of all the rooms. He couldn't sense flesh and blood anywhere, but he could detect something. The presence was so close now that he could almost feel breath on the back of his neck. And then he sensed... amusement. The presence, now at the door to the apartment, he was sure, was like a cloud of billowing smoke in his mind. He could almost see it as he felt it becoming more solid, more real, more here, it suddenly lit up as if a silent explosion had lifted it in a ball of soaring flame. Lumia. Lumia! Luke rushed to the front doors. 
at the same time concentrating hard on using the force to jam the two sets of doors in the corridor outside that stood between the apartment and the lifts. He'd trap her. She'd lied. Mara was right. All that nonsense on the resort satellite, all that I mean you no harm was just a feint, mocking his indecision. The doors parted with a gasp of air, and Luke sprang into the corridor with his lightsaber raised. One set of doors was wedged open with something, trying repeatedly to close and making little mechanical groans each time the inner edges hit the obstruction and bounced back a few centimeters. There was no sign of Lumia. But she'd been here seconds before. Luke could almost taste her on the air. It was as if she'd sprayed perfume too liberally and was leaving a cloud wafting behind her. Except it was a scent of darkness, not rare oils. Frustrated and furious, he strode down the corridor to see what had jammed the doors apart. It was a pair of black boots, army boots with segmented durasteel plates around the ankle, the kind that Ben wore. He parted the doors with a force push and squatted to recover the boots. They were Ben's. Not only did Luke recognize them, but he also felt Ben in them when he picked them up. Luke rarely jumped to conclusions, but he was certain who'd left them there and what the message was. If I can take personal items from your son, I can take him, too. The thought hit Luke like a hard slap in the face. Maybe she's abducted Ben. He felt for his son in the force and sensed no crisis. In fact, Ben seemed to be leaving a trace in the force of someone soundly and safely asleep. How long he'd stay that way, though, Luke wasn't ready to bet. He went back into the apartment to grab his jacket, opening his comlink to Jason as he went. He didn't care what time it was. Jason answered immediately. It seemed he didn't sleep much either. Where's Ben? Luke demanded. Asleep, Luke. Jason had that calm, mock-soothing tone that did anything but soothe him. Patronizing little jerk. Is there a problem? Have you had any intruders in GAGHQ tonight? Jason gave a quiet little laugh. We're the ones who do the forced entry, Luke. Someone's left Ben's boots here as a calling card. I don't understand. Did he leave them behind? He doesn't keep any of his uniform at our place. Someone's taken them from your headquarters, and as juvenile a prank as it seems, Luke almost stopped short of mentioning Lumia, because he had no idea yet how deep her inroads into the GAG had become, or even if Jason was consciously aware of them. But he was angry and scared for his boy, and that always colored his judgment. It's Lumia. She's taunting me, showing me she can get at Ben any time she pleases. Jason was silent. Luke waited. I can't give you an explanation for that. I really can't, Jason said eventually. Well, Lumia's jerking my chain, as she probably was at Galatter, too. Stupid, stupid, stupid. How could I ever have been fooled like that? And she has someone inside your organization. So I suggest you get that sorted out fast. We've had one investigation already and found nothing. We'll have another if it makes you happier. Jason's voice sounded both offended and irritated. But Luke couldn't even take that at face value any longer. But I can assure you, Ben is safe. He's even got pretty good protection right next to him. Lieutenant LeCouf. Nice to see the guy get promoted. He strikes me as being very loyal to you. As his grandfather was to Vader, Luke. You can't buy loyalty like that. 
Ben's in good hands. Let's talk again in the morning. Luke shut the link dead. No, the morning wouldn't do, and there was no point talking to Jason, who was clearly trussed and tied as far as Lumia's influence was concerned. She was right under his nose. So much for what he'd learned about arcane force techniques during his five-year sabbatical. Luke jogged to the landing pad and tore off in the speeder, maybe a little faster than was safe. Lumia had left a very clear trail, beckoning Luke to follow. Well, he wasn't falling for that. It had to be a diversion. Or an ambush. I've never been afraid of an ambush, Lumia. I'll walk into one happily, knowing my enemies are there. Nice try. I'm coming. Don't you worry. He resisted the impulse to drop everything and charge after her trail. She was still near, or at least still on Coruscant. He could feel it. But he had to talk to Mara first, and she was at Starfighter Command. He opened the comlink. How could I have let this go on for so long? I don't care if I'm expected to be the Elder Statesman. This stops. This stops now. Mara, we have a problem, he said. Lumia. I'm with Jaina, sweetheart. Do you want me to— She's been outside our apartment. Luke picked his words a little more carefully now. Mara would go ballistic as soon as he mentioned Ben's boots. It was a sinister, silent threat. Stay where you are. I'll be there in a few minutes. When there's a trail going cold— or a diversion. Or a trail she wants you to think is a diversion. Yes, Mara and Lumia both had that layer-upon-layer layer way of thinking, just as Palpatine had taught them. I know what she wants, he said, and shut the link. Luke broke the traffic regulations a dozen times. He skipped out of the regulated sky lanes always busy on Coruscant, and got a discordant blast of horns from vessels whose noses he nearly clipped. In the way of automatic actions, his mind slipped into deep contemplation as he took the familiar route to Starfighter Command. I know what my problem is. He thought back forty years, when he'd been ready to rush to the aid of a total stranger on the basis of a message in an intercepted hologram. The plea for rescue hadn't even been aimed at him, but he'd responded to it anyway, without thinking, without questioning, because it had felt like something he had to do. And now I act sensibly and soberly because I'm leader of the Jedi Council, and I'm not nineteen anymore. But it wasn't his nature. It wasn't what he did best. Just because he had whatever gifts the Force had given him more generously than other Jedi, it didn't mean he was cut out for... Management. Yes, management. That was it. He thought of the nagging frustration he always felt when he sent other Jedi on missions, and how he thought that was just reluctance to admit it was the turn of the young Jedi to take on the physical daring do while he made wise judgments in the chamber. Sitting on my backside. What he did best was right wrongs. And if he couldn't put this right for his only child, then what was he? I forgot who I am. He was an uncomplicated man who cared enough about his friends and family to die for them, if that was what it took to save them. He was, as Mara told him at least once a day, a farm boy. He was Luke Skywalker, and if he could take on the Empire without a second thought, he could certainly finish off one of the last pitiful remnants of its rule. Lumia G.A. Starfighter Command, Coruscant You know, this always works on the crime holovids. 
Mara added another illuminated marker to the holochart of the galaxy, and stepped back to see if a pattern of Lumia's movements emerged. It was a big galaxy, and Lumia seemed to cover a lot of space, which now included Mara's own front doors. Keep it up, cyborg girl. You're just focusing me better. Might as well use the time productively. Jaina leaned over the desk and tapped in more coordinates. Now that she was a civilian again, she was here in her capacity as a Jedi working for Luke Skywalker and the Council. But she slipped back into Fleetways fast. So let's add in Alima's known whereabouts. Well, there's no pattern there either. Do you think it's a case of Alima stalking Lumia, looking for scraps from her table? Why do those two seem to hang out together? They both need a lot of spare parts. Mara stifled a laugh. That's not nice, Jaina. Seriously, they haven't got enough functioning parts to make one decent humanoid between them. They're both good at hiding, whether by disguising their presence or erasing the memory of being seen. Mara was feeling around her in the force, just waiting for Lumia to spring from nowhere. She could sense her, but not near. Lumia's broken her cover, and she's not stupid, so she wants to be seen. Jaina kept checking the chrono on the wall, and then looking at her own timepiece. Did you go to see Jason? Yes. And? You want the truth, Jaina? Don't I always? Lumia's bending him somehow. Okay, no need to tell me I was the last person to notice that. I wasn't going to. Did you mention that? Yes. I thought it was time someone dropped a hint that we'd noticed our Jason had turned into a monster. Mara was getting angry, and her honest inner voice told her that the only person who deserved that anger was herself, for defending Jason, while the fact that things were going disastrously wrong was staring her in the face. But Mara was human, and scared for Ben, and it boiled over onto Jaina. Forgive me for asking, but being his twin, have you never had this out with him? I tried. He responded with a court-martial charge, remember? I can't help thinking that you might have tried slugging him. Suddenly he's my responsibility? I'm the one who said he was going dark way back. Okay, okay, I'm sorry. Mara put her hands up in mock submission. She could apologize, but she couldn't retract her acid tone, and she regretted that. I just... Okay, none of my business. Spit it out, Mara. I just don't get how you can be so caught up in worrying whether you want Jag or Zek when your own brother's going to pieces and taking others with him. Whoa! Sorry. I said it was none of my business. Well, you said it, so... Yes. I want to be distracted by personal issues, because otherwise I'd go nuts trying to understand why Jason's doing what he's doing to our parents. Maybe it's time we all faced that. Together. There was an awkward silence. Mara wanted to tell Jaina that she was a grown woman now and it was time to stop messing around like a teenager, and that Ben was more adult at fourteen than she was at thirty-one. It was spiteful, partly true, and partly fueled by Mara's incomprehension of anyone who wasn't as totally focused on the mission as she was, to the exclusion of all else. She kept her thoughts to herself. It was a sign of weary middle age, along with gray hairs and fading stretch marks, I spent my whole youth on duty for the Emperor. I never had the freedom that Jaina's always had, and a little bit of me resents that now. It wasn't Jaina's fault. She was headstrong and passionate like her father, but she hadn't quite found the silent, hidden durasteel of her mother yet. 
she'll rise to the challenge when it comes. But if this isn't it, I don't know what is. Jaina had her head down, hair forming a dark curtain as she leaned over the desk, pretending to be absorbed in the chart. But Mara could feel she was hurt. It wasn't the first time in recent weeks. Mara would make it up to her when she calmed down. Families had spats all the time. The storms blew over. Change of plan, said Luke, stepping out of the turbo lift with his hair disheveled and a bag in one hand. Sometimes he had that don't-stop-me look, and he had it now. It always made Mara want to stop him. I'm going after Lumia. Enough. No, you're not, Mara said. You're too close to this. She's baiting you. Luke dumped the bag on the desk, disrupting the holochart. Jaina stepped back. Ben's boots, said Luke. And the point is... Deposited at our apartment by Lumia. Mara put her hand on the boots and felt the remnants of dark energy. Now she was mad. Cold, clear, icy mad. She's been into GAGHQ. Or Jason's apartment. I don't know which idea I like less. I need to settle this with her. It is, as some admiral once said, a trap for her. Biting off more than she can chew. Jaina glanced at them both, still looking a little wounded. Uncle Luke, I'll stick my nose in here and say it's better if we go after Lumia now, because she's clearly playing a game, and I've never seen you angry like this before. Luke, the question to ask yourself is this, Mara said, pulling on her jacket and checking her personal weapons. What will you do when you catch her? Luke swallowed hard. I know what I have to do. And what was that conversation we had the other day? About being fit for the role? Me, trained killer? You, honest guardian of right? Lightsaber, vibrablades, holdout blaster, flechette launcher, and the last of my transponders. Check. Here's the plan. You keep an eye on Jason while I go after her. I'm coming too. Jaina said. I'd hate to miss a Lima if she shows up. Things were getting back to normal then. Mara would apologize when they were on their way, and Luke was making sure that he knew what Jason was up to, in case Lumia was staging an elaborate diversion to draw them all away from Coruscant. Luke looked at his hands. I know you're right. It doesn't feel right but I know I shouldn't be going after her bent on vengeance. And I don't know what it's going to take to make me kill her. And nothing short of that makes sense now. Mara nodded and hit the comm to the hangar ground crew. Stand by an X-wing, please. She pulled on her gloves, the fingerless ones, that gave her a good grip, but still let her feel the weapon. I'm going back starting from the apartment and tracking her from there. She wants to leave a nice trail? She's found just the right person to follow it. I'll sort this out, because it's my fault it got this far. I should have gone straight after her, and then you wouldn't have talked me out of this, said Luke. Jane is dead right. You have too much history with Lumia and you're too stoked up. You have to kill cold. Luke looked heartbroken for a moment. It wasn't disappointment that he was losing the argument to her, because there was no argument. It was common sense. Just because they were family didn't mean that military best practice went out the window. But something had struck him that he didn't like, something more than Lumia's constant threats to Ben. I hate it when you're right, he said, and managed to smile. 
Jason says Ben's asleep, and it seems that way. So he's okay. There you go, said Mara. She still hadn't told Luke that Ben could shut down in the force. She'd have a little chat with her son about that first. We're off now. Keep tabs on Jason. Go and have a concerned avuncular chat with him over calf if you have to. But be around in case that's where your ex is heading. She patted Luke's cheek and winked, wanting to make light of it so he didn't see how much Lumia was getting to her. I might be going gray, farm boy, and I don't have her dramatic dress sense, but at least what I've got is all flesh and blood. Luke almost laughed. Mara tapped her forefinger to her brow in a mock salute and walked off with Jaina. When she got in the turbo lift, she checked her data pad to see where Ben's transponder had gotten to. If you've left that blade in your locker, Ben... A little earlier, it had shown up on the data pad's small screen as a static blip in Galactic City, in GAGHQ. Now, it didn't. Mara never panicked, but she reserved the right to professional apprehension. She switched the scale of the chart. What's wrong? Jaina asked. Nothing. Where are you? Nothing at all. Mara flicked through ever larger scales of screen until she picked up the transponder blip again. And the coordinates didn't make sense. Ben appeared to be on Vulpter. What takes you there, Ben? Vulpter's not in the war. If she told Luke, with the head of steam he'd built up, she knew he'd go in with all cannons blazing. So she simply smiled at Jaina ready to let Lumia play her game of tag, before Mara finally separated her smug head from her metal body, ending her feud with the Skywalkers once and for all. I'm coming, cyborg. It's time. Chapter 9 I don't want to worry you, sir, but I've just heard something on the metal commodities market that might concern us. Someone's talking about offering futures in Mandalorian iron. And Mandal Motors shares are being snapped up for the first time in years. Investment Analyst, Galactic Alliance Treasury Mandal Motors Research Wing, Kaldabe, Mandalore What do you think then, Fett? Jir Yomaget was the kind of man who probably had to be anesthetized to get him into a business suit. He stood with his arms folded, gazing rapt at an airframe that Fett hadn't seen before, an incongruously scruffy and disturbingly young man in dark green coveralls and partial armor. Prototype? Yomaget nodded. Started life as the Kirgalar, up to three crew or two with extra payload, atmosphere-capable, configurable for anything from planet-pounding to hunter-killer rolls, and fast. Now tell me it's not gorgeous. Research wing was a flattering term for the collection of scruffy sheds and hangars, but the ramshackle appearance of the exterior belied the technology within. Mandel Motors had struggled to get back on its feet under a galactic alliance that wasn't handing out reconstruction grants to Mandalore. Now it had an edge it could exploit. How fast? asked Fett. Yomaget probably didn't look at his wife and kids with as much adoration as he was lavishing on the assault fighter. Point four hyperdrive. The ultimate shock weapon. And you never offered me the chance to purchase. Fett had modified Slave 1 to a point seven. That beats an X-Wing. Unfinished prototype. It was about fifteen meters nose to tail, with an eight-meter span. A faceted charcoal gray wedge of a ship that had none of the insectoid lines of the Star Viper. Fett walked around it, noting empty racks and housings, and took a guess that it would pack four laser cannons and maybe a couple of other weapons. 
The tail ended in a flat section with grills and vents that looked like the ports on a data pad. The skin was totally plain, its angled surfaces unbroken except for the Mythosaur logo picked out in a lighter gray on the side hatches. No bright work, no sharp-edged recesses, and the tinted transparasteel canopies seemed to merge into the superstructure. Fett would have ducked underneath it to take a look at the blaster pods and store pylons, but the fighter sat too low for him to do it comfortably. He couldn't face being gripped by pain and having to crawl out like an idiot. So it's fast. And pretty. Deflective stealth hull, cooled vents, scanner-absorbent coating. Yomaget flourished a forearm plate attachment, tapped it, and the canopy popped. It parted into two top-hinged hatches, and he swung himself into the cockpit. Also hinges from the lower edge, in case the pilot has to bang out. Now the avionics. Synthetic vision, panoramic cockpit display, eye-controlled switch selection, aiming. The works. Sounds like you had a contest to see how many gizmos you could cram into one fighter. All we've been able to do since the Vong War ended is we establish our basic production models and work up some better ideas. Yomaget leaned over the side of the fighter. They all ended up in here. So? Well, you wanted to know what we might manufacture with the new Beskar. Personally, I'd be inclined to incorporate it into the airframe. Micronized Beskar skin, or laminate Beskar armor. Bevin would call that over-egging the cake. Think of this as the demonstrator. That would make it the fastest, least vulnerable fighter on the market. The weapons load might be a compromise. Fett wasn't sure if he had the power or right to tell Mandel Motors what to do with their product. This wasn't Coruscant, where national security overrode commercial concerns by law. Add the top-end armaments, though and I wouldn't want that sold to anyone else. Don't worry. We'll de-enrich the spec for export. We live here, remember? We all lost family to the Vong. Yomaget jumped down from the cockpit with an agility Fett envied. Then he pressed the forearm plate attachment, and the fighter made a faint grinding sound before tilting back on its tail section and lifting through a full ninety degrees to sit upright a mechanism not dissimilar to Slave One's. It can land vertically in a footprint of a little over thirty-two square meters. Fett walked a few meters away to get a better idea of the shape. It didn't look like any other vessel he'd seen. I bet it does tricks, too. Our shares have rocketed, and we haven't even unveiled this. I bought a few. Someone had to make sure the majority shareholdings stayed in Mandalorian hands. Just as well we don't have a law against insider dealing. I don't intend to sell. Might sign them over to someone on the condition they never sell on to Arue Tise. Is that a go-ahead for production? Full spec for us. De-enriched for them. Fett walked away briskly, feeling his unconnected acts of prudence falling together into a policy of sorts. Make sure the export hyperdrive spec is a fraction better than an X-Wing. No more. Yomaget trailed after him. This was defense policy on the fly, and the clans didn't get consulted. And they wouldn't care, Fett knew. We're going to arm the Confederation, then, said Yomaget. We'll arm anybody, including the G.A., if they can pay. Fett hadn't even thought about the next move. It just happened. Provided Colonel Jason Solo comes here in person to negotiate the deal. 
You're a subtle man, Fett. I've never been called that before. Fifty percent of production for our own defense? Defense. That was one word for it. Agreed. Mandalorians liked a sensible compromise. The best deals were where both sides were happy, or where one was happy and the other dead. Fett stopped short of asking to fly the first Beskar fighter off the production line. He wanted that privilege to go to Bevin, the nearest he would ever have to a friend. He looked forward to seeing the reaction when Mandel Motors opened their order book. Jason Sola would have the choice between letting the G.A.'s enemy buy better fighters than his and showing up here. Fett had no doubt which he'd choose, but it would be fun seeing him have to handle the messy presentational issues in public. That could be arranged. It'll be called the Besulik, Yomaget called after him. The Basilisk. I always had a soft spot for the ancient battle droids. Good old Mondo name and old-fashioned Mondo iron in a state-of-the-art package. Fett nodded to himself. Besulik. It had a nice ring to it. A name from the past. A name that wouldn't go away, however hard the rest of the galaxy tried to make it. Ever. Besulik. It was the kind of news that made other men walk away whistling. Charby Spaceport, Vulpter, Deep Core Ben pressed as close to the viewport as he could to peer at the permacrete below. It was hazy daylight outside, but his body said it was still last night and he needed more sleep. As far as the rest of the spaceport was concerned, the well-maintained but very old Incom Tourer was not a Galactic Alliance guard ship carefully contaminated with Corellian dust, Corellian food waste, Corellian fabric, and any number of other touches designed to show a forensics team that the vessel definitely came from Corellia, and the battered intersystem delivery cutter tailing Cal Omis's shuttle wasn't a spy vessel with top-of-the-line comms, spoofing devices, and an overpowered hyperdrive. Jory LeCalf wasn't a GAG assassin, either. He was just a nice, ordinary young Corellian on an adventure with his younger cousin, in an elderly ship he'd saved every spare credit for a couple of years to buy. The trouble was that Ben could believe that all too easily even though he'd seen the range of weapons LeCalf carried under his jacket. If I'd kept my hair red, the family resemblance would have looked more convincing, Ben said. He wanted another calf to keep him alert, but he had a vision of being desperate to visit the refreshers at a critical point in the operation if he drank any more. Your hair's reddish, really. More sandy blonde, LeCalf said. One red-headed human is noticeable, but two is asking to be remembered by witnesses. If we have any, that is. Could have dressed as Ubizi. With masks. I think that's been done before. I'm just worrying. I know. It was a long wait. Chevu would make contact with them when he landed. His last transmission said he was a few minutes behind Omis's shuttle, which wouldn't attract suspicion. Charby was a busy port, freighting cheap and shoddy goods, and ships landed almost too close together for safety and comfort. Nobody cared who you were, as long as port fees and taxes were paid. They said Vulpter had once been a lovely planet. It didn't look lovely now, the skies had that polluted, smoky haze that meant there were wonderful red sunsets here, and not much else to be grateful for. And this was after they'd tried to clean up the environment. The vast landing strip, landing field more like, was scattered with dozens upon dozens of craft in varying stages of disrepair, some taking on board supplies and fuel, 
some berthing next to freight warehouses where conveyor belts disgorged crates into their holds. Their outlines shimmered in the heat haze from idling drives, and there were all kinds of species wandering around on foot between the vessels, stretching their legs, anywhere between one pair and four of them, it seemed. The only concession to landing field safety was a tracery of red and white painted lines across the permacrete bearing the warnings, Pedestrians do not cross this line, and beware ground traffic. But everyone was crossing the lines as they pleased, and battered speeders with Charby Port Authority livery swerved around them, honking in annoyance. Ben decided it was the last place anyone would expect two heads of state to conduct a top-level meeting. Stand by, Lekauf said quietly, pressing his fingertip to his ear. It's the captain. Yes, sir. Copy that. He looked up. About twelve minutes before Omis lands, Chevu's right behind him in the landing queue. Ben perked up. The carpaki was folded in two inside his jacket, right on the limit of what he could hide, and the vibroblade was tucked in his hip pocket. He'd rehearsed it all in his mind on a continuous loop of what-ifs and if-onlys. Rifle to drop Gedgen, preferably at very long range, and vibroblade to escape if seized. It would have been better to get Gedgen as the man disembarked, while he was exposed on the landing field for a few moments without bystanders milling around. But Jason wanted the meeting recorded. It was a case of following Gedgen, or Omis, to the room they'd hired by the hour, then slipping a strip cam through a gap under the doors. The building blueprints showed plenty of places to insert the flimsy thin device. Each room's doors were set in a recess, so, for once, it was a simple matter of squatting down as if picking up a piece of litter and shoving the strip cam into the gap. Should have put a hidden bug in Omis's coat or folio or something. Lekauf muttered. Then we sit here, pinpoint Gedgen's ship, and slot him on the ramp as he leaves. Ben fidgeted with the vibroblade, wondering how his mother would have tackled a job like this. You can't stick bugs on people without them finding out sooner or later. Yeah, with our luck he'd have changed his jacket. They used to have this stuff called tracking dust, you know, just like powder. If the target inhaled it, you could pick up signals from it for ages afterward. Makes you wonder how much all this stuff costs, said Ben. I mean, we're dirt cheap, but we have to abandon this ship. It's an old crate. Saves the Defense Department the cost of disposal. And leaving it behind would add weight to the setup that Corellian dissidents had killed their own Prime Minister for giving in to the G.A., that was the plan, anyway. Ben switched seats in the cramped interior to look out from the starboard side. Gedgen's ship should have landed by now, according to its flight plan. One pilot, three passengers, maximum five-hour stopover. That was what it said on the CPA information database that his data pad, scrubbed of all identity in case of capture, showed him. Ben avoided looking at the chrono on the bulkhead. He just waited for the word from Lekauf. So how do you feel being an officer now? Ben asked. Weird. But my granddad would have been so proud. I wish he'd been alive to see it. Lekauf never mentioned his parents. It was always his grandfather. It struck Ben that almost everyone he'd grown up with or worked with either had no family or had key members missing or totally absent. It wasn't normal. He thought about how routine killing was for his whole family, and knew that most of the beings in the galaxy got through their entire lives without ever killing anyone, deliberately or accidentally. It was strange that families like his got to make the really big decisions for worlds of normal, ordinary, non-lethal people. Ben concentrated on centering himself, 
edging a little toward that state where he vanished from the force. He pulled himself back, just as he felt a drifting sensation that could have been disappearance, or nodding off. Plug yourself in, Lakauf whispered. It's a go. Ben activated his comlink and earpiece, and shut down the environmental controls to leave the tour. When Lakauf opened the hatch, the air and noise hit Ben like a solid wall. It smelled of factories and sulfur. They ambled down the ramp, working hard at looking ordinary, and made their way toward the terminal buildings as if they were killing time, not politicians. Lakauf scratched his ear, repositioning the earpiece. Got you, sir. Position? Ben picked up Chevu's voice clearly. He'll pass thirty meters to the left of you, unless he deviates. Heading for Building G. You pick him up, and I'll follow you in. No visual on the target yet. He must be inside already. Oh, this is real. This is happening. It was a throwback of a thought. Back to the time when Ben first started taking crazy risks— but this mission had an extra dose of risk. Omis knew him by sight, and had even met Chevu too. They couldn't afford to be spotted. Ben slouched and meandered as fourteen-year-old boys were prone to do, turning around from time to time to chat to Lakauf about safe and meaningless trivia, Baccarat, speeders, anything, while he took a cautious look across the permacrete in Omis's direction. And there he was, flanked by two men in working clothes, a carefully scruffy figure himself. His confident bearing gave him away as a man used to being obeyed, but only to someone who knew what he was looking for. And Ben did. "'Going okay,' Lakauf whispered, not looking toward the three men. One of the GA intelligence agents walked through the doors of Building G in front of Omus. The other followed close enough to tread on his heels. They almost vanished in the crowds inside the terminal building. But Ben kept them in sight, even though he lost Lakauf for a few moments. One of them appeared to be checking the numbers on various doors and exits as he walked. And eventually, he stopped at one marked 53L and inserted a credit chip in the slot to one side. The doors parted, and Ben got a glimpse of a small, brightly lit room, almost filled by a white duraplast table ringed by chairs. There was already someone in there. The doors closed again. A steady two-way river of passengers, port workers, flight crew, and the general temporary population of a spaceport stood between Ben and the doors. "'You can do this,' Lakauf said. How many in there? I can't place the strip cam under the doors if someone else is going to come along and open them again. Ben closed his eyes and concentrated on the ebb and flow of the force, the patterns of density that he could both feel at the roof of his mouth and see as speckled color behind his eyelids. Six, he said. That made sense. Two close protection agents each even numbers. Two statesmen who didn't trust each other. Yes, six. They're all inside now. Can you see lottery numbers, too? Lakauf made his way casually through the shoals of people and squatted down to adjust his boot. Ben saw him take out what looked like a small flimsy strip, then slide the thing under the hairline gap with quick ease. Strip cams were very small these days, the size of a coat check stub. They really were flimsy, and just as disposable once they'd finished transmitting. Lovely, said Chavu's voice in Ben's ear. I can see right up Gedjin's nose. Good, clear sound. Nice job, Jory. Eventually, Ben glanced around and spotted Chevu leaning against a drinks dispenser on the other side of the concourse. He was recording the output from the strip cam and transmitting it back to GAGHQ. 
as soon as he had confirmation that it had been received and stored, he'd erase his data pad and send a code to the strip cam to shred its data. It'd be just a scrap of garbage the cleaners would sweep up if they ever came this way. It looked as if they wouldn't. Ben and Lecalf could hear the conversation in their earpieces, both of them monitoring it so they knew when to vanish, wait for Gedgen to emerge, and follow him. It was a fascinating conversation. Ben had started to get the hang of the code and insinuation that beings in power used to say unpleasant things. A different language that let them deny later that they'd meant any harm. Jason was good at it. Ben hoped he never would be. Because it got to be a habit, and Jason seemed to enjoy playing that game for its own sake. He recognized Omis's voice. Gedgen sounded softer than he did on the HNE bulletins. It was very weird to listen to a man you were about to kill. Ben was hearing the last words Dur Gedgen would ever speak. So, can we agree as gentle beings to cease hostilities while we sort out a compromise? Before or after I take this to the Senate? Thomas asked. I'm not referring this to my assembly. Yet, you might not need to refer it to yours, Gedgen replied. We'll stand down if you agree to that form of revised wording in the commitment of planetary defense assets to the GA. You might be able to deliver that with Corellian forces, but can you pull back the Bothans? Are you sure Neophil will do as you tell her? She's a career officer. She will. The Bothans are pragmatists. They will. As a show of goodwill, you'll commit forces to helping us restore order in places like the Seepen system. Of course. And you need us to come back into the G.A. fold to stop the membership hemorrhaging away. I won't ask for any statement that causes loss of face. I know how proud Corellians are. Just something along the lines of differences being bridgeable. That's very gracious, Chief Omus. Now, those differences will only be bridged if Admiral Neothel and Colonel Solo no longer carry the military weight that they do now. You want me to fire them? I think you might need to do more than fire them now that they've become used to getting their own way. I think I know what you mean, and I don't care for that solution. Neothel. Ambitious. Dangerous. Solo. Ambitious. Dangerous. And Jedi, too. We can solve the problem for you permanently. If you do, I don't need to know about it. If we do, I'd like your security services to look the other way. Solo has ambitious minions who'd be temporarily blind and deaf in exchange for promotion, I think. I see you know of Captain Gearden, then. And they laughed. The two of them actually laughed. Ben heard a faint sound as if Shevu was clearing his throat. When Ben turned his head, Lecalf was looking at him for once not the permanently cheerful man who looked so much younger than he was. He looked old and angry. That's how much we're worth, he said quietly. I bet our intel guys in there love the idea of having their man back in command. Ben's gut turned suddenly heavy and cold. It was a dirty game all the way to the top. While he was preparing to assassinate Gedgen, Gedgen was doing a deal to strike at Jason and Neothel, 
with Omus turning a blind eye. Everyone could be bought if the price was high enough. Omus obviously put peace above individual lives. It might not have been any different in the long run from any general risking combat casualties, but it didn't feel anywhere near as clean. Then switched his attention. He began to visualize the exterior of the terminal buildings. A walkway ran along the roof, a little used observation deck where anyone could sit and watch vessels taking off and landing. It wasn't a popular spot, but it was perfect for a sniper. As soon as the meeting sounded as if it was coming to an end, Ben had a minute or two to get up on that roof and wait for Gedgen to exit. There were three sets of doors Gedgen could leave through to walk back onto the landing field and rejoin his ship. To cover that span, a couple of hundred meters, Ben would have to be ready to sprint along that platform in either direction from a central point. I'm ready. He pressed his arm against his side and felt the carpaki. It would be almost completely silent. He'd also be standing on top of a stark permacrete platform with no cover. I'll just have to be fast, then. The conversation between Omus and Gedgen slowed, and there were longer pauses and more restless grunts and sighs. Business was drawing to a close. At a nudge from Lecauf, Ben began walking to the roof turbolift without even looking back. He stood in the turbolift cab with a family of Triani looking for a tap calf, wondering if they could smell his intentions. One of the G.A.G. troopers liked free-falling. He'd told Ben that to jump off a 5,000-meter building, there was a point where a free-faller had to simply stop working up to it and step off into the void. Ben was at that point now, as he walked along the rooftop terrace and took up position. He stepped back into the shadow of a single lonely air-conditioning outflow and unfolded the carpaki. If he held it against the leg of his baggy, creased pants, it didn't present such an obvious profile. There was nobody around anyway. The observation platform was cracked, and weeds were thriving in the crevices. He settled down to wait for Chevu and Lecauf to do the spotting for him. Jason's going to go crazy when he hears what Omas has in mind for him. Ben, heads up. It was Chevu. Gedgen's on the move. He's exiting via the south doors. Go right. Ben checked around him and jogged to the far end of the platform, keeping close to the rear wall. He hoped he'd recognize Gedgen. He'd studied the man's face and walk intently before the mission. But now he might be looking at the back of his head, depending on the exact path he took back to the ship. It was a silly, petty doubt. He hadn't thought it through enough before he embarked. But when he looked down on the permacrete and the chaos of ships, freight droids, and species of all kinds wandering around as if it were a theme park, that neat military haircut, jet black, glossy, not a strand out of place, drew his eye like a beacon. He lay prone and sighted up. The optics brought him instantly a hundred meters closer to Durgedjan, and then there was no doubt that he had the right man in his crosswires. As Gedjan walked, two security guards in discreet casual clothes weaved in and out of Ben's shot. As soon as Gedjan dropped, at least one of them would be looking for where the shot had originated. Ben would have to stay low and melt back into the crowds in the airside terminal then rendezvous with Lecauf at Chevu's transport. I can do it. I got in and out of center point, didn't I? Ben held his breath, let the Karpaki's smart optics adjust for wind and angle, and felt his finger tighten on the trigger. One second, Gedgen's neat dark head was filling the scope, and the next, Ben was staring at empty permacrete, as the rifle kicked back against his shoulder.
the muffled report seemed to come from a long way away. Nothing seemed to have gone down in the order he expected. Shot, recoil, drop. He lay flat. What happened? Did I kill him? He could hear shouts carried on the air from three stories below. His body made the decisions for him, and he found himself scrambling backward to the rear wall, while Chevu's voice in his ear kept saying, Get out of there, Ben! He ran at a crouch to the turbo lift, found that it was on a lower floor, and took the fire escape stairway. It was going to plan. He could merge into the crowd. Back on the ground floor, he slipped through the fire doors and made a conscious effort not to look panicked. Maybe professional assassins could take this in their stride, but he couldn't. He'd put aside the fact that he'd just killed a man and found he was totally caught up in the simple act of getting away. When Chevu put his hand on his shoulder from behind, Ben thought he was going to have a heart attack. Keep walking, Chevu whispered. Curious crowds were gathering at the transparisteel doors to gawp at the unfolding drama on the landing strip, and security staff were struggling to get through the crowd. Just keep on walking. If they sealed the doors, it was chaos. Nobody seemed to know what had happened yet. That bought Ben, Chevu, and Lecalf a few more minutes. Charby seemed the kind of place where passengers and freighter captains would walk right past a dead body if it meant their flight left on time. They were counting on it. I'm right behind you, said Lecalf's voice in his earpiece. If we walk down to the south doors, we can just go around the perimeter to Chevu's shuttle. Ben was scared. He was happy to admit it. He hadn't been afraid at all on Centerpoint, but now he knew better. He kept a little distance between him and Chevu, remembering to pause every so often and look at the commotion as if he were genuinely curious about what was happening. But he carried on walking. Above him, the hollow screen that usually showed arrivals and departures was turned over to the traffic control tower's view of the landing strip. Yes, he'd killed Gedgen. A textbook headshot. I can't feel my face. My lips feel numb. Now Ben was seconds away from those doors, walking with the steady but thinning stream of droids, repulsor lifts, and passengers heading out to the vessels. Nearly there. He was a few meters away from the transparisteel doors when he saw a man in familiar casual clothes running at full tilt toward them. The doors parted, and Ben was staring down the muzzle of a blaster. Armed officer, CSA, the man barked. Everybody, stay where you are. Ben balanced on a blade's edge between surrender and making a run for it. Chapter 10 Verpine negotiator Sas Sikili, speaking today at the opening of Bastex, has warned Mercana that the Roche government will respond with appropriate measures if it continues to breach trade agreements on technology exports. Mercana is keen to move into the growing market for secure small-unit comlink networking, a field dominated by Verpine products. HNE Business News, noted with interest by Boba Fett, Mandalore. Speeder Park Rotunda Zone, Coruscant. Lumia had left a magnified wake in the force like a water speeder on a lake. While it was generous of her, Mara wasn't amused. I didn't get stupid overnight, she muttered. Don't insult me, Tin Can. And what were you saying about Luke being too close to all this? Jaina asked. Deep breaths, Aunt Mara, deep breaths. I'm psyching up. I find it helps. You use the force your way, and I'll use it mine. Wow! Am I calming you down now? That's a headline to save for the grandchildren. 
Mara paced a ten-meter square of the area, feeling dark energies pulsing like shockwaves. Jaina stood back and watched. She's taken off from here, Mara stated. Has she led us here to divert us from somewhere else on Coruscant? She's got a narrow range of targets, Jaina. Ben or Jason. Or even Han and Leia, if she's teamed up with Alima. Your parents aren't on Coruscant. And if she's after Jason, she must have had her chance to take him when she got into GAGHQ to grab Ben's boots. Mara squatted down to touch the permacrete. She expected to get a jolt of some kind, a taste of Lumia mocking her. But there was something disconcertingly benign about the impression the Sith had left behind. Yes, like she managed to convince Luke she meant him no harm. Lumia seemed to have discovered a rare talent for force acting. If she's after Luke, she's passed up two chances now. So it's Ben. Ben's... away. He's not on Coruscant. Jaina looked at Mara, with an expression that said she couldn't work out why Mara was stalling her. But Mara wouldn't budge. The less the family knew about Ben's situation, the better. Sooner or later it'd slip out that she'd put a trace on him. And however old he was when that finally happened, she'd lose his trust forever. It would hurt him. G.A.G. -G business, Mara said, answering the unasked question. She cast around in the force, groping for anything that said Lumia was heading for Vulpter but she had no sense of that at all. What she picked up was Ben, nervous for a moment, then disappearing as Jason must have taught him. She'd have to tackle that when the current emergency was under control. Okay, if she wants me to follow her, I'll follow. Let's call in Zek and Jag, because I'm betting Alima's in town again, and no offense, Jaina, but I think it's me she wants. You go find Bug Girl. Jaina's pursed lips looked like she'd decided to swallow an argument. Okay, she said at last. It's just an old dark side feud. Mara didn't want Jaina to feel that she was snubbing her. Relations were edgy enough at the moment. Let's not allow her to divert both of us. So Lumia was taunting her. I can get at your husband. I can get at your son. If she was so set on killing Ben for the death of her daughter, she still seemed to be missing chances. So what did Lumia want from her? Mara returned to base to find one of the ground crew waiting patiently by her allocated XJ-7. She climbed into the cockpit and started her instrument check. Is Lumia really a Sith? the technician asked. The very last of her kind, said Mara, not asking what he'd heard and how he knew the name anyway. She felt a pang of guilt at her sloppiness for arguing loudly and forgetting there were other personnel around. She sealed the XJ-7's hatches. I'll make sure of that. Mara ignored military air traffic regulations and circled over the area where she'd last picked up Lumia's powerful wake. If she concentrated, it was relatively easy to follow, and she found herself leaving Coruscant orbit on a bearing for one of the moons, Hesperidium. Oh, yes, Palpatine loved that place, she said aloud. You heading there for old times' sake? Lumia was definitely playing a game, but she wasn't stupid enough to think she could offer Mara her hand and find it still intact like she had with Luke. The wake led to Hesperidium's main resort, which wasn't quite as splendid as Mara recalled. She wondered if it was feeling the pinch of post-war recovery, and if there still weren't enough tastelessly wealthy folk to go around. Port Traffic Control was surprised, to say the least, to find a military vessel on its scanners. 
I need to put down for a while, Mara said, knowing they had no choice about the matter. They could hardly stop her landing. Getting weird readings on my instruments. I have to check it out. Let us know if you need help, the ATC controller said. We pride ourselves on doing anything and everything for all our visitors. Classified, Mara said, and ended the conversation in the way that only she could. When she landed and saw the selection of vessels standing on the private strips of the hotels, she realized that an XJ-7 probably looked like an eccentric billionaire's toy, and a small one at that. Some of the craft here were staggering in their size and opulence. She wondered how they even managed to land. There was clearly a thriving class of the ultra-wealthy that had come through the last decade pretty well unscathed, and life was going on uninterrupted for them now, regardless of another war. Credits seemed to operate like deflector shields. If you had enough of either, nothing could touch you. She checked around her, in the force and visually, before sliding out of the cockpit and jumping to the ground. At least she'd managed to dress like eccentric wealth, and few would look at her. Yes, there were definitely some bizarre-looking flying palaces here. And then she felt darkness touch her shoulder in the brilliant morning sunshine. It was so tangible, so dense, that she spun around with her hand on her lightsaber hilt, expecting to find Lumia ready to swing at her. But there was nobody. You want to play games? It was early. A couple of hotel guests in sports clothes jogged by and glanced at her, but ran on. She prowled between the vessels on the strip, feeling the darkness pressing on her sternum like a coronary. Something dark was here, and that meant Lumia. The crushing sensation in her chest was getting so powerful that she ignited her lightsaber's blade, ready to fight when she rounded the next hull. This is it, Lumia. No more games. She sprang into the gap, lightsaber humming. Staring back at her wasn't a veiled figure with a light whip, but a single disembodied flame-red eye ten meters wide. Her instinct said it was alive, an alien being, but it was clearly a ship of some kind. And that meant only one thing. Lumia was inside. It was a trap. Mara was sure of that. Fine. But sometimes traps swallow prey that's way too big for them. She looked over the hull for a hatch, but the roughly textured surface, was it stone, was unbroken. Come inside. Mara wondered why she was thinking that, and then realized the thought was actually a voice inside her head, in the fabric of the Force itself. It was inanimate, yet sentient, and it wasn't a droid. It was the ship. Mara concentrated hard on sensing Lumia, but she could detect nobody inside the vessel. Suddenly an aperture appeared in the hull and a ramp extruded. It was too tempting and she was too old a hand at this kind of game to walk straight in, but she had to know what was going on. The wake ended here. Lumia had used this ship. But I can take her. This is all mind games. I'm not falling for it. If Lumia was waiting within, hiding somehow, then Mara would kill her. If she wasn't, then Mara would sit and wait for her, and kill her then. It was all the same to Mara. She didn't have anything more urgent to do right then. She placed her boot on the ramp and took a few cautious steps. Lightsaber held two-handed. If the hotel had security cams and could see what was going on, it was just too bad. Mara felt bewilderment that wasn't hers. You're not who I expected. It was the ship again. 
What do you mean I'm not who you expected? No. She didn't need to speak. She realized she could think back at this thing. You are very similar. Thanks. Thanks a bunch. Maybe the ship had a high regard for Lumia. Mara decided that it was as good a source as any of information. She thought her next question, not even in words, but in concepts and attitudes, she thought she'd left behind a long time ago. The mental conversation left a taste in her like being a hand again. Where is she, ship? The other one? Close by. You're a thing of the Sith, aren't you? You know darkness well, better than the other one that I expected to see return. Mara didn't know what to make of that, but right then she was prepared to accept that her intent was far more malevolent than Lumia knew how to be. She wanted destruction. She wanted obliteration. Last of your kind, Lumia, and about time. Mara hesitated on the brow of the ramp. She thought for a minute that she might be pulled in, and the spherical ship would then trap her inside and make a run for it. She took the precaution of reaching inside with one hand to place the last of her tiny transponders, her only remaining gadget from her previous existence, just inside the hatch. It attached to the oddly stone-like coating she could feel within. At least if that happened, someone might trace her. And if Lumia ever returned to the ship, the transponder would report her position every time Mara's emitter pinged it. Mara took a cautious breath and lowered her head to look inside. The ship really was empty not just devoid of crew, empty. There was nothing within the hull, no cockpit, no instruments, no systems indicators, nothing. It was hollow, lit by a red glow as if there were a fire burning steadily behind the bulkheads. She hadn't seen that light from the outside. And that was as far as she got. She felt something coming, and she knew what that something was. She took a few steps back down the ramp and waited, lightsaber still extended. A slim figure in a dark gray suit and veiled triangular headdress stepped into the space between the parked ships. Hello, little housewife, said Lumia. Mara's autopilot kicked in, and she was the Emperor's hand again, silent and focused. There was nothing worth saying anyway. Amateurs gave speeches. Professionals got on with the job. She force-leapt five meters at Lumia, slashing down right to left, two-handed. The stroke, all power, no finesse, clipped the Sith's headdress as she sprang back, slicing off a section. Lumia's eyes widened, pupils dilated, but she was already whirling her light whip about her head. The tails crackled and hissed, missing Mara only because she threw all her energy into a force push to slow them a fraction. Mara didn't take that weapon lightly. It was the worst of both worlds. Leather strips studded with impervious Mandalorian iron fragments and tendrils of sheer, raw, murderous dark energy. Mara drew her blaster and rolled under the hull of the ship next to her. The light whip gouged through the durasteel with a shriek of tearing metal, filling the air with the smell of hydraulic fluid, and the spurt of liquid turned into a torrent that began spreading in a thick pool. As Mara rolled clear on the other side of the ship, Lumia landed heavily on both feet and brought the whip down so close to Mara's head that she felt the rush of air on her right cheek like a breath. The crack was deafening. Mara wasn't even thinking when she aimed the blaster. Lumia's whip hand was raised to throw as much weight as possible from the backstroke. A puff of white vapor burst from Lumia's shoulder, and she staggered a few paces. Metal. Maybe I hit metal. 
Maybe she had, because Lumia teetered for a second, but came right back. Mara sprang horizontally from a crouch and cannoned into Lumia's legs with all the power she could muster from the force. She hit solid durasteel. Blood filled her mouth, but she couldn't feel a thing. Yet, clinging to Lumia's knees with one arm, denying her the space to swing the whip, she brought her down like a felled tree before smashing her head into the woman's face. And that hurt. Oh, yes, Mara felt that. She'd caught not Lumia's nose, but the cybernetic jaw, and it cut deep into her forehead. Fighting on pure reflex now, part stunned, she killed the lightsaber blade for a second and held the hilt like a dagger, stabbing it down into Lumia's chest before flicking the energy back on. Lumia pulled to the side as the blade punched through flesh. Mara smelled it. She flicked off the blade to pull back again, triumphant. I've done it. Dead. Dead, you— But Lumia was screaming. And that wasn't right at all. The scream seared through Mara's spinning head. It was more than sound. It was— Mara scrambled to her knees to look down at what should have been a dead woman, and stared into green eyes that were utterly devoid of any emotion. And then the world darkened like an eclipse. Maybe I'm the one who's dead. Something hit her square in the back, pitching her forward onto Lumia. Mara struggled to turn over without letting go of either lightsaber or blaster, but something coiled around her neck and jerked her backward. The light whip was still in Lumia's fist. She could see the thing. She could see it. So what was around her neck choking her? She felt as if she was flying backward at high speed, and then she hit something so hard that it punched every bit of breath out of her lungs and left her gulping for air. A second or two was all it took. Mara lay trying to suck in air in painful, straining gulps, eyes stinging, and saw Lumia's boots run past her face at a stagger, missing her by centimeters. What's in my eyes? What's stinging? She raised her hand to rub them, and her knuckles came away red and wet. It was blood. The last thing she saw as she looked up was the orange sphere, that impossible Sith ship soaring vertically into the air and extending webbed veins like living wings. Mara managed to prop herself up on her elbows. She was suddenly aware of the two runners she'd seen earlier, all nice and neat in their crisp white sports gear, staring at her in horror. She summoned what focus she had and concentrated hard. You've just seen two stunt women performing for a holovid, shot by a hidden cam, she said. You didn't see a fight at all. We didn't see a fight at all, dear, said the woman obediently. The man gawked and then grinned. Wow! It's amazing how real that blood stuff looks. Isn't it? said Mara, and somehow got to her feet retrieved her lightsaber hilt and blaster, and walked off with as much grace as she could manage. I was sure I'd finished her off. How did I miss? She almost sobbed with frustration and struggled to get into the XJ-7's cockpit, still trying to work out what had jumped her from behind. When she checked her injuries in the reflective surface of her data pad, her face was streaked with blood. Her right eye was swelling and closing already, and there was something like a rope burn across her neck. She could see indentations in her skin that looked like a twisted wire cable. Something like a droid jumped me. A machine, anyway. That's why I didn't sense it. It was crazy to fly a fighter after a head injury, she knew, but there was no other way back to Coruscant. She fired up the drives, swearing and cursing. She'd had the cyborg witch right there, her lightsaber in her, and she still hadn't killed her. And I didn't feel any malice from her either, Luke. Just a busted head. 
This was going to take plenty of Bacta. Mara lifted the XJ-7 clear and set it on automatic for the homeward leg. Luke is going to go nuts when he sees me in this state. Her adrenaline was ebbing, and the pain was making itself felt now. She settled into a shallow meditative trance to speed the healing process. Why didn't she kill me? She had the chance. I brained myself on her criffing metal jaw. Then Mara remembered the transponder. She fumbled for the data pad again and activated the search emitter. A yellow blip, no, two yellow blips, showed. One was still on Vulpter, Ben. The other was edging across the grid on her screen, moving away from the core. Lumia. Gotcha, she thought, smiling for a second before she remembered her split lip. Gotcha. Lumia and her bizarre Sith ship were on a bearing for the Hidian Way node. Either she wanted Mara to follow, or she didn't know about the transponder. It was okay. Mara could take her any time now, and two could play the come-and-get-me game. She leaned back in her seat and concentrated on reducing her ripening black eye. Jason Solo's Office Doors Closed G-A-G-H-Q Coruscant Jason played the recording four or five times before he was satisfied. It was a distorted ground-up shot, the sort that endoscopic strip cams tended to capture, but the soundtrack was clear, and the participants in the meeting were clearly identifiable as the G.A. Chief of State and the Corellian Prime Minister. There would be no argument that the two men had met, thrown out the G.A.'s entire defense policy, agreed on private terms for a ceasefire without reference to the Supreme Commander or the Senate, and discussed the removal by assassination of Colonel Jason Solo and Admiral Neofel. This was all he needed to justify the next step. He leaned across his desk and tapped the internal comm. Droids didn't mind how many times they were summoned to the office. H, he said, I need you right away. Certainly, sir, said HM3. The droid took ten minutes to show up. When he clunked in, his arms were laden with data pads and even bound flimsy. He'd come prepared for one of Jason's Explain the Law to Me sessions. Sometimes it was disturbing to meet a droid who could anticipate needs that well. Jason settled for being impressed. It's time to action the amendment, Jason said. If a droid could have registered disappointment on an immobile face, then HM3 did. His voice left no doubt. He enjoyed going through the finer points of administrative law with Jason, probably because nobody else wanted to hear. The fact that he carried the statutes around with him, rather than simply tapping into the GA networked archive, was a sign of his genuine affection for the law. It was an entity to him, not simply words. Let me recap then, sir. HM3 laid the armful of legal reference sources on the desk and pulled out his working data pad. Amend the Emergency Measures Act to include in its scope the GAG's powers to detain heads of state, politicians, and any other individuals believed to be presenting a genuine risk to the security of the Galactic Alliance, and to seize their assets via the Treasury Orders Act. That's the one, Jason said. When might that be enacted? I can circulate it right now, sir and it becomes effective at midnight. You're very regular about these amendments. I've learned a lot about the importance of administrative discipline from you, H. Thank you, sir. So many don't. And my apologies for dragging you in here for so little. Even with a droid, humility and gratitude could go a very long way. HM3 gathered up his source data 
and made for the doors. My pleasure, sir, he said. Jason waited for the doors to close and let out a breath. He steeled himself not to think of Tenelka and Alana, because that was a luxury he couldn't afford at this moment. But he missed them so much, especially Alana, that it hurt him to breathe sometimes when he thought of them. Lumia was occupied elsewhere. There was little chance that she'd catch him reaching out in the force to his family. But he was taking no risks, not now that so many things were coming within his grasp. I've got you now, Cal Omus. I've got you, you fool. At midnight, he would have the legal authority to arrest Chief of State Cal Omus for actions likely to present a risk to the security of the Galactic Alliance. He would notify the Supreme Commander, who was, until 0900 tomorrow, the acting Chief of State in Omus's absence, and who would step into his place if for any reason he couldn't discharge his duties. Like when he's arrested for selling us down the river to the Corellians, and planning to assassinate me and Neothel. She's going to love that bit. It was too late to pull back from the brink now. This had to happen. Neothel knew it was coming, and the promise of power had secured her silence. She needed to take the evidence to Senator Gavli Gassil, chair of the Security Council, to clear her bows, as she liked to put it. Once that nicety was out of the way she could participate in the coup with a clear military conscience. After that, the next stage would be to settle her in the titular role as Chief of State, while consolidating his own power base quietly behind the scenes. Because he wouldn't be part of that structure laughingly called democracy. It was chaos, pure and simple. It was a glorious word to justify abdication of responsibility by those who could, if they were prepared to make the effort, create a better galaxy for the vast majority. It was a word for finding someone else to blame. Democracy, freedom, and peace. They were all tricks, like words used to train Veermox to come to heal or attack. They were sounds with no real meaning, nothing definable, just triggers that everyone had been conditioned to think were desirable, tangible things. Peace. Well, Jason could define that. But democracy? Freedom? Whose freedom? And to do what? Freedom was a pretty nebulous concept, when all most beings wanted was an absence of disorder, a full stomach— and some hoped that their offspring would have a more comfortable life than they had. Jason rubbed his eyes, feeling the lack of sleep of the past week, but determined not to doze even for a few minutes. Shevu hadn't called in. Half the job was done. But Jason didn't yet know what had happened to Gedjin. Whatever had happened, Ben had either shot him or missed by now. Jason switched on HNE, expecting a news flash about the assassination, but it was still showing some nonsense about a Holovid star with an embarrassing personal life. There was nothing to do but fill the waiting time with productive work. He opened the comm to Neothel. I'm sending you something on your secure data link, he said. At one past midnight, I'll be acting on it. Time your visit to Gasil carefully. I think I can manage that, Jason. Wait until you see what I'm sending you, he said. It's rather different watching them carve up our future. Let me know five minutes before you pay your visit. Jason leaned back in his seat and waited for the call from Shevu. And he could still feel that Ben was alive, if not well. 
Charby Spaceport. Vulpter. It was a lockdown. Ben, like everyone else in the crowd, stood still as the Corellian security officer, ministerial protection branch, he guessed, trained his blaster on the crowd. Nobody's going anywhere, he said. This port is being sealed by the Vulpter authorities, and you're all going to be scanned for ballistic residue. Why? a male voice called from the crowd. There's been a projectile shooting, the officer said. A murder. I want you all to wait, nice and calm, and then we'll check you all out, and you'll be free to go. That's going to take hours, someone said. Then it'll take hours, said the officer, and flicked the charge test on his blaster so they could hear the whirr and see the flash of an indicator bar that said he was ready to shoot. I'd really like your cooperation, folks. The hum of murmurs, gasps, clicks, and other varied expressions of horror and impatience swept across the gathering crowd. Ben's gut was knotted tight. He didn't dare look behind him to see where Chevu and Lecauf were. He could feel their presence, and had a good idea of their positions, but that wasn't enough. He needed to see them. Carefully, he turned around and caught Lecauf's eye. He ambled over to him, slowing down as he passed so it wasn't obvious they were together. He'd need to steer clear of Chevu, too. There was no point getting them all arrested. Ben activated his earpiece and spoke, barely moving his lips to contain the whisper. I'm going to find a weak point and get out, he said. He felt everyone could see the rifle folded under his jacket, even though they all seemed far more interested in what was happening beyond the transparent steel doors to the landing area. Red and blue lights were reflecting off the walls as security vehicles streamed onto the field. I can jump anywhere, open any door, remember. I'll make my own way back home. You do that, said Lekauf's voice in his ear, and they'll know it was a Jedi. No force nonsense, said Shevu. Relax, we'll get around this. Contingency plans, gentlemen. I'm covered in trace, sir. Jory, said Chevu. He never normally used Lecauf's first name. Jory, I'm going to... I don't think that's a good use of manpower, sir. Lecauf was moving toward Ben. He looked grim. And you're too far from Ben to do anything about it. Lecauf was right next to Ben now. In the crush of passengers and pilots milling around getting in one another's way, he could press right up against him unnoticed. The lieutenant reached under Ben's coat and grasped the rifle. Ben clamped his arm tight against his side to stop him from taking it. What are you doing? Contingency plan. Let go, Ben. You're going to dump it? Yeah. Yeah, I'm going to get rid of it. What about the ballistic contamination? You can't dump that. Announce it to everyone, why don't you? Lecauf was suddenly master efficient again, like he'd been on the practice range, his slightly goofy good humor gone. He stood chest to chest with Ben, and after a two-second, almost immobile tussle that nobody else could see, he loosened Ben's clamped elbow and slid the folded carpaki under his own jacket. Now stick with the boss. Promise me you will. You're nuts, Jory. Yeah, like Grandad. Ben felt utterly useless. Lecauf had to bail him out of this mess. He should have been able to do it by himself. Some Jedi, some super soldier. He wondered how he'd live this down, and also why he was more worried about that at this moment than about taking a life, even a rotten one like Gedgen's. Lecauf moved back along the terminal hall to the central doors that led onto the landing area. Ben went to follow him, but Chevu stepped into his path casually, as if being rude and careless to a stranger. Whatever happens, 
he said, almost inaudible, lips barely moving. You're to stick with me and follow me unless I get grabbed, and in that case get back to base any way you can. They'd war-gamed a few scenarios in briefings, including getting split up or captured. But this all felt very different now. Lecalf was at the main doors, looking as if he were trying to check where the tourer was. Then, without warning, he grabbed a woman tight around her neck, drew his blaster, and held it to her temple. "'Open the doors!' he yelled. "'Open them now, or I blow her head off!' Pandemonium broke out. People scattered, leaving a clear area around Lecalf. Security officers and the Corellian cops struggled against the tide of bodies trying to get clear, blasters held high. Lecalf was suddenly doing an amazing job of looking red-faced and dangerous. How's he going to pull this off? We're surrounded, locked in. This hadn't been in the briefings. Lecalf was improvising. He had to be. Ben broke away from Chevu and pushed through the crowd. I said, open the triffing doors, or you'll be scraping her off the ceiling. Lecalf clicked the blaster, and the woman hostage started shrieking. A thin little wail at first that rose into a full-blown panting sequence of screams and yelps. You're going to let me board my ship and leave here, and she gets to live. Don't mess with me. Don't, Criffing, mess with me! Just let the lady go, said the officer. He pushed through and stood at the edge of the cleared floor area. Just put the blaster down. Let her go. So you can spray my brains all over the terminal? Yeah, as if. Kid, this isn't going to do you any good. We can talk. Yeah, like you'll have a nice chat with me about Gedgen. I killed this scumbag and I'm proud of it. He was caving into the G.A., lining his own pockets. I'm a patriot. You hear? I love Corellia. They ought to give me a medal. The officer gestured to the security guard at the exit, and the doors parted. Ben watched in horror, unable to move. Lecalf backed out of the doors, half dragging and half carrying the terrified hostage, and made his way laboriously to the tour. It seemed to take forever. It was a long, long way to struggle with a woman in a headlock, edging backward, followed by a slowly moving knot of police and guards waiting for the first slip that would give them a clear shot at him. Ben wanted to run after him and help, but had no idea what to do. Even if he created a diversion, they were all still trapped one way or another. Lecalf activated the tourer's ramp, and backed up it. The woman had stopped screaming and started sobbing. Okay, out. Now! Shavu was right behind Ben, mouth right next to his ear, and he grabbed his collar in a slow, twisting grip to show he meant business. Slow and calm. Don't waste this. He's bought us time. Ben wanted to yell, but what about him? He didn't, though. He'd already abandoned too much of his training, and this wasn't the way soldiers did it. His legs were shaking under him. Lecalf reached the top of the ramp and shoved the woman down it. The hatch slammed behind him, leaving the hostage crying and screaming on the permacrete. Police rushed forward to grab her. Marksmen moved in to take up positions around the vessel. Now everyone else in the terminal was forgotten and the Corellian officer ran onto the field, met up with his buddy, and ran for the cordon. Then that's it. Come on. Chevu jerked on his collar, pulling him bodily toward the doors at the south end of the terminal. A little bit of Ben was calculating where they would be placing troops and what their tactics would be for stopping Lecalf from taking off. If Lecalf got a move on, he could be out of orbit and jumping to light speed before whatever excuse Vulpter had for a fleet could get airborne. But the tourer sat on the permacrete, silent, no haze of heat exhaust venting from its jets. He could see it through the transparasteel walls as he moved toward escape, and couldn't feel relief. 
It dawned on Ben that Lecalf wasn't going anywhere. Maybe the thing had failed to start. Oh, no, no, no! The drive hadn't stalled on him. Ben could feel Lecalf now, terrified, oddly triumphant, and with a strange sense of peace despite the dread. It was the strangest combination Ben had ever sensed in the Force. What's he doing, sir? How's he getting out? Shevu kept swallowing. Ben saw the lump in his throat bob up and down. Has to be done. What has to be done? A good cover story. I don't... Ben, move it. Now! Shevu grabbed his arm so hard that it hurt and hauled him across the permacrete to the shuttle. The tourer was now surrounded by police and armed guards. Lines of security droids were clearing an outer cordon and moving back vessels that were parked too close. Don't blow this mission. The job's done. But Jory's going to be arrested. He can't sit there forever. We can't leave him. And what happens when they interrogate him? Because they're going to find— Ben, shut up, and that's an order. There's nothing we can do. Ben couldn't believe it of Shevu. He could have struggled free and gone to help Lekauf and— And what? He couldn't use his force powers in public. He couldn't take on a small army of police. He couldn't risk arrest and discovery. He still wanted to go to Lekauf's aid. No comrade left behind, that was the rule. Same for troopers as it was for Jedi. Same for every tight-knit group who faced danger together. We can't leave him, Ben sobbed, and was about to change his mind and let the G.A. and the Jedi Council sort out their own troubles if he was arrested and found to be Luke Skywalker's son carrying out political assassinations. We just can't abandon him! As he stared broken-hearted at the battered tour. A massive explosion sent it flying into a thousand fragments, shooting a column of flame and roiling smoke high into the air, almost knocking Ben off his feet. Police scattered. Those who could ran. Some were blown meters. It all seemed to take place in slow motion and silence. And then the sound rushed back in, and time resumed normally. The captain still had a grip on Ben's arm like a vice. Ben's lips moved, but he couldn't hear himself. Yes, Shevu said softly, and dragged Ben as he craned his neck to stare back at the wreckage and flames, numb, shocked, and lost. Now we can. Chapter 11 Breaking news. We're just getting reports that Corellian Prime Minister Dirk Gedgen has been shot dead at a spaceport on Vulpter Deep Core by a Corellian terrorist. Early reports indicate that an armed siege followed the shooting, but that appears to have ended when the assassin blew himself up in his ship on the landing strip. We'll have more on this story later. HNE Newsflash Slave One, laid up outside Keldabe, Mandalore. It was a very interesting news day. Fett had his cockpit monitor turned to the news channel, watching the wheels come off the rest of the galaxy. He'd seen that happen often enough to spot the signs of greater chaos to come. Usually it meant a time of good fees and rich pickings for bounty hunters. Now his priorities had to be a little different, and he waited for a call from the office of Sas Sikili. The Verpine, whose job was to communicate with outsiders on behalf of Roche. The Verpine were getting anxious. How any species that churned out that many high-quality ornaments could get anxious, Fett didn't understand. But that was the Verpine for you. Insectoids could get jumpy. And when one got jumpy, the hive mind made them all jittery. Fett pondered the assassination while he waited. He couldn't say he was sorry to see the passing of Durgedjan, but at least the barve paid promptly. Fett had been betting on him staying in office for more than a few short months before getting the inevitable shot in the head, though. It was indecently premature, 
even by the standards of Corellian politics. Who had really killed him? Not some Corellian hick waving the flag, that was for sure. Gedgen had a line of would-be killers that would have stretched from here to the core. Mandalore Fett, said a voice on the comm. It was high-pitched, a little above tenor, and buzzed with a faint resonance. We noted your return with delight. Need someone dragged screaming to your hive, Sekili? Not today, thank you. But we have a business proposition for you. I'm all ears. Ah, we hear exciting things about iron deposits, which we assume to be true. They are. And many highly desirable things can be made with Mandalorian iron. We would like to acquire some. Happy to sell. When we have a surplus for export. We note the unstable nature of the galaxy these past months, which will be exacerbated, we expect, by the passing of Prime Minister Gedjin. Yeah. Good times for the arms trade. Indeed. But also anxious times for us, when Mercana challenges our markets. And now Kem Stor I talks of war with Mercana, which is too close for the hive's taste. You pack enough hardware to make Mercana and Chemstor I into their own asteroid field, Sikili. Half their kit comes from Roche. Spit it out. We are a literal people, Fett. I'm literal, too. Let's all be literal together. Sikili went quiet for a moment. Fett could hear the faint clicking of his mouthparts. Now that you have abundant Beskar, you'll rearm. Roche may be outside of your sector, but the last time Mandalorians had plenty of Beskar, the Mandalore sector became much, much bigger. Verpine took a little time to explain where they were heading, grinding through each step of the sequence, but they got there in the end. You're worried we'll expand all over you, said Fett. Invade you. Yes, it's the specialty of your species. We're homebodies now. We like to put up our feet and watch the holovids. When you make jokes, the hives become more worried, because you're not a joking man. Therefore... It was getting painful and he didn't want to hear Sikili's character analysis. Fett found it amusing that he hadn't threatened or hinted about the fate of Roche, or even thought much about it. But that had always been part of his armory, as it had been for the Mandalorians as a whole. They had a certain reputation that did the advance work for them. Sign a treaty with us, then, he offered. To do what, Fett? Non-aggression pact. Neighborly mutual aid. You have nothing to fear from us. So you'll want something in exchange. Because you're a mercenary and... Bounty hunter. Part-time. What I want is the mutual bit. What can we do for you to avoid being added to your collection? Supply us with exclusive products, in exchange for our exclusive metal. We give you our special skills, military strength, and you give us yours in defense technology and quality control. Maybe even joint work on new projects. Ah, you Mandalorians have always adopted technology from others. You might forcibly adopt ours now. Deal's on the table. You made me notice you. Bad idea. Sikili was silent again. Verpines had a way of communicating instantly with all hive members through some organ in their chests. Fett guessed that Sikili was consulting the hive. 
Deal accepted. We'll need details. I'll get my people to talk to your people. Fett could imagine the reaction on Coruscant. And Corellia. We look forward to a long and productive alliance with Roche. We will announce this happy and reassuring news. Good day, Fett. The good thing about literal-minded insectoids was that they were transparent in their business dealings. No games, no bluff, and usually no skipping out on deals. Fett wondered if he should have talked it through with the clans first, but it was his prerogative to choose Mandalore's allies, and teaming up with the best technologists in the galaxy wasn't going to upset anybody. Not on Mandalore, anyway. It would certainly ruin everyone else's day. So people think we're rearming. We are, but not for the reasons they think. This could be... Interesting. He secured Slave One, out of habit, rather than mistrust of his own people, and took the speeder bike up to the woodland where he'd reburied his father's remains after exhuming them on Geonosis. Aelin was laid to rest there, too, but Myrta was clearly still uneasy about not returning her to Kifu. She seemed to see the interment as a temporary stopover. He'd marked the graves with simple stones, because it mattered to him to be able to find them again, although he had never been one for visiting graves. Not even yours, Dad. Now he was going to put that right. He had no excuse. He wasn't a galaxy away. All the times I've traveled from world to world, all the light years I've covered, and I never called in at Geonosis to pay my respects. Fett grasped briefly at an excuse in his Mandalorian roots. Bevin had always told him it was the armor that mattered to Mandalorians, not the decayed shell abandoned by the spirit. I did that, didn't I? I recovered my dad's armor and left his body. I did that much, at least. Nomadic mercenaries couldn't have cemeteries, and they couldn't carry corpses with them. It was probably based on pragmatism. But Mandalorians, with few exceptions, like the Mandalores, still didn't have elaborate shrines and graves even here. The clearing in the woods was a peaceful, unspoiled spot, somewhere the Yuzhan Vong hadn't managed to destroy. Tall, silver-leaved Galek trees, centuries old, fringed an area of spongy moss and short yellow grass, giving the spot an air of permanent sunlit calm even on an overcast day. Even before Fett set down the speeder bike, he could see Myrta kneeling by her mother's grave, staring down at it, with Gesorade, Novak Vevut's son, staring at her. Their helmets were placed to one side. She had a funny idea of romance, that girl, but Orade seemed close to besotted, so maybe he didn't care where he had to follow her. They both looked around and watched Fett as he approached. He tried to avoid crushing clumps of fragile amber ferns. Tell me if I'm interrupting, Fett said. Orade looked up at him and got to his feet. Here's the deal. You break her heart. I break your legs. Deal, said Orade. He had a sharp-featured, pale face and a scrap of bright blonde beard. See you later, Myrta. Myrta looked past Fett to watch Orade leave, and then glared at him. I suppose that's your idea of protective concern, Babuir. Meant it, Fett said. You're no use to me when you're emotional. So, what did you want me for? Didn't. Just came to visit Dad's grave. Her nerf-frying stare softened, probably from embarrassment. 
weeping together over Aelin just that one time, hadn't opened the emotional floodgates and given them a blood-bound relationship cemented by shared grief. It was, and probably always would be, wary and restrained. I'll come back later, Fett said. No, I was just leaving anyway. Okay, let's both stand around in awkward silence for a while, and I'll give you a ride back to town. For some reason, the one thing that never embarrassed Fett was admitting his love for his father. He didn't care if that made him look soft. People said it didn't, especially if they wanted to carry on breathing. He hooked both thumbs in his belt and contemplated the slight depression in the soft, mossy ground, realizing he should have filled the grave with more soil to allow for settling. I'm not doing too bad, Dad. Did you ever have to make domestic policy when you were Mandalore? Or did you just fight? I suppose you know I'm dying. The last thought caught him unawares. Fett believed in decomposition and eternal oblivion. He'd dealt them out so many times, he knew what awaited him. It was Bevin and his talk of the Manda that had him falling into those stupid thoughts about eternity. I knew you were basically okay when you split the heart of fire to bury half with Mama, Myrta said quietly. I'm not sentimental. A real scumbag would have kept the stone intact and sold it. Fett resented the interruption of his one-sided conversation with his father. Maybe if I'd left it whole, somebody could have read the information in it. He straightened up, arms at his side. Are you done here? Myrta shrugged, collected her helmet, and began walking toward the speeder. It was an answer of sorts. They set off for Keldabe. There were no straight roads. It made ambushing and pinning down would-be invaders a lot easier. What does everyone else do with bodies? Fett asked. Turn left when we get to the river, and I'll show you. Myrta seemed to have taken this born-again Mondo thing seriously. Fett had expected her to kick over the traces and turn holy Kifar, like her mother. But she'd jumped to the other extreme. If he hadn't known she wasn't motivated by wealth, he'd have thought she was positioning herself to inherit his fortune. That would have been easier. Right now he had no idea what her motive was. gedjin has been assassinated, by the way, he said, banking the speeder to turn along the course of the Kalita River. Heard it on the news. Good, she said. She was definitely his granddaughter. Slimy Shabuir. I put the full fee for Sal Solo in a trust fund for you. Thanks. You didn't have to. No, I didn't. There it is. What? The grave. Fett couldn't see anything. Just lush water meadows flanked by rich pasture. Vibrantly green even after harvest time. They said the area had beaten the Yuzhan Vong's attempts at environmental destruction because the fast-flowing water in the meadow and the river carried the poisons away downstream. Even to Fett's urban and unagricultural eye, it looked like rich soil. Where? Try your terahertz GPR. Fett blinked his ground-penetrating radar into life. When he looked at the land now, he saw the variations in density and the pockets of less compacted soil. He also saw clusters of lines and debris so tangled together that he couldn't make out what they were. It's a mass grave, Myrta said. Fett stopped the speeder, and they got off to look. 
his boots squelched in the sodden grass. And while it was far from the first time he'd walked on a carpet of the dead, this felt vaguely uncomfortable. Lost a lot of people, he said. More than a million. Nearly one in three Mandalorians had died defending the planet. Myrta seemed to be expecting some statesmanlike behavior, so he tried. And no memorial. This isn't a war grave, Myrta said. Mondoade usually bury in mass graves anyway. We all become part of the Manda. We don't need a headstone. The exceptional fertility of the soil suddenly made sense. There was no point wasting organic material. Manda. Collective consciousness. Oversoul. We don't do heaven. Fat winced. I know what it is. And it gives back to the living. You'll get a marked grave, of course, being Mandalore. Unless you choose not to. Probably just to make sure they know the old Mandalore won't show up again to reclaim the title. Maybe just to show respect. Has it occurred to you? Fed asked. That all this is a rationalization of the fact that Mandalorians were always on the move, couldn't maintain graves, and needed to dispose of lots of corpses? And that it's free fertilizer? Myrta took off her helmet, probably to let him see the full thundercloud of her disapproval. There's nothing profound that you can't reduce to banality, is there? I'm a practical man. We're a practical people. We. Kifu had ceased to exist for her. But there's nothing wrong with seeing the bigger picture. Can I opt out of the Manda? I'm not spending eternity with Mantras or Vizhla. Or do we take guests from other species? If we adopt them in life... Makes sense we take them afterward. So what about the rest of the galaxy? Myrta seemed about to spit something vitriolic at him, but instead sighed, jammed her helmet back in place, and went back to the speeder. Fett pondered how tedious it would be if there really were some existence after death, especially if it weren't ticket only. The one person he wanted to see again was his father. The rest of the dead, loved and hated, but mostly just unloved and dismissed, could stay dead. He resolved to keep his mouth shut in the future. It had always been the best policy in the past, and meaningful conversation was one of the few things he couldn't seem to master. He took her into the center of Kaldabe, following the twisting course of the Kalita, skimming above its meanders and river cliffs. The ancient river had gradually kinked back on itself as it ground away patiently at the banks, and it looked as if one good flood would break the narrow necks of land and straighten the course again. A quick inspection with his helmet GPR showed dried-up oxbow lakes pressed like hoofprints into the land on either side. Until the crab boys had showed up, most of Mandalore had been as it had since before humans arrived, primeval, wild, and still full of the undiscovered. Fett hated the Yuzhan Vong afresh for ruining that. Novak Vevut, Orade's father, built and repaired weapons. He was in the yard of the workshop that also served as his house, machining blaster parts. Fett shut the speeder down at the entrance, and Myrta slid off the saddle. Vevut pushed his transparent protective visor back onto the top of his head and gave them both a big grin. Ah, nice to see you two doing stuff together, he said. Oh, see, Kier, fat, are we going to be related? Myrta looked at him with a warmth she didn't direct at her own grandfather. 
Fat hadn't picked up on how far the relationship with Vevut's son had progressed then. If Beskar is such a good defense, how come you've got so many scars, Buir? she teased. Forgot to wear your helmet? She'd called him Papa. Vevut grinned. I cut myself shaving. With a Trandoshan. Merry guess, and I'll make you a blaster that can take the head off a dozen Trandoshans with one shot. You know how to turn a girl's head, she said, and removed her helmet and boots before disappearing into the house. Vevut brushed shiny coils of swarf from the grinding bench. His long, woolly black braids were tied back with a piece of string while he worked, but the gold clips strung along them like trophies still rattled and chinked as he moved. Combined with the striking scars in his ebony skin, they made him look formidably battle-hardened. Bevin said the gold had come from his kills over the years, and that he'd melted it down to make the ornate clips. They made Fett's braided Wookiee scalps look low-key. When I adopted Guess, Vevut said, not raising his eyes from the workbench, we had a hard time accepting each other at first, too. He rasped glittering shavings from the metal he was shaping and held it up to check the edge. And I'd known him all his life. His parents were my neighbors. Just because Myrta's your own blood doesn't mean it's automatic. I'll bear that in mind. Any objections to Orade? Myrta's well over thirteen. She can make her own choices. He's a good lad. I know. Fett's own inability to cope with partners was no reason for him to have any opinion on his granddaughter's life but he meant it about breaking Orade's legs. It was a paternal reflex that came out of nowhere. I did a deal with the Verpine government today. We now have a non-aggression pact with Roche, provided they share tech with us. Vevut stopped rasping sharp edges. Hey, I didn't even hear us fire any shots. They heard the word Beskar. I do believe good times are on their way again, Mandalore. If you feel like sitting in when we talk weapons with them, your views would be useful. Okay. I'll leave my bug spray at home as a mark of respect. I'd better tell the clans, in case anyone's thinking of signing up for Chemstor Eye. The Verpine would be upset about that. It was a good, relaxed way to run a nation. Fett sent word out via his data pad and waited for objections, not expecting any. Apart from questions like the discounts that might now be available on custom Verpine weapons, the chieftains took the news in their stride. It was as if Mandalorians saved all their passions for two things, their families and their wars. Fett returned to Bevin's farm via the river and paused to look at the vast mass grave again. Most species found the words unmarked mass grave the stuff of horror, the worst possible end to life. And yet Mandalorians chose it. Fett, on the cusp between Mondo and Arueti, despite his title, tried to see his people as the Aruetise saw them to fully understand the fear just a few million of them could cause simply by existing. Detached, he saw an invading army wiping out whole species, fighting galactic wars, destroying everything in its path. And he saw mercenaries and bounty hunters, unemotional masked dealers in death. The image burned into the collective galactic psyche was one of violent savages, thieves, and looters, whose temporary loyalty to anyone but their own could be bought, but never guaranteed. It happened to be almost completely true, except the bit about loyalty. Most people didn't understand the nature of a contract. 
and they never got close enough to see Mandalorians at peace. Come to that, not many Mandalorians did either. It was a restless galaxy. Fett resigned himself to existing in no man's land. To Mondo for the outsider, but not Mondo enough for some of the clans. And made his way back to Slave One, which was still the haven in which he preferred to sleep. He hoped Bevin wasn't offended. Worrying about someone else's feelings was a novelty. And Fett knew what Bevin would say about the psychology of sleeping in a spacecraft when a perfectly comfortable home, any number of homes, was available. When Fett reached the ship and unlocked the hatch by remote, he found a message waiting for him. It could have been relayed straight to his HUD, but Jang Skirata did things his own idiosyncratic way. I see you did right by Mandalore. I'll do right by you. Fett hadn't judged wrong then. He dropped his dose of capsules into his palm and washed them down with a mix of water and the cocktail of liquid drugs that Bellwine had prescribed. It was just slowing down his decline, not stopping it. Jang hadn't said he'd succeeded. Death's a motivator, not a threat. You've still got things to achieve before you become fertilizer. You'll just have to do them sooner rather than later. Fett switched on the monitor in his cramped quarters and sat back with a pack of dry rations to watch the news as Corellia went into meltdown, and the Verpine government of Roche announced talks with Mandalore to agree to a mutual aid and trade treaty. Then he took out the black book his father had left him. He'd listened to every message recorded in it more than a hundred times, and studied his father's image in it. When he was afraid he was beginning to forget what Django Fett once looked like, he'd take it out and run the messages again. He hadn't forgotten. Not a pore, not a hair, not a line. But he ran it again anyway, and decided tomorrow might be a very good day to go public on the Besulik. Jedi Council Chamber, Coruscant, Emergency Meeting This one, said Master Saba Sabatine, would like to be assured that the Alliance had nothing to do with Gedjin's death. It was unnecessary. Luke couldn't blame her for jumping to conclusions. It was his first thought, too and his second was that the G.A.'s agents, or even Jason, had a hand in it. But the assassin had, it seemed, sealed himself in his ship and blown it up, a Corellian-registered ship scattering solidly Corellian evidence. Luke had seen crazier things than that. It was a zealot's act, and all too common. There are plenty of Corellians with reasons to want Gedjin dead, he said, where had Mara got to? He half expected her to stride through the doors of the chamber, carrying Lumia's head in triumph. But I'll conduct my own investigations. Corin Horn looked up from his clasped hands, which he'd been studying with unnatural concentration. It couldn't have been easy watching his homeworld plunge into recrimination and finger-pointing. It's less about who actually did it than who the various factions think did it, and that won't be influenced by anything as irrelevant as hard facts. Well, I need to know, and I don't want HNE telling me, Luke said. Kip, can you monitor the headlines while we're meeting? Time was, said Kip Duran, when the government of the day used to keep the Jedi Council informed, and we didn't have to rely on the media. Yes, Luke had noticed that the Council was no longer kept in the loop. He returned to the main issue. So what if it is us? So far everyone had managed to avoid mentioning Jason. Kyle Katarn joined in. 
Is assassinating heads of state legal? In a war, I believe it is. Fine time for Omus to be away, said Katarn. If I were the paranoid type, I'd say it was spooky that he was out of town. Location undisclosed at the same time that Gedjin was shot. Better test him for ballistic residues when he gets back to the office. This isn't a joking matter, said Kip. Okay, sorry, but it's lousy timing. Luke thought Neathal had done a commendable job of looking calm and reassuring for the media. It had been a few hours since the news had broken, and the news channels had wheeled out every analyst, politician, and air taxi pilot who had ever held an opinion on Der Gedgen. Neathal, quite splendid in her white uniform, was impressive. She looked as if being chief of state was just another job she did when everyone else was too busy. She'd scored a lot of points. And Luke hadn't had a chance to call Han or Leia. That was his next task, as soon as he got out of this meeting. They'd know what was really happening, if anyone did. Come on, Mara. Where are you? So how does this change things? Kyle asked. Who's going to be leading the Confederation now? Is it going to stay a Corellian thing? If it's the Bothans, said Corin, force preserve us. Luke was still waiting for word from Neothel. The Jedi Council wasn't part of government, and while Omis was away, it wasn't getting instant answers. Luke realized how fragile and informal the relationship between government and council could be when different people were holding the reins. Just to spice up the mix, the Mandalorians are joining forces with the Verpine. Kip seemed to be listening to the news via an earpiece, judging by the glazed and defocused look in his eyes. What does that sound like to you? Luke thought of Fett's dead daughter, Jason's guilt, and Fett's track record. He'd been awfully quiet, worryingly so. They're rearming, Luke said. They said they were staying neutral, Duran said. Kyle shook his head slowly, brushing specks from his lap in a distracted way. Oh, yeah. If my long-lost daughter was tortured to death by the G.A.'s secret police, I'd be neutral. First thing I'd do, walk away and be very, very neutral. You don't have to be on one of two sides to rearm, or even take part in a war, Luke said. Still, nobody had said the J-word, but Luke could hear the name at the back of every mind. Well, we know a few facts. Kyle counted off on his fingers. One, Mandalorians aren't exactly heavily represented in social services and the caring professions. Two, they have a brand new supply of that iron of theirs for their war machine. Three, allying with the Verpine makes them the single most powerful producer of advanced weapons technology. Four, I hear they're still sore about getting no help to rebuild post-war when they went out on a limb for the New Republic. It's not good, is it? said Corin. I'm betting they'll step up for Corellia in the next few days. Fett said to have killed Sal Solo or at least one of his Mondo thugs did. Where does that leave them? Luke had heard the real story from Han. Never had he missed the good old clear-cut days of rebellion versus empire, good against demonstrable evil, as much as he had right then. The trouble with taking away the certainty of evil was that its vacuum was filled by all kinds of more nebulous threats, rivalries, and feuds. It became increasingly hard to judge where the threat was coming from. 
if it hadn't been so ingrained in the nature of most species, Luke would have seen it as a Sith plot. It would have been so much simpler. I think we should offer Jedi mediation to both the G.A. and Corellia, as far as the assassination goes, he said. I know it sounds bizarre in the middle of a war, but there's war with rules, and then there's war with no holds barred, and we need to— The doors opened, and Mara walked in. Sorry I'm late, she said. Ran into a few problems. She managed to stop the meeting dead. Luke stared in horror at her face. She had a black eye and split lip. She was holding herself as if her ribs hurt. She settled into her seat in the circle with slow care. Ran into an armored division, more like, said Kip, staring. What happened to you? And where shall we send the flowers for the other guy? And this is after a healing trance. She smiled, and it was genuine, but there was definite anxiety. Luke could feel it. It was all he could do not to abandon the meeting there and then and go to her. How had he not felt what was happening to her? Sorry to interrupt, she went on. I assume we're worrying about the implications of Gedjin's death? And Mandalorian rearmament. Forget that for just a second, Luke said. Mara, I need to know what happened to you. Why, darling, thank you for asking. I'm very well. Just a flesh wound. She shook her head in disbelief, but it seemed aimed at herself. Look, I caught Lumia. She's in a worse state than I am, believe me. And? The situation's under control. Where is she? I'm tracking her to her base. All eleven council members were waiting in complete silence for Mara's next words. She looked at the other Jedi around her, gently pushed Luke's unspoken inquiry and concern out of her mind with a firm later, and settled back in her chair. Luke couldn't pin it down, but she was in turmoil under that facade. "'It's no good looking at me like that,' she said. "'I'm not discussing it. I'm not sharing the mission, and I'm not going to take it easy, which I'll bet is going to be someone's suggestion. Yes?' "'Mara hath spoken,' said Kip. "'But that doesn't stop me asking where Lumia is and what she's driving.' Nice try, but go find your own deranged Darksider to play with, because Lumi is mine. Corin gave Luke a knowing smile. She's fine. Mara was certainly satisfied about something, but not so content about something else. Luke would find out later. He moved the meeting on. Can we actually do anything about the Gedjin situation here and now? There was a chorus of a reluctant no around the circle. Okay, then. All we can do is keep an eye on the situation. And I've got a request in with Omis's secretary to see him as soon as he gets back. You know what happens if heads of state are away when a crisis breaks, Kip pointed out. They take a pounding in the polls, and it's the beginning of the end. Let's make the most of Omis while we can. Who's friendly with Neofel? They all turned to look pointedly at Silgal. She tilted her head slightly to fix Luke with one eye. Always a disconcerting thing in a Moan Calamari. Just because we're Moan Cals, Luke, it doesn't mean we have guaranteed harmony. We come from different schools of thought. You're Akbar's niece, and I bet that counts for a lot with a Moan Cal admiral. I'll do my best, then. The meeting broke up, Mara remaining seated. Corin patted her on the head like an indulgent uncle as he passed, and then wagged a silent warning finger. Get that black eye seen to. Luke waited until everyone was well out of earshot, and then walked over to squat in front of Mara and put his hands on her knees. 
You can't keep this from me. I headbutted her, that's all. Metal jaw, non-metal head. If you got that close, how did she get away? Oh, bad question. Luke braced for an onslaught about shaking hands again. I mean, I think she has a droid with her. Something jumped me from behind, and it wasn't organic. Mara showed him a discolored mark like a rope burn at the front of her neck. Whatever it is, it can pay out a metal cable. And she has this weird spherical ship like a disembodied orange eye. Don't you think all that's a good case for not hunting her alone? She wants me to catch up with her. I'll be extra ready next time, and there will be a next time. He'd promised her. If anyone could take Lumia, Mara could. And he knew he had to put his own fixation with Lumia out of his mind, stop it from clouding his judgment. He'd give Mara a little more time. But wondered how he'd feel if she came home battered and bruised like this again. Chasing individual dark Jedi was far more difficult and time-consuming than he'd bargained for. Sometimes he wondered why Lumia and Alima had proved so much harder to hunt and deal with than a whole empire. But that was the answer. The empire, by its very size and pervasiveness, was everywhere. It was hard to avoid finding it. But two Jedi with concealment skills could vanish very effectively in an entire galaxy. It would always be a case of getting them to come to him. Or Mara. But you'll be home for dinner tonight, Luke said. Don't spend all night working again. Believe me, I'll be home, she said. That's where I'm heading now. I'd better see what Han and Leia have to say about Gedjin, while I hang around the Senate and wait for Omas. If I'm still sitting at home with a congealing plate of Nerf casserole at midnight... Okay. Dinner at eight. Set in Permacrete. Luke walked down the corridor with her in silence, and she gave him a conspiratorial grin as the turbolift doors closed. He opened his secure comlink and called Han. I'm not in mourning, Han said, utterly callous in that charming way he had. Luke knew he didn't care for Gedjin, and never had. It was hard to weep for a man who approached you to kill your own cousin, even if that cousin was a grade-A scumbag. No need to spare my feelings. He was a headshot waiting to happen. What's the public mood like over there? There hasn't exactly been a run on morning clothes, but folks are nervous. So who's at the helm in Coronet now? They're slugging it out. For the while, it's going to be a committee job. Who do you think did it? The biggest task Corsac has is to work out how to manage the lines of suspects. Not that they need to dig up any. Two different terror groups here have already claimed responsibility for it. Yes, we have them too. I never realized how divided you all were. We're never divided about Corellia. Just who's the best candidate to run it? Are you and Leia okay? Yes, we're fine. And no, I'm not telling you what we're doing at the moment. Stop worrying. Luke almost raised the topic of a GA smokescreen. It was fairly common to carry out a hit and set it up to look like another faction to achieve maximum discord. But he thought better of it because it smacked of Jason, and Han didn't need to hear that his best friend thought his son, stranger though he was, had a hand in it. Some things were best dealt with by friends, cleaned up and smoothed over. When Lumia was finally brought down, Luke would spend his time putting Jason back on track. It was the least he could do for Han. Omus couldn't have picked a worse day to visit his doctor, but it was unusual for him to be so reticent about routine arrangements. Luke hoped it wasn't something serious. 
it was bad enough losing Gedjin, because at least he was a known quantity, and Luke had become used to his way of thinking. If Omis's future was in doubt, too, well, that was one unknown too many. Coruscant Military Spaceport Ben sat in the cargo hold of the ship, long after the ground crew had secured the landing dampers and the drives had cooled completely. He was almost comfortable staring at the bulkhead opposite, in the sense that he feared taking his eyes off it. If he did that, the numbing meditation he'd slipped into would be broken, and he'd have to think. Jory LeCouf was gone. It was one of those facts he couldn't take in, even when he saw it happen. The guy had been alive and well the night before, even hours ago, and now he didn't exist. Ben simply couldn't feel death. It was more than the biological facts, and he knew those all too well. The former CSF officers in the GAG had regaled him with fascinating stories from the police forensics labs. But knowing how to cause death and what it looked like, and being able to feel a life wink out of existence in the Force, did nothing to hammer home the fact that his friend was gone forever, and that he wouldn't see him again. And all the things that made Jory LeCouf part of the fabric of the universe, someone who mattered, were so far beyond his reach. And it was Ben's fault. LeCouf had died to protect him. Come on, Ben. The Tex want to start stripping down this crate. Captain Chevu stood in the hatch, fingers hooked over the top edge of the combing. Ben felt that if he moved, the whole world would come unraveled. I'll be along in a minute. Chevu waited for a moment, and then came to sit down with him. Ben suspected that if he'd been a grown man, Chevu might have been harsher, but he thought Ben was still a kid, too young to be on this kind of mission whether he was a Jedi or not. In many ways, Chevu was right. But nobody was ever old enough to lose a friend and not feel it cutting through to the center of his chest. If Ben ever got that old, he didn't want to carry on. We don't lose many troopers in special forces. It makes it harder when we do, I think. It's hard for me, anyway. Ben gambled on whether to speak or not. He took a breath and waited to feel everything around him shatter. He didn't have to die, sir. Once he heard his own voice, Ben just felt like he couldn't breathe. Nothing worse. He could have taken off. We could have run for it, or even been captured. And the job would still have been done. Ben, our orders were to make it look like a Corellian schism, and not to get caught or leave a trail. Can't have Jedi exposed as assassins, especially not you. We had to get you out of there. It didn't have to be me. Any trooper could have done the job. I wanted to do my duty, but if it hadn't been me, if Jory hadn't felt he had to protect my identity, he'd be alive. Ben, what do you think would have happened to him if he'd been taken back to Corellia? Chevu lowered his voice. You saw what we do here to prisoners. You think worse than that can't happen in Coronet? So what if I had been caught? My dad would have been humiliated? So what? Jory's life for dad being upset? I could give you a list of reasons why having Corellia think their own kind did it helps the G.A. But you don't want to hear that right now. Chevu stood up and beckoned Ben to follow. He meant it. There are anti gedjin factions claiming responsibility. So the mission worked fine. Strategically. Now go home and take a couple of days off. If you can't stand being around your folks or... or around Colonel Solo, 
Come over to my place. My girlfriend won't mind. It was the first time Ben had heard Chevu hint that being around Jason wasn't necessarily the best thing for him. Ben didn't care about Jason right then. But the rational bit of his mind that wasn't drowning in shocked grief made a note of it. Thanks. Now I've got to tell his parents. I'll have to come up with a really good cover story, and thank Providence that there's no footage of him splashed all over the news right now, because that'd be a really lousy way to find out your son was dead. Chevu sounded beaten. He was probably pretty close to Lecauf, but he'd never said. Ben had learned a lesson about being an officer today, and it was that lives were to be spent in pursuit of an objective. It might have seemed obvious, but when you worked alongside the people who might lose their loved ones because of your decisions, it acquired a whole new meaning. I don't think I'll ever stop feeling guilty about this, Ben said, relieved that he had so far managed not to burst into tears. Me neither, said Chevu, because it was supposed to be me who blew the ship if things went wrong. We never planned that you didn't. We did. Need to know and all that. Chevu stopped a passing ground crew speeder and told the driver to get Ben back to HQ. Wash that stuff out of your hair and go home. An hour later, Ben found himself staring at his familiar reflection in the HQ refreshers, toweling his hair and wondering if Jason had set him up. I didn't have to do the job. Any one of us could have passed unnoticed at a spaceport. But it was hindsight. Jason had tasked him to do it, before anyone knew where the meeting would take place. Ben still felt something was wrong, but couldn't pin it down. He'd just lost his buddy. Maybe that made you think crazy things. When he left the HQ building and walked out into the late afternoon sun, completely disoriented by the shifts in planetary time over the last forty-eight hours, he lowered his head and just walked aimlessly, hands in pockets. Suddenly he felt someone's hand on his shoulder. He almost shrieked. He'd shut out everything around him. Then he found he was staring into his mother's face. And something was terribly wrong. Mom! Who hit you? Forget that, Ben. She hugged him to her. A really desperate and crushing embrace. I've got some questions, and I will absolutely not be stalled this time. She had hold of his shoulders, eyes scanning his face as if she was looking for injury. This is between you and me, I swear, not your father. They ended up in a tap calf in the Osarian quarter. The table was greasy, and the elbows of Ben's jacket stuck to it every time he leaned on them. But nobody knew them here. Even if the food had been appetizing and not searingly hot, Ben wasn't hungry. Mara lowered her voice. I want to know why you've been to Vulpter. Ben was stunned. How could she possibly know? Who'd talked? It was completely classified. Most of the GAG hadn't even been briefed on it. I haven't. You can stop the game. I know where you've been, and I have a horrible feeling I know why. The whole planet's seen the news. Mara just stared at him, not blinking. Suddenly not his mom at all. He was supposed to deny everything. He stared back, silent. I could ask Jason, sweetheart, but I'm not sure I could believe him if he told me what the time was. You know I can't talk about my work, Mom. Oh, I know. I've never hidden my past from you, so I know exactly what your work entails. I can talk to you like a grown-up, Ben. 
because once you do the kind of job you're doing, you're not a kid any longer. Do we understand each other? Ben thought of Jory LeCalf and felt his stomach starting to knot and shake. He desperately wanted to blurt out that his buddy had died, and that he wanted to roll time back to before he'd fallen into this mess, and that... that... Mom! He couldn't get it out. She put her hand on his and squeezed. Mom, if I tell you, will you tell me who hit you? Okay. It was Lumia. I caught her, but she got away. I gave her a good hiding, and she won't get away next time. Now, your turn. Ben took a deep breath. This was either going to make everything better, or be the start of something disastrous. He couldn't tell. All his force impressions had deserted him. I did it, Mom. Involved? Or did it? Ben's mouth took over without his permission. Folding stock carpaki. Frangible round. Mara actually sat back in her chair, and her left hand moved as if she was about to put it to her mouth. Her right hand was still clamped tight on his. Okay, she said. Lekauf was killed, Mom. Ben couldn't remember if she knew Lekauf or not. It didn't matter. He needed to say his name and tell someone. Jory got killed. He got killed to save my skin. Mara busied herself sipping from the cup in front of her. Osarians liked very strongly scented herbs, and Ben knew he'd never be able to smell that aroma again without being dragged back to this awful moment. Why did you do it, Ben? Orders? I was the best person to do it. Your whole company is suddenly short of snipers? Whose orders? Jason. Mara was doing a reasonable job of not reacting. But Ben wasn't fooled. She was furious. He could see it in the whiteness of her skin, and the contrast with the yellowing bruise around her eye made it even more noticeable. Okay, sweetheart, she said. Let's not tell your dad because he'll rip Jason's head off in the mood he's in at the moment. Can you face coming home? I don't think I can sit and have dinner and not talk about this to him. Okay. So where are you planning on going? Home? Jason's apartment. Ben could see she wasn't keen on the idea. Or Captain Chevu's place. Wherever you feel safest, Ben, I won't force you to come back with me, as long as you swear you'll come to me the second you have problems. Okay? Okay. I'm sorry about your friend. I really am. Nobody's ever going to know how brave he was. I know. Are you angry with me? Stupid question. You must be. How can I be, after what I used to do? She gripped both his hands, as if she was afraid he'd run away. This is what we made you, isn't it? We wanted you to be like us. We wanted you to be a Jedi, and do your duty. Mara was quiet for a while gazing out the window onto the sky lane packed with traffic, and clearly thinking hard. You still haven't told me how you knew, Mom. She jerked back to the conversation, blinking. No, I haven't. But I know, and I'm the only one who does. And I also know you can hide in the Force, like Jason does, and it scares me, because the first time I felt it, I thought you'd been killed. 
Please, Ben, don't hide from me. Ever. I wasn't, Mom. I was just trying it out. Okay. Am I going to feel bad about, you know, the other guy? Because right now I don't care. I didn't, she said, seeming to understand he meant Gedjim. Not until lately. And then it didn't feel like guilt, just not quite understanding why I did it. Because being what I was didn't explain it all to me. I'd better go. You'll be okay. I'll always be there, remember. Call me. Ben leaned forward to kiss her on the cheek. He loved her so much right then. What other mom could take news like that, horrific news, and still be there for him? He leaned farther and whispered in her ear. He was having a secret meeting at the port with Omis to discuss a ceasefire. When Ben straightened up, she smiled, but there was a real glint in her eye that said she was anything but happy. Thank you, she said. I love you, Ben. Call me, okay? Love you too, Mom. Ben couldn't stand it any longer. He walked out of the tap calf and spent the next couple of hours wandering around, staring in shop windows and not seeing anything, before he got an air taxi back to Jason's apartment and shut himself in his room. It was going to take a long time to make sense of this. He slipped the vibroblade under his pillow, reluctant to let it sit as far away as his desk, and wondered what Captain Chevu was telling Jory Lekauf's family. Chapter 12 Ori Boucher, Kikovid All Helmet, No Head Mandalorian insult for someone with an overdeveloped sense of authority. Republica House, Coruscant, 0001 hours, Galactic Standard Time. Jason Solo, in the formal uniform of a colonel of the Galactic Alliance Guard, stood outside the lobby of the Republica building, flanked by Sergeant Wirrett and Trooper Lim. It was a real shame about Lekauf. He was a great loss. Ben had done well, but he should have been back at work right away. Jason planned to talk to Chevu later about sending Ben on leave without clearing it with him first. You sure this is going to be enough, sir? asked Wirrit. Just the three of us? Jason smoothed his black gloves down over his fingers. It was one minute past midnight and that made what he was about to do thoroughly legal, justified, and overdue. I don't think Chief Omus has a platoon up there, somehow. Wirrit didn't reply. Jason was the first to admit that going to arrest the elected head of the most powerful organization in the galaxy with a couple of troopers was low-key, but he saw no point flooding the area with an entire company. Omus wouldn't put up a fight. If he did, one Jedi and two armed troopers were ample to deal with it. Jason opened the comlink to Neothel. We're in position now, he said. We're going in. I have an emergency appointment with Senator Gassil in ten minutes, Neothel said. He's not happy about it, but I told him it couldn't wait. He's got no inkling of what's happening? If he has, he hasn't shown the slightest sign of acting upon it. Okay. There's no going back now. We're committed. Just do it. The security guard on the front reception was a man used to seeing all kinds of uniforms wandering in and out of Republica House. The luxurious tower housed the elite of the G.A., 
and every senator seemed to have his or her own entourage of bodyguards, as well as military visitors. Most Coruscanti knew what a GAG uniform looked like by now anyway. Jason had made sure his secret police were anything but secret, at least in terms of their existence. But he gave the guard proper identification without being asked. There was no point being rude or throwing his weight around. The man was only doing his job. No need to announce me, Jason said. The guard checked his data pad. You're on his admission list anyway. Go on up. It took minutes for the turbo lift to reach Omis's floor. As the cab climbed, the two troopers simply stared at the wall ahead of them. Jason felt their reluctance, and wanted to know if it was due to a fondness for Omis or a distaste for military coups, but he didn't ask. Any army that liked the idea of a coup wasn't worth having. It had to be the last resort. How the other half lives, Weirit said, as the turbo lift doors opened onto a lobby of extraordinary luxury. The air was perfumed, a pleasantly neutral woody scent, and the broad corridor was lined with niches filled with rare Naboo crystal. Omas had a weakness for that, and iridescent Shalui ceramics. I could fit my apartment and my ten neighbors in here. If we put fancy pottery in the corridors of my building, it wouldn't be there long, said Lim. She cast an envious eye at a shimmering red vase that changed gradually to green and turquoise as the angle of the observer changed. Still, his insurance payments must hurt. Possessions are burdens. Jason smiled. What you have can always be taken away. So wealth breeds fear. I'll willingly face that kind of fear, sir, Weirit muttered. And a nice big Soro sub yacht. That would scare me very nicely. The magnificent doors to Omis's apartment were engraved bronzium an abstract design by one of Coruscant's top artists. Jason couldn't recall the name. It seemed a waste of talent when the doors were seen only by Omas, his inner circle, the housekeeping staff, and repair droids. Republica House had the kind of architecture and design that warranted public tours. Jason paused, marshalling his thoughts before pressing the bell. The troopers stood back and pulled down their visors. Standard procedure when entering a building. For a moment, Jason thought they were going to stack either side of the door. But they were simply taking a pace backward, Lim keeping an eye on the corridor as a routine precaution. Omas answered the door himself. Jason knew he didn't have day and night close protection these days, but somehow he expected a droid or even a real butler to receive callers. The chief of state looked at him with a puzzled frown, and then at the two troopers. Good evening, Jason. He stepped back and ushered them in. Wretched business, this shooting. I can't say I liked Gedjan, but it shows how careful we have to be in our line of work. He ambled down a long hallway that made the corridor outside look like a lower-level slum. The art on the walls was breathtaking, and most of it seemed to predate the Yuzhan Vong invasion. Some gallery curator had a very secure hiding place then. At the end, Omis turned around. Can I get you good people something to drink before we sit down? Somehow it would have been so much easier if Omis had been hostile. Sir, said Jason, I'm arresting you in the name of the Galactic Alliance for activity likely to compromise the safety of the state. Omis frowned slightly, as if he hadn't heard right. He walked a few steps back along the passage where the downlighters cast pools of light on velvet pile ruby carpet. I beg your pardon? You're under arrest, sir. 
We'll let you call your lawyer later. But right now it would be a good idea if you came with us. Omas gave a little snort of amusement. Jason, my dear boy, this is Cal Omas you're talking to. Don't be such a prat. Arrest me? Arrest me? Jason reached in his jacket and took out a data pad. Under the terms of the Emergency Measures Act, anyone, including heads of state, politicians, and any other individuals believed to be presenting a genuine risk to the security of the Galactic Alliance, can now be detained. That's a quote, sir. The amendment to the law to include heads of state came into effect at midnight. And you are a head of state. Omus looked stunned rather than alarmed. Jason was used to the G.A.G. producing fear when they paid a visit, but amazement was disconcerting. I saw that amendment come through on the notification circular yesterday, Omus said, still quite casually conversational. Good grief. You really did it, didn't you? You actually changed the law and planned this. Sir, am I allowed to know what risk I'm supposed to pose to my own state? I can show you, sir, Jason said, and switched his data pad to the strip cam footage of the meeting with Gedgen. He queued it up and then held the pad so that Omis could see the screen. Please feel free to view it all. And then tell me if that's not you in the room with two Alliance Intel officers, the late Prime Minister, and his two Corsac Protection Officers. The look on Omis's face was priceless. Jason felt a flood of relief that he had finally, finally, made Omis realize that he was now a man with no future. Omis stared at the datapad and did indeed watch the whole meeting. Behind Jason, Weirit and Lim waited in patient silence. Well, said Omus, what can I say? Sergeant Weirit will accompany you to pack an overnight bag, Jason said. We'll take you out as discreetly as possible. Secretly? Oh... I see. No, sir. You're not going to disappear and turn up floating face down in some sewer. This will be conducted legally and openly. Omus stared impassively into Jason's face and then looked past him at the two troopers. Jason could feel the man's fear, even though he looked perfectly at ease. Sergeant, I do keep a bag packed for eventualities, Omus said, almost smiling. If you don't trust me not to blow my brains out in the bedroom, by all means go to the fifth door on the left and pick it up for me. It's in the first closet as you enter the room. Tan leather hold all. There was nothing worse than a dignified detainee. Jason knew that within twenty-four hours, the barracks and the CSF bar would be full of the gossip about how magnificently brave Omis had been. Wirrit disappeared into the bedroom while Lim stood guard. Omis stepped a little closer to Jason, his face centimeters away, so close that his breath brushed Jason's skin like a hand. You obnoxious, power-crazed, ludicrous, little jerk, he said sweetly, with the smile of an indulgent grandfather. You had Gedron killed, too, didn't you? Jason waited for him to spit in his face and still smile, but Omus conducted himself impeccably as he left. Weirat walked behind him, blaster visible, but not jammed into the chief of state's back. And Jason led the way. 
It was the longest, most awkward turbolift descent that Jason could imagine. When they reached the lobby, the security guard stared for a moment, put down his holozine, and stood up. Sir, what's happening? Would you water the plants while I'm away, please? Omas said pleasantly. I'm afraid I'm under arrest. There was a second GAG transport waiting outside. Wirrit and Lim ushered Omas into it, then watched it speed away to GAG HQ. Jason found that his hands were shaking. It was an effort to take out his comlink. Admiral, it's done, he said. Time for a public announcement. Wirrit pushed back his visor and wiped his face with his glove. That, he said, was the hardest thing I've ever done. Next time, sir, can I volunteer for snatching heavily armed Wookiee psychopaths? It'd be a lot easier on my nerves. Wirrit and Lim joked, but the arrest had crossed an emotional line for them, and it showed. Jason climbed into the speeder beside them and took a long route through the canyons of buildings, checking for signs that Coruscant, the heart of galactic democracy, had undergone a silent, bloodless, and thoroughly civilized military coup. Outside government buildings and bank headquarters, small groups of GA ground forces stood guard. It looked like no more than the routine public order precautions for festival nights, except the uniforms were not the blue of CSF. Weird, said Lim. Poor old Jory. We're at side. Poor kid. He was so keen to live up to his granddad. Jason rubbed his eyes and realized he was in for another very long day. And the sun wasn't even up yet. I won't forget that, he said. I never will. <laughs>